Order, please. We'll now begin with the daily routine, beginning with presenting and reading of petitions. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I beg leave to uh, introduce a petition entitled, We the Undersigned, the operative clause of which is, We the Undersigned call on the Government of Nova Scotia to take action to protect the Dartmouth Lakes by exercising its legislative authority over water resources, including lakes, providing provincial oversight and leadership in ensuring the health of these precious natural resources and recreational and economic assets of the Dartmouth community, and working with the Halifax Regional Municipality to include improve lake conditions. Uh, there are 283 signatures affixed, and I have affixed my name as well. Petition is tabled. The Honourable Member for Sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to table a petition with the operative clause being, we the undersigned call on the province of Nova Scotia to immediately improve access to affordable housing for seniors and for residents on fixed income in Sackville. This petition has a total of 343 signatures, and I have affixed my own. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The petition is tabled. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to table a petition with the operative clause being we, the undersigned, request that the government of Nova Scotia, and in particular the Department of Health and Wellness, commit to the residents of the constituency of Coal Harbour and Eastern Passage that they will provide immediate funding for a collaborative health centre in our community. And we, the undersigned, also request that the Department of Health and Wellness commit to the residents of Coal Harbour and Eastern Passage that our region be given priority for the creation of the next collaborative health centre in Nova Scotia. I have fixed my signature as per the, as per the requirements of the House. The petition is tabled. The Honourable Member for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are 1,249 signatures. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce a petition. The operative clause uh, is as follows. We request that the province initiates a systemic, systematic Vision Zero approach to identify provincial laws which contribute to unsafe road conditions for vulnerable road users and laws that will reduce those dangers. We request the province initiates a Vision Zero road safety strategy which uses statistical evidence to determine common causes of incidents. The strategy should identify evidence-based suitable countermeasures and provide a budget for their deployment. Uh, there are 21 signatures and I have affixed my own. Thank you. Petition is tabled. Presenting reports of committees. Tabling reports, regulations and other papers. As Speaker of the House of Assembly and pursuant to Section 18.4 of the Auditor General Act, I am pleased to table the Auditor General's financial report for October 2019. The report is tabled. Statements by ministers. Government notices of motion. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, may I do an introduction before? Permission granted. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to draw the attention of those to the East Gallery where, where we are joined today by Alfred Burgesson. Alfred dedicated much of the time working for several organizations in Halifax to ensure uh, that the, young Nova Scotians can grow and thrive here and to make sure that their voices are around the table. And I would ask Alfred to rise so that he could receive the warm welcome of the House. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I recognize in a future day I should move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Alfred Burgesson moved with his family to Nova Scotia from Ghana at a young age and grew up with a passion and drive to become a leader in his community, and whereas Alfred has helped to create youth organizations addressing social and economic issues through innovation and collaboration, such as HFX Collective and Halifax Social Network, and works with many groups to ensure that our province is a place all Nova Scotians can thrive. And whereas this past July, Alfred was appointed to serve on the Prime Minister's Youth Council to work alongside other young Canadians to provide their perspective on issues and challenges facing their communities, Therefore, it be it resolved that all members of the House of Assembly join me in congratulating Alfred Burgesson on his appointment to the Youth Council, as well as to recognize him for the impact he's had on Nova Scotia and the positive example he's setting for all Nova Scotians in our province. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried.
The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to draw my colleagues' attention to the East Gallery today, where it's my pleasure to introduce Amanda Dean, uh, the Vice President of the Insurance Bureau of Canada, uh, of, uh, of Canada, uh, Aaron Norwood, Government Relations Manager with the Insurance Bureau of Canada, Rita McCulley, Health Promotion Coordinator at the Department of Health and Wellness, and Jennifer Russell, the Executive Director of Atlantic Collaborative for Injury Prevention. And these guests are some of the many people working diligently to raise awareness and build partnerships, share knowledge, and promote injury prevention uh, for Nova Scotians and, and all Atlantic Canadians. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, I'd ask that they all rise and receive the warm welcome of the House. <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas preventable injuries have a significant impact on Nova Scotians and Nova Scotia's health care system, and whereas the majority of injuries are preventable, and whereas the Atlantic Collaborative on Injury Prevention, the Community Against Preventable Injuries, and other partners recently launched a campaign to help change attitudes and behaviors around preventable injuries, therefore be it resolved that all members of this House recognize preventable injuries as a serious health issue and commend the efforts of ACIP and partners in raising awareness and working to minimize preventable injuries at home, at work, on the road and at play. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice on a future day I should move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the Nova Scotia Fisheries and Aquaculture Loan Board as a development agency that acts to build a financial, stable, and sustainable fishery space in Nova Scotia. And whereas for many years the fishing industry has been seeking improvements to the loan board's programs, including more streamlined processes and reduced application fees. And whereas by working closely with the industry, government has responded to industry requests to offer new loan products, lower interest rates, lower service fees, and shorter processing times for large loans and longer amortization requests. Therefore, be resolved the House of Assembly recognize that an improved Nova Scotia's Fisheries Loan and Aquaculture Loan Board now has a record number of clients and has helped Nova Scotia's fishing exports reach a record $2 billion plus in 2018. Mr. Minister, uh, Mr. Speaker, I mean, I ask waiver of notice and passage of debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness on an introduction. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to draw my colleagues' attention to, uh, to uh, your gallery. Uh, where we have today uh, some uh, special guests from Anna Kanish, uh, and I ask that they uh, rise as I uh, recognize them. Uh, Jeff Teasdale. Uh, Jeff is the Executive Director of the Canadian Association for Community Living in Anna Kanish, and honestly, just an all around great guy. Uh, Gary Kell is a well known arm wrestling champion and entrepreneur, and I look forward to uh, hearing of Gary's uh, accomplishments that are going to be shared with the House in just a moment. And I believe uh, Trevor uh, Senapa uh, is an arm wrestling coach from, I believe, I believe Lower Sackville is joining them here uh, today as well. So if they could please, uh, my colleagues, give them a warm welcome. The Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Nova Scotia has an abundance of sport and recreation opportunities, including arm wrestling, which has evolved over the years into a very fun, technical and competitive, well-known and favourite sport. And whereas with a lot of determination, hard work and practice, Gary Kell has become one of the best arm wrestlers our province has ever seen, earning himself the coveted title of Canadian men's arm wrestling champion. And whereas Gary will be traveling to Poland this December to compete at the World Championships, and I have no doubt he will make us all very proud. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of the House of Assembly congratulate Gary for his excellence in the sport of arm wrestling and wish him the best of luck as he represents our country on the world stage. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice 
passage without debate. There has been a request for waivers. Is it agreed? agreed? It is agreed. Are all those in favour of the motion, please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice on a future day to move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas municipal governments across the province provide services that enhance the quality of life for citizens, and whereas dedicated mayors, wardens, councillors, and staff are essential for the effective governance of their municipalities, and whereas citizen involvement <clears throat> on committees is also essential for an active community, and we encourage Nova Scotia to participate. Therefore, be it resolved that as November 17th to 23rd is Municipal Awareness Week, all members of this House of Assembly recognize the vital role of municipal government and all who support it. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver notice to pass it for their debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. I'd like to draw my colleagues' attention to the East Gallery, where we are joined today by some special guests from Bonnie Lee Farm. Joining us today is David Outhouse, the Executive Director, and Liz Finney, who is the Fund Development Coordinator. Uh, I recently had a lovely visit to a Bonnie Lee Farm, and I would ask members of this House to join me in giving our guests a warm welcome. <laughs> Minister of Community Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas in 1973, Bonnie Lee Farm was founded to, provi to provide people with disabilities with opportunities to lead meaningful and productive lives within their community. And whereas today, Bonnie Lee Farm offers a variety of programs and services that empower participants to develop life skills, overcome barriers to employment, and access independent living. And whereas Bonnie Lee Farm has been a leader in disability support services, ensuring programming is focused on the needs and goals of each participant and designed to support each one in reaching their own potential. Therefore, be it resolved, the members of this House join me in thanking Bonnie Lee Farm for their role in providing Nova Scotians with disabilities with diverse opportunities to learn, grow, and succeed in their community. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Acadian Affairs on an introduction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Monsieur le Président, je voudrais attirer votre attention et celle de tous mes collègues uh, de l'Assemblée sur la Galerie Est, uh, in the Gallery East. Uh, we have with us today a group of 21 grade 7 students uh, from uh, l'école Mère et Monde du Conseil scolaire acadien provincial sur la péninsule de Halifax. And they are accompanied today uh, avec leur enseignante, uh, their wonderful, excellent teacher, Madame Anne Sophie Lenes Frigon, and also with Mr. David Richardson. I'm just going to need read all 21 names and ask them to stand. Um, here we go: Crepin Atiwoto, Madeleine Bakey, Zoe Bakif. Sophia Black, Michaela Bona, Sasha De Vred, Harlow Diamond, Aidan Gauguin, Lucas Lay, Cosette Leblanc, Alex Lee Chanuk, Ainsley Lewis, Owen Little, Maria McDougall, Augustin Monge, Ethan Peng, Tegan Richardson, Travian Richardson, Samuel Van Baskirk, Patrick Villeneuve, Aurelia Mouluba. 
Ses élèves sont venus à l'Assemblée législative pour un tour guidé en français et pour apprendre plus de nos institutions. They've come to our legislature to learn, uh, to get a guide, the tour in French, and to learn about our legislation. So I ask all my colleagues to please give them the warm welcome of the House. We'll now move on to introduction and bills. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg, beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 260 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Liquor Control Act. The Honour excuse me, the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 260 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Liquor Control Act. Bill number 217, entitled an act to amend chapter 260 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Liquor Control Act. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled an act to preserve the independence of student unions. The Honourable Member for Sydney River Myra Lewisburg begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Preserve the Independence of Student Unions. Sorry. Bill number 218 entitled An Act to Preserve the Independence of Student Unions. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. We'll now move on to uh, notices of motion. Statements by members. The Honourable Member for Claire Digby. I beg leave to do an introduction. Permission granted. I'd like to bring the attention of the House to the East Gallery. We are joined here today by a group of grade nine students from the Metagan High School. Uh, this group of students are accompanied by a teacher and uh, another member of the community. They're here to uh, lobby the government on behalf of their group on bilingual signs. I think this is an example of a civics lesson in how government works and how they can work with government that very few students have the opportunity to experience. And I really commend them. I'm proud to have them here. I'd like to introduce them. Their teacher, uh, Phil Muse. We also have Natalie Robichaud. Natalie is the executive director of the Society of Kedyen de Clare. Our students are Gaetan DeVoe, Crystal Madden, Blake Terrio, and Nicole Thibodeau. And I would really like to bring the uh, applause and the attention and the, and the pleasure that the House has of having them here to all of them. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Dermot South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. Joining us uh, in the gallery opposite today uh, are a group of individuals representing an exceptional project coming out of Autism Nova Scotia called Autistics Allowed. Uh, these include, and I'll ask you to stand as I read your name, magazine editor Patricia George Zwicker, contributor Hugh Calvin Garber, uh, David Patterson, Regional Autism Coordinator at Autism Nova Scotia, and Brian Foster, the CEO of Autism Nova Scotia. Um, I would also be remiss if I did not introduce my extended family who are sitting with them, Hugh's parents, Allison and Jeff Garber, his sister, Vera Garber, you guys can stand up too, Vera, and uh, my father-in-law, Peter McClellan, who will be known to people mostly on that side of the house. I would ask that you join me. Uh, you said that quick. You said that quick. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Dermot South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge one of Autism Nova Scotia's longest running initiatives, Autistics Allowed, and to congratulate them on the recent release of Edition 1 in the new Lifespan series. Autistics Allowed is a grassroots publication, uh, which will have been handed out to many members, that provides a platform for autistic Canadians to share a first voice perspective on autism. 
through stories, poems, photography, and art. As the name Lifespans implies, the contributors are children, teenagers, adults, and seniors who have shared their vision for a more inclusive community. The youngest contributor is my 10-year-old nephew, and the oldest is the 50-year-old editor, which provides many different perspectives throughout the magazine. Over the next three years, Autism Nova Scotia will publish nine more editions of Lifespans that will explore themes such as mental health, sexuality, and housing through a uniquely autistic lens. The copy of the magazine in front of you is yours to celebrate and share. And I'd ask again that we celebrate uh, these folks by snapping. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Fairview, Clayton Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave for an introduction. Permission granted. Thank you. If I could bring everyone's attention to the East Gallery, where we are joined today by a very famous constituent of mine, Wayne Little, along with his um, wife, Sharon, his mom, Florence, and his son, Matt. If I could ask them to raise and receive the warm welcome of the house. The Honourable Member for Fairview, Clayton Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to celebrate a well-known constituent of Fairview Clayton Park, whom many would recognize from Shoppers Drug Mart, Shoppers Drug Mart on Joseph Howe Drive. Wayne Little, co-owner, pharmacist, and more importantly, my human reminder to get a flu shot every single year, was born and raised in St. John's, Newfoundland. Wayne graduated from the College of the North Atlantic in 1982 and has owned Shoppers for over 10 years and continues to provide advice to patients on a daily basis. In his spare time, Wayne leads a healthy lifestyle as an avid cyclist and swimmer. While September 25th marked World Pharmacist Day, I would like to thank and celebrate Wayne for providing many community members, including myself, with incredible care and advice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to congratulate Ryan McDonald of Green Hill on his third Olympic race win at the Mel Murphy Triathlon. He finished the race in two hours, six minutes, and two seconds, beating his strongest opponent by almost six minutes. The race consists of a 1.5 kilometers of swimming, 40 kilometer bike ride and a 10 kilometer run. The race occurred in the middle of a heat wave this year, making the event even more challenging. I admire Ryan for his dedication to fitness and his love for competing in such an intense race. I hope to be able to watch Ryan continue to succeed in something that he enjoys so much. To achieve such an incredible time in an Olympic race is truly something to be proud of. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. Uh, in, the in the gallery opposite, I'd like to uh, draw the members' attention to the hardworking staff at the Clean Foundation. Uh, we're joined today by uh, Lauren Murphy, uh, Scott Skinner, and two of their colleagues whose names I don't have on the sheet in front of me, but please stand and enjoy the warm welcome of the house. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to recognize the contributions of my friend and Dartmouth South resident, Lauren Murphy, in the development of the green economy. <clears throat> Lauren is the manager of education and internships at the Clean Foundation. She and her team recently completed the eighth season of the Clean Leadership Summer Internship Program, placing 73 students in workforce integrated learning positions with 56 organizations across the province. 51 of these were in rural areas outside of HRM, and 43 interns represented underserved populations in Nova Scotia. This program was strongly supported by various provincial government departments, including Environment, LAE, Aboriginal Affairs, Energy and Mines, as well as by partners including Divert Nova Scotia and Indigenous Skills Canada. Lauren and her team at CLEAN also deliver the federal government's Science Horizons program, which provides wage subsidies for graduate internships in the clean economy across the country. In the past three months, they've secured positions for nearly 100 graduates, including 37 here in Nova Scotia. Lauren also sits on the Halifax Chamber of Commerce's Accessing the Skilled Workforce Task Force. She has become a driving force in creating opportunities for youth in the clean economy, which is vital to our future in Nova Scotia. Please join me in celebrating Lauren's achievements and wishing her well as she presses on in the important work of helping Nova Scotia transition to a green economy. The Honourable Member for Colchester North. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Wilson Family Scholarship Program started in 2009 as part of Wilson's 10-year celebrations. The scholarships are awarded yearly to those who have achieved success at school or in a trade and are involved with other communities through volunteering, sports, or the arts. 
A permanent scholarship was added in memory of Jonathan McIntyre, son of Linda McGill, longtime employee of Wilson's, who died in a tragic accident. Each year, Linda reviews the applications and selects the recipient of the scholarships in her son's memory. The 2019 recipient of the Jonathan McIntyre Scholarship was Haley Spencer from Great Village, Colchester North. Haley has been a part-time employee at the local Wilson Station. An excellent student, Haley graduated from Cobbacoot Education Center in Truro and is studying at Acadia this year. She is enrolled in kinesiology and plans to become a teacher. Since childhood, Haley has been an avid athlete and especially has excelled at softball and hockey. She has also coached and been an active community volunteer. She was heavily involved in the rebuilding of the local ball field, which has been enjoyed by ball teams from around the province. With her academic and athletic abilities, we know that Haley will do well in kinesiology. We wish her success, congratulations, and a rewarding year ahead. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are very few people in Liverpool who don't recognize the name Kevin Jehu. Always willing to help out as a volunteer and always willing to support community events and organizations, Kevin goes the extra mile time and time again. Recently, as a volunteer with a Happy Wheelers walking group, Kevin participated in the Queen's Manor Walk for Alzheimer's fundraiser. Armed with his kind heart and determination, his efforts raised the sum of $505, almost half of the entire amount raised. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to recognize and congratulate Kevin on his successful fundraising campaign and thank him for all that he does as a volunteer in his community. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dermot North. Mr. Speaker, on July 26th of this year, Ocean Breeze residents Tim Gotchell and Devin Moore woke up to hateful homophobic slurs spray painted on the wall outside of their apartment. This terrible act was made all the more bitter as it took place during Pride Month in the HRM. Dartmouth North resident Brittany Markey posted a picture of the graffiti on social media and it quickly went viral. When former Ocean Breeze resident Jason Spurl, who you may know as drag queen extraordinaire Rouge Fatale, saw the post, they went to work turning the ugly act into a beautiful show of community res resilience. The following Saturday, hundreds of people, some dressed in drag, others in rainbows, two as LGBTQ people and their allies, marched through the quiet streets of Ocean Breeze and gathered in front of Tim and Devin's apartment. A barbecue and party followed. I rise today to express my gratitude to Jason, all of the organizers, and everyone who attended the stroll through Ocean Breeze proving that there is no room for hate, homophobic or otherwise, in Dartmouth North. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Thank you, thank you Mr. Speaker. I would like to... Um, uh, I, beg, uh, I beg leave to make an introduction. Sorry. Permission granted. Uh, we have with us here my amazing CA, who has been with me for 15 months, and this is the first time that I introduce her uh, officially at the House and welcome her. She has been an amazing, competent, compassionate, and I don't know how much more work this woman can do, but we achieved so much in the last 15 months, thanks to Zaina Claymy, who is um, the best addition to Clayton Park West uh, office, uh, MLA office. And with us, with her as well, we have Gail Scarola, my casual staff, who they both are uh, the best team. And I think when I say that you surround yourself by intelligent, strong women, you can achieve so much more. Thank you. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Preston Dartmouth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like to recognize Tyler Simmons of North Preston, a filmmaker, artist, writer, peer support worker, and entrepreneur from North Preston. He uses creative talents to inspire others. He is a public speaker and filmmaker, speaking openly about his experience with mental illness, reminds people that recovery is possible. He is a finalist in the prestigious 2019 GRG JRG Emergency Artist Grant presented at the JRG Society for Arts Awards in Halifax, Nova Scotia on October the 16th this year. I recognize and congratulate Tyler Simmons for achieving this high level of professionalism in advocating for those with mental illness and wish him every success in the future. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to recognize the importance of the forestry sector in Cumberland North and would like to specifically honor one of our leaders in the forestry industry, Mr. Darren Carter. 
Darren Carter started going to the woods with his father when he was 12 years old and at 16 started running a skitter full time. At the age of 21, he started his own business with a few power saw men and a machine. In 1988, he mechanized his business and now, 34 years later, Darren Carter has 20 employees and working 13 machines. His forestry business cuts an average of 120,000 tons a year. Revenue last fiscal year was over $4 million, and to replace his assets alone would be over $9 million. He has grown his business with the intent to have two of his sons take it over. Mr. Speaker, please join me in recognizing this important forester, Darren Carter, his family and his employees, an important part of our economy in Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, as we approach the end of Mi'kmaq History Month, I want to congratulate Nimbus Publishing, located in Halifax Needham, and Rebecca Thomas, poet and spoken word artist, on the release of Rebecca's first book, I'm, I'm Finding My Talk, a response to the iconic poem by Rita Joe, I Lost My Talk, about losing her language while a resident of the Shubenacadie Residential School. I'm Finding My Talk is being released tomorrow, Wednesday, October 30th, with a celebration at Nimbus's Open Book Cafe on Strawberry Hill Drive, in conjunction with the release of a new illustrated uh, children's book edition of I Lost My Talk. Both books are illustrated by Mi'kmaq artist Pauline Young. Language carries culture and the resurgence of the Mi'kmaq language in conversations, in schools, through learning apps, on provincial and municipal signs, and in books is a reason to celebrate and a sign of the tremendous resilience of the Mi'kmaq people. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Hans East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in my place today to celebrate Kabat al-Issa, his wife, Jin, and their son, Jano, who arrived in Nova Scotia in October of 2016 as refugees from Syria. Kabat studied tailoring at the Al Mamoun International Center in Syria, from buttons to zippers making something a little more custom fit or mending canopies. For him, no job is too big or too small. His work is professional, tidy, and completed in a timely fashion with a little Syrian flair. Tailoring is a passion for Kabat, and his cousin, owner of Razan's Tailor Shop in Bridgewater, has aided, mentored, and encouraged the Issa family to get settled in Canada. Razan also assisted Kabat in getting his tailoring shop opened in Enfield. Kabat is very thankful to the community of Enfield and those who have helped him and supported him along the way of getting the Jano Enfield Tailor Shop up and running. While his English is improving every day, it's still a work in progress. Kabat expresses his gratitude the best way he can. A welcome smile and thank yous are evident as soon as you walk in the shop. Mr. Speaker, Kabat is very thankful to be in Canada as we are to have him. Um, he loves the people, the friendliness, being able to work, the culture, the seasons, but mostly how his son can experience a healthy life and get an education and be anything he wants to be. Thanks to Kavat for moving to, to Canada. We certainly appreciate him. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate and thank Alan Shepard from Advocate Harbour in his fight against beach pollution along the shorelines of his community. The Advocate shoreline is often known as the driftwood capital in Nova Scotia, but with many pieces of driftwood come lots of garbage that comes in daily. Mr. Shepard this season has already filled full, four full dumpsters this far. I ask you in joining me in thanking Alan for his time and dedication and service to cleaning up his community beaches, and if I also may add, if you have the chance, check out his Facebook, because he's a spectacular photographer as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize Colette and Sterling Gates of McGinnis Lake Farm in New Ross, the hosts of the 2019 Canadian Horse Demonstration this past September. Many do not realize that the Canadian horse was recognized as the designated horse breed of Canada by Parliament in 2002. Originally introduced to North America in 1665 by the King of France from his own stables, the breed gradually became in danger of disappearing. Dedicated horse lovers managed to save the breed, known for qualities of great strength and endurance, resilience, intelligence, and good temper, like the good people of New Ross. Collette and Sterling Gates continued this tradition as leading members of the Canadian Horse Breeders Atlantic Division. 
Mr. Speaker, I invite the members of the House of Assembly to join me in recognizing and congratulating Colette and Sterling Gates of McGuinness Lake Farm, the Canadian Horse Association, as well as the Canadian horse itself on a wonderful event. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, the Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to request to be able to read the statement in Gaelic after reading it in English. Commissioner Grant. I want to acknowledge the Minister of Education for appointing a member of the Gaelic community to the Minister's Council on Education. Thousands of young Nova Scotians want to learn about the history and culture of their people in school. Young Gales will now benefit from the insights brought to the table by Mr. Seamus MacDonald. The Department of Education must have representation of a people to be able to accurately represent who they are. This is especially true for matters of language, history and culture. We know history can sometimes contain interpretation and matters can be conveniently left out to suit one group over another. Local language dialects and traditions deserve their recognition. Seamus MacDonald will ensure the Minister and his department benefit from these insights in providing learning experiences to students. I want to thank the Department of Education for the good work they've been doing over the past number of years to bring Gaelic learning opportunities to students, and I would like to wish Mr. MacDonald success in helping to ensure young Gales enjoy the discovery of learning more about their people and themselves. Buvalam minister and ulam avolag, shech and the hure arst ararst, gail gu carlo and ulam, ha modern akri and in sculchen albanue, agiri fisrehig er echtri, is kultur er kuch gunya, anish kashni gail akamas, von lerchen of er shamus donoach er arst, femi fienish nandunya hain. Avi Ekroin and Ulam, Humskunchech, Wurkakuk, Karamach, Ayinav, Hashoguharach, Fear, Ahuv, Kanan, Echri, Agis Kultar, Hafis Akin, Gumfurt, Fieri, Avi Anan Minyahug, Echri, Ek Amanan, Agis Furter, Jurimat, Ayinav, Aver Barach, Karam, the Unblienen, Shech Voyen Ella. Famer Suyam Agail, and a Vikur a Kale, Kaint is Dolhas Inadal. Ni Shamus Donawa Kinchech, Gumbunach and Minister Agus and Roin von Ellis von Yala Show, and a V Torsh Karam Insahai do Scholarin. Buvalem Tang a Horst, the Roin and Olam, er son and Joe. Oper Arain Eat, for Hune Vlienachin, and a V Torst Unsachai, the Scalyurin, a Hoof Nagalic. Shemagurach, Gu Suravich, Lesh and Donawach, and a V Gianov Kinchach, Gumfai Gail Alka, Karam, Erbarach Unsachai, a Hoof and Dunya, Agus and Kutch Dulahush. The Honourable Member for Guysborough, Eastern Shore, Trackety. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in recognition of the hands-on history program run by Historic Sherbrooke Village that grade six students from Duncan McMillan High School in Sheet Harbour had the opportunity to participate in this summer. The Sherbrooke Village hands-on history program invites people, young and old, to participate in village life by offering a hands-on, interactive, educational, and fun experience. Led by their wonderful teacher, Madame Power, the students wore period clothing and learned what it was like to live in 1867. Participating in the trick back, trip back in time were Lydia Josie, Bree Ronahan, Savannah Pye, Kira Hutt, Riley Muir, Carrie Roberts, Savannah Monroe, Braden Logan, Keaton Gammon, Cody Lloyd, Jacob Owen, and Alana Gammon along with her teacher, Madame Power, and parent chaperones, Shirley Monroe, Lisa Hutt, and Melissa Owner. The group spent time carrying wood, baking cookies, making wooden toy schooners, and visiting the artisans in the village. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to commend the Duncan McMillan High School grade six students for participating in this learning opportunity and to thank Historic Sherbrooke Village for providing this educational program. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. 
Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge the amazing constituents of Coal Harbour and Eastern Passage and their endless efforts to improve the lives of everyone in our communities. As everyone knows, we are the only constituency in Nova Scotia that does not have a single family doctor, nor do we have any mental health care, community services offices, or pediatric care. Today, on behalf of all of the constituents of my communities, I tabled a petition from 1,249 constituents calling on the provincial government to commit to funding a collaborative health centre for our community. The petition carries the voices from the people I listened to on the doorsteps three years ago who were calling out for better health care in our community. Last year, I introduced a bill in the legislature calling for breast density scores to be revealed and reported on for every patient in Nova Scotia having a mammogram. Today, the government honoured that request. I now call on the government to heed the call of my constituents who are repeatedly calling for better health care services and a collaborative health centre in our community with mental health services and social services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Armdale. Mr. Speaker, small business owners are the backbone of our province, and today I want to recognize Vasilios Billy Nicolau, uh, who is the owner-operator of Armdale-based Totally Electric Limited. Billy provides an array of electrical safety services and quality work for residential and commercial construction projects. He's also the co-owner of an Armdale staple, the Arm View restaurant alongside Peter Sulahas and George Kapitanakis. This business is one of our oldest and most beloved local restaurants. All three business owners give back to the community through uh, donations to charities, including IWK, SPCA, their annual Christmas feed for Nova Scotia events, and for the first time, Halifax Taco Week which will see money from each lamb barbacoa taco donated to the food bank. I want to congratulate all three business owners on their professional success. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pictou East. Thank you very much. Pictou West. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to acknowledge and congratulate Sherry Muir and her daughter, Scotia McDonald of Scottsburn, for being awarded Miss Nova Scotia International 2019 and Miss Teen Nova Scotia International, respectively. Sherry was named Miss Nova Scotia, while Scotia was awarded Miss Teen Nova Scotia runner-up. Scotia was also invited to compete in the Nationals in Toronto, but decided to decline the offer as it would interfere with her first weeks in college. The mother-daughter pair have been involved in pageants for a few years, but this is the first big win either has received. They have been encouraging others to step out of their comfort zone and try something new, just like they decided to do. I am proud of both Sherry and Scotia for their achievements and hope they both continue to participate in their chosen competition while inspiring others. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to draw uh, the attention of the members to the gallery opposite, where I'm joined by my hardworking and amazing office staff, uh, Bev Doman, who's my constituency assistant, and Grace Such, who's my uh, out outreach officer, both of whom do a huge amount of work while I'm in here with all of you, uh, tending to the needs of people in Dartmouth South. I definitely couldn't do my job without them, and I'm really glad that they got down to the legislature to join us today. So thanks for joining us. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to speak about a brand new mental health initiative in Spryfield called Community Campfires. While it's not an actual campfire, the weekly drop-in sessions provide the same kind of warmth and community by creating a space for people to connect and build wellness skills. The community campfires are led by Healthy Minds Around the Loop, an association focused on promoting better access to mental health services in Spryfield and area. Recently, the group hosted a walk and talk series at Long Lake Provincial Park, provided free mental health first aid training, and are now hosting the community campfires. I'd especially like to recognize Stephanie Osberg, who is leading the campfires and whose passion for tackling mental health issues is truly inspiring. Mr. Speaker, it is groups like Healthy Minds Around the Loop that make our communities thrive. I'd like to thank this group and Stephanie for their efforts and wish them best of luck with the launch of the Community Campfire Initiative. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honour the members of the Royal Canadian Legion Kelly Branch 162 in Lower Sackville. On November 11th, members of the Royal Canadian Legion Kelly Branch 162 
will gather along with community members and organizations to remember Canada's veterans at the Sackville Heritage Park Cenotaph by paying their respects to all those who served Canada to protect our rights and freedoms, as well as those in other countries. Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask that all members of this House of Assembly join me in thanking the members of the Royal Canadian Legion Kelly Branch 162 and all Royal Canadian Legion members for, the, for their dedication and commitment year after year to ensure we honour and show our gratitude to the men and women who served and in some cases paid the ultimate sacrifice so that we can enjoy the freedom that we do today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kings South. Mr. Speaker, the voices on the local radio become part of our daily lives as they inform, entertain, and educate their local communities. For over 36 years, a wonderful, deep voice, well known to generations of Annapolis Valley radio listeners, has been heard reading the news and delivering commentaries. Recently, Dave Chalk announced his retirement and turned off his mic with his final shift on the air for K-Rock 89.3 FM on November 15, 2018. He spent 25 years directing the news at Magic 97, now Magic 94.9, before becoming K-Rock's first news director when the station launched in 2008. Although he has retired from a total of 47 years in media, Dave remains deeply active in his community through volunteering and is the chairman of the New Minus Village Commission. I invite all members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in congratulating Dave Chalk on his retirement and for the many years of being a reliable and reassuring voice throughout the Annapolis Valley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. I would like to draw the attention of members to the West Gallery, uh, where we are joined today by a resident of Sackville Beaverbank, Ms. Charlene Sapphire who is joining us today for today's question period. And I'd like to ask all the members of the House to please welcome and give her a uh, warm round and welcome to the House. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it gives me great pleasure to be able to stand today to recognize a former colleague of mine who I had a privilege to work side by side with for 16 years while on the Halifax Regional Municipality. Councillor Steve Adams announced on October 18th, almost 28 years to the day of his first municipal win on October 19th. 1991, that he would not longer be offering for a ninth term as the councillor for Spryfield, Herring Cove and Williamswood. Having won his first election in 1991 at the age of 30, Steve went on to win eight more consecutive elections. Over that time, he worked with four separate mayors, eight city managers, was acclaimed twice as councillor and served twice as deputy mayor. Just to put it into perspective, over his 28 years, there have been seven premiers, eight min members of parliament and nine different legislative members representing his area. Councillor Adams has always been a hard-working and strong advocate for the residents of Spryfield and Herring Cove, and some of his many achievements include the parks, playgrounds, and paving projects throughout the community, community centres, the construction of a new fire hall for Herring Cove, and a new one coming to serve William Wood. Mr. Speaker, to say that I have the utmost respect and admiration for Steve would be an understatement. Not only do I consider him a former colleague and mentor, but also a friend. I ask the members of the Nova Scotia Legislative Assembly joining me in wishing Steve all the best as he moves to his next phase of life and on behalf of his residents and friends I want to thank him for his years of service thank Honorable you member for Yarmouth. thank you very much mr. speaker coastal financial credit union has purchased and donated a home in Yarmouth to provide housing for potential family doctors in our community working with the Yarmouth and area Chamber of Commerce our community navigator our municipal units and the province Coastal Financial Credit Union recognized that many doctors have to continue paying rent or mortgages in their former locations and took the initiative to find a solution to this added financial stress by providing a free place to live while studying and working in Yarmouth. The house just a short walk to Yarmouth Hospital will provide three units for resident, resident doctors to live and also one unit with three bedrooms and common living area for medical students that are here temporarily. Coastal Financial Credit Union's amazing act of generosity and community spirit has inspired other businesses to donate their products and services to this house, including a free kitchen design, an offer to fill the fridge, free paint, an electrical upgrade, landscaping, and much more. 
I ask this House to join me in thanking Coastal Financial Credit Union for this truly inspiring and unprecedented act of generosity and vision and for its unwavering dedication to our community as well as the Yarmouth and Area Chamber of Commerce, our municipal governments and the province for supporting doctor recruitment in our community. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize the outstanding volunteers who organized the St. Thomas More 2019 Fall Fair. On Saturday, October 26th, I had the opportunity to visit this fall fair with my family. We were treated to a great lunch and had a chance to purchase some books and arts and crafts. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Knights of Columbus and Catholic Women's League of Christ the King Parish for their support of this fall fair. Many residents of Dartmouth have been attending this fall fair for decades and look forward to it annually. Proceeds raised go to support the community and the parish. Mr. Speaker, I ask all members of the House to acknowledge and thank the Knights of Columbus and the Catholic Women's League and all the volunteers on another successful fall fair at St. Thomas More. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable. Thank you very much for those member statements. Just before we move on to question period, I want to remind all members once again, we're going to continue on in our vein from Friday. There will be zero tolerance for any unsolicited remarks or comments. If I do hear any, you will be politely asked to remove yourself from the chamber for the balance of question period. We will now move on to oral questions put by members to ministers. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker. The PC Caucus uh, submitted a FOIPOP request to the Department of Labour and to the Premier's office seeking documents and correspondence relating to the uh, crane situation and the assumption of the liability. The Department of Labour responded asking for 30 more days uh, to complete the response. The Premier's office responded. Uh, they responded with a redacted document that indicates no record that the Premier was consulted before the liability was, uh, was assumed. I'd like to ask the, uh, the Premier, can the Premier confirm whether or not the Premier was involved in the decision to assume liability uh, for the removal of the crane? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, ultimately every decision government makes, Mr. Speaker, ends up on my desk. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, quite frankly, I have ministers that are capable of running their portfolios, Mr. Speaker, and I allow them to do so. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've asked numerous times about the cost uh, of the assumption of the liability. I know the Premier has indicated that it's in the interest of public safety, which everyone supports, but if it's the right thing to do, it's the right thing to do no matter the cost, and we're interested in how much this will cost taxpayers. But part of the release uh, from the Premier's office included this, uh, this page, which is basically all redacted, except for one expression, and that expression is, fingers crossed. Uh, and that does seem to be, I'll table that for the benefit of the House, it's the only thing of substance left on that entire, on the, that entire page. I'd like to ask the, um, uh, ask the Premier, is the Premier prepared to tell the House today what is the liability uh, that, the, that the taxpayers have assumed for the removal of the crane? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As the Honourable Member knows, it's ongoing work that's happening on that site. Uh, we'll continue, uh, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that we uh, secure public safety. As the Honourable Member would know, as we've said in this House plenty of times, uh, we're in the final stages of looking at, uh, my understanding, doing an ultrasound of that site. There was one at the very beginning, one at the end. Uh, there would have been some damage associated with uh, our work on that site. We want to make sure all of that uh, is repaired and uh, that site is w the way it was before Durian. Uh, and then we'll communicate the cost uh, associated with that. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's, 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 it's curious that the Premier won't share any estimate of the costs. And certainly there will be a final tally, no question. There will be a final tally at the end of all this. But at this stage, the government must have some indication of the cost. They should have had that when they began the process, but it's been, uh, it's been almost two months. Uh, presumably, they have some estimate of the cost. So when we spoke to the FOIPOP officer, uh, to the office of the FOIPOP commissioner, about the non-responsive character of the disclosure, they said, just appeal. Well, we know that the appeal process is two and a half years. It seems like uh, this government is using that as a convenient way to keep information from taxpayers. I'd just like to ask the Premier one more time. Can the Premier share at least an estimate of the cost of the crane removal? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, thanks. As I said, Mr. Speaker, my earlier question, Mr. Speaker, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, when we, uh, that uh, project uh, is complete, uh, when we've secured that, when we've seen the damage associated with that, we will communicate to Nova Scotians 
uh, Mr. Speaker, the exact cost associated. Unlike being in opposition, Mr. Speaker, we can't make things up. We have to deal with the reality of what it is, and I want to make sure it's an accurate number. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the last 12 years, we've had in Nova Scotia an invaluable environmental roadmap, which has legislatively required us to do some very important things. Here are three. Reduce mercury emissions to no more than 35 kilograms by 2020. Increase the amount of money spent by the people of the province on locally produced food to 20% by 2020. And reduce solid waste disposal to no more than 300 kilograms per person per year. Mr. Speaker, with the overdue five-year review of the Environmental Goals and Sustainable Prosperity Act nowhere in sight, will the Premier tell the House if these targets have been met. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the roundtable would have uh, that information. Uh, I can get that for the Honourable Member uh, and have it presented to him. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Uh, Mr. Speaker, these uh, these targets are extraordinarily important. Nova Scotia has one of the highest mercury levels in the country, and we know that our agricultural industry is contributing half a billion uh, every year to our provincial economy, and in a way which doesn't have the uh, heavy environmental footprint of bringing food in from great distances. And, and as far as solid waste is concerned, we know we have a recent report commissioned by the government that says we've got way too many landfills and that our solid waste management is not what it should be. So, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask the Premier, does he support the need to have hard, strong, unmovable targets in these areas of mercury levels and local agriculture and solid waste? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As I said, uh, the roundtable would have uh, that information. They're reviewing it. We'll get it to the Honourable Member. But to his question, absolutely, Mr. Speaker. 53% uh, GHD reductions below 2005 levels. All Nova Scotians should be proud of that work, Mr. Speaker. We're continuing to ensure that we get to net zero, Mr. Speaker, in this province piece of legislation that's been formed. We're a leader when it comes to waste diversion, uh, Mr. Speaker. We need to continue uh, to make sure that we continue to lead the country in many of these files, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Here, Mr. Speaker, is the target that is uppermost in the minds of the people of the province. Uh, we know that global warming in excess of 1.5 degrees will mean these things. Greater drought, more extreme temperatures, higher sea level rise, more extreme species loss, increased ocean temperatures, increased loss of marine, coastal ecosystems, decrease in annual catch for marine fisheries, increased risk to livelihoods, food security, water supply, human security and economic growth, increased impacts on human health, including increased risks from diseases like malaria, amongst others, many of which are going to be a lot more more extreme for coastal areas and coastal populations like ours. Does the Premier grasp that it is a life and death imperative that global warming be kept within 1.5 degrees? The Honourable Premier. Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. That's why we have uh, the most aggressive targets in the country, Mr. Speaker. That's why we will continue to have uh, those targets, Mr. Speaker. We also see, Mr. Speaker, we, ne we need economic growth and job creation. Uh, in, in efficiency Nova Scotia alone, there's 1,400 jobs associated with our collective march towards ensuring that we green up this province, Mr. Speaker. We see more opportunities. We continue to lead the nation, Mr. Speaker. And it's my hope, Mr. Speaker, that other Canadian provinces will join in the fight that Nova Scotia has been when it comes to dealing with climate change. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, I hope they can catch up to us when it comes to growing the economy. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Premier is often fond of accusing other people of making things up, uh, but he doesn't like to be held to account on his own record. We, uh, we put a FOIPOP request in for the legal fees on the Alex Cameron situation. We're not looking for the, for the legal advice. We're not looking for the strategy. We're just purely trying to find out how much taxpayer money the Premier has spent on the Alex Cameron case. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the response uh, to that FOIPOP request, 41 pages of completely blank information. 41 pages. That's a response to the FOIPOP request. I'd like to ask the Premier, is 41 blank pages an appropriate response to a FOIPOP request? I'll table that for the benefit of the House. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, our, our record is one of growth, Mr. Speaker, the highest population in the history of the province, Mr. Speaker, more young people choosing to live, Mr. Speaker, in this province, seeing an economic future for themselves, Mr. Speaker, the honourable members may want to laugh, but young Canadians and young Nova Scotians are actually, Mr. Speaker, 
taken the choice to live in this province and create good jobs, Mr. Speaker. It might be a laughing matter for the Honourable Member. The fact of the matter is, it's creating good opportunities for our sons and daughters to be able to see a future for themselves here, Mr. Speaker. I want to remind the Honourable Members, under both the Conservative and New Democratic Party, Mr. Speaker, more young people were leaving this province than were staying, Mr. Speaker. We've seen them choose the opposite, Mr. Speaker. More young people are living in Nova Scotia, working and creating job options. That's a record, Mr. Speaker, young Nova Scotians are proud of. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I would love to debate the Premier on his record on the immigration file. It is horrendous when you compare it to Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Prince Edward Island. Those are places that can claim success in what's happened. Nova Scotia's population is the highest it's ever been, despite the efforts of this government. But returning to the matter at hand, Mr. Speaker, 41 pages withheld. 41 pages blank information responding to a FOIA pop request. That's the question the Premier doesn't want to answer because he knows it's a question that can't properly be answered. There's no answer for something like that. Why does the Premier continue to send course, uh, cases to court after court after court instead of just releasing information that should be released? Even the courts, uh, the court reminded, uh, court reminds Nova Scotia it is bound by the rule of the law in its decision on the Ombudsman's case. I'll table that for the benefit of the Premier too. Premier, follow the laws of the land and release the information. Why won't you? The Honourable <laughs> Premier. Speaker, the Honourable Member may be against immigration, Mr. Speaker, but the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, he can dismiss all he wants, Mr. Speaker, the fact that we are at an all-time high when it comes to our population, Mr. Speaker. Not only welcoming new... Order, please. The Honourable Member for Picto East will excuse himself from this chamber. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, he can deny the fact that we're welcoming more uh, new Nova Scotians and new Canadians, Mr. Speaker. He can deny the fact that more young people are choosing to live and work in this province. The reality of it is our population is at an all-time high, Mr. Speaker. And I want to remind the Honourable Member, Mr. Speaker, when a federal Conservative Party was in power, Mr. Speaker, they held us to 500 nominees, Mr. Speaker. We are now at 1,400, with 2,000, Mr. Speaker, with inside of Atlantic Canada. That is a government, Mr. Speaker, that is changing the dial not only for this province, but Atlantic Canada. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. My, uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Environment. This summer was another summer where Dartmouth's lakes were plagued with toxic algae blooms and clogged with invasive weeds. Investigations by our caucus have uncovered that there is not sufficient monitoring by the Department of Environment in Dartmouth's lakes and that we desperately need more science and more cooperation at the provincial level on the problems facing urban lakes. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister please explain what progress his department has made in improving the level of monitoring being done in Dartmouth lakes? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Mm. I thank the member. Uh, very much for the question, her and her colleague. Uh, I was pleased to have the opportunity to sit down with them uh, a few weeks ago and talk about that topic. Uh, I, I commend them for bringing it forward. The, uh, the situation certainly with these lakes is, is one that's, um, that's uh, complicated. When, it, when you look at uh, development within an urban rural area like that, uh, we, within the Department of Environment, take that role very seriously. We would like to work with uh, our partners there and ensure that the uh, many people, either the developers, the municipality and the stakeholders there are informed and we'll continue to work with them to bring them up-to-date information on the status of uh, those lakes. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dermot North. Yes, Mr. Speaker, uh, my colleague from Dartmouth South and I did meet with the Minister of the Environment and we're very pleased uh, that uh, he made the time for us. Uh, and I'll ask him more about that in a moment. Uh, on August 22nd, though, before that meeting, the, uh, my colleague and I, the MLA for Dartmouth South, uh, we hosted a meeting about Dartmouth Lakes. About uh, 150 people packed the room to imagine solutions for the urban lakes. We invited local MLAs and councillors as well as the Ministers of Lands and Forestry, Communities, Culture and Heritage and the Environment because we knew we we need to work together to tackle this complex problem. After much discussion, the community has crystallized around a defined ask of this government to convene an Urban Lakes Commission. 
So, Mr. Speaker, at the aforementioned meeting with the Minister, he indicated he was open to the solution. So I'd like to ask, uh, is the Minister still open to convening an Urban Lakes Commission and what update can he provide on that work? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. And again, Mr. Speaker, I thank the member opposite for the, for the, uh, for the question. Certainly one of the uh, uh, things that we need to understand in her statement and her question is it is a complicated uh, situation in the Dartmouth Lakes. Uh, it's a challenging area where we're seeing development at the same time we're uh, seeing these lakes being uh, uh, dealt with sometimes situations that don't have to do with development, they have to do with climate change. Uh, they have to do with invasive species. And uh, I have uh, committed to continuing the conversation with uh, the members opposite and uh, look forward to those conver uh, conversations as we get down the road. Thank you. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Question for the Minister of Internal Services, Mr. Speaker. We saw the Auditor General's report released today, and two things stood out. Uh, one, that uh, Service Nova Scotia internal, and Internal Services may not be able to prevent and detect unauthorized and fraudulent payments. And also, that uh, there was an inability to ensure departmental purchases achieve value for money. Now, Mr. Speaker, we recall the young man who had police land at his door when he was found to have changed some characters in the address box uh, when he was on the, using the internet to gain access into the department's uh, private information that belonged to Nova Scotians. Mr. Speaker, it's the same people in the same leadership positions uh, here, Mr. Speaker. Why is the department responsible for information and procurement controls failing to provide Nova Scotians confidence? that this government has the ability to manage these important systems. The Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia and Internal Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for the question. Um, we've learned quite a bit from our privacy breach that took place a couple of years ago and have made sure that we have um, practices embedded within our contracting to uh, make sure that privacy impact assessments and threat risk assessments are being done on all contract work that's happening. We take the audit from the Auditor General and have worked with his, with his office and continue to work with his office to make sure that we are um, finding the deficiencies and working on them to make sure that we comply. Thank you. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Speaker, I want to now turn to the Minister of Transportation also with respect to this report of the Auditor General. Mr. Speaker, I think these are important questions uh, because if we're asking them here in the Legislature, we're adding the weight of the Legislature behind them. Mr. Speaker, transportation is responsible for some of the biggest projects in this province. Hospitals, roads, contaminated site remediation, but only 11% of staff have completed their fraud training. So, Mr. Speaker, I don't want the Premier to stand up and say that we're accusing those members uh, of the government civil service of fraud, but Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, I think it, it shows that the government has, has not made this a priority in that department. And my question for the Minister, as leader of this department, will the Minister accept responsibility and what will he be doing to correct this? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, the, uh, the issue of uh, integrity in the department is of, of uh, highest importance to us. We have a large number of people. Uh, the uh, process, not all of them have access to uh, computers or familiarity with it. So what we're doing uh, internally is looking at where we're at right now. We're at around 19% in the overall picture. We're at 47% for our uh, uh, senior management. And uh, we, will, we will be conducting a process whereby the training will be, be done in a group manner so people can do it uh, uh, in a more accessible way. Thank you. Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. As the Minister is aware, the role of uh, educational program assistants are critical to our education system. Gone are the days of an EPA supporting students solely for academics. Mr. Speaker, they serve as nurses, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, counsellors, speech therapists, secretaries and research experts for special needs and behaviours. Mr. Speaker, EPAs are not privy to the full medical information of the students they work with. I've heard stories from EPAs uh, contracting ringworm, impetigo and even pink eye. As the Minister is aware, the right to know is a fundamental pillar of workplace safety. My question is this, what steps is the Department taking to ensure EPAs have the required information in order to protect themselves and the students they work with and to avoid workplace injury? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Of course, we value the role of, of EPAs, uh, depending on what region you're in, TAs. 
uh, our educational assistance. That's why we have hired uh, many more to support our students in Nova Scotia. Of course, our priorities to make sure that our schools are safe, not just for the students, but for our staff. And we do have protocols in place from region to region to ensure that the interests of those staff are protected. The Honourable Member for Dermot East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I certainly recognize that the government has made investments with the inclusion model, but Mr. Speaker, I'm still hearing uh, the same concerns from EPAs that I did five or six years ago. Now, Mr. Speaker, I served on an occupational health and safety committee at my local high school, and the most common issue uh, that was uh, brought up uh, were injuries and workplace hazards for EPAs. Um, along with those pressures, Mr. Speaker, uh, EPAs are at times assigned too many students at one time. EPAs have told me that the assignments uh, at times do not match their skill set or training. So my question to the Minister is this. Why aren't educational program assistants or teaching assistants receiving more professional development so they can better support students with higher needs? Thank yep. you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In fact, uh, when it comes to the major uh, increase in investments we've made as a, as a government uh, for more uh, EAs, uh, we've also put money aside for professional development. So there are dollars available in the system that can be accessed um, by our, our educational assistants. On top of that, we have hired uh, close to 400 other uh, inclusive education support staff as well, including child and youth care practitioners, uh, behavioral experts, autism experts, uh, more uh, counselors and guidance counselors, more uh, school psychologists, uh, all this to provide the necessary wraparound support to meet the variety of needs that our students have to ensure that they're successful and that all the pressure in, in delivering education uh, to our students isn't solely on the teacher and the educational assistant. The Honourable Member for Sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it was recently announced that six new projects would be added under the Flood Risk and Infrastructure Investment Program, and I'll table that. As the member for sackville cobbequid this announcement was of particular interest because of the Sackville and Little Sackville Rivers expanding floodplains that were recently mapped through HRM. Stormwater management is a huge issue in Sackville, despite significant upgrades in the infrastructure by Halifax Water. When the affordable housing initiatives in the 1960s and 70s was underway, the location for housing was often in floodplains and or serviced with shallow stormwater systems. My question to the Minister of uh, Municipal Affairs is, can the Minister clarify how recipients were determined and whether any parts of the Sackville floodplain area will receive any of this funding? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It is absolutely important that when we are developing, obviously, that the planning has changed a great deal. We have implemented uh, last year, we put a bill through this house, uh, minimum planning standards, Mr. Speaker, that speak to that very specific thing around our waterways, around our rivers, as the Honourable Minister has uh, uh, spoken to. Those are important uh, for us, obviously, as we go forward on how development will happen, and we'll certainly look at all those options as we move forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sackville Cobbett. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With the effects of climate change, areas that were built on low-lying ground, such as floodplains, will certainly see an increased risk related to flooding. In Nova Scotia, famously, you're never more than 67 kilometers from the ocean. That makes a lot of land that's near sea level. When you add in more than 3,000 lakes and rivers, I am sure that there are more areas that will need assistance through this program. Mr. Speaker, would the minister please explain the department's plan for assistance to other parts of Nova Scotia that are facing increased flood risks? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. He does raise a very important issue. Again, uh, the work that we're doing with our municipal units is absolutely vital when it comes to planning and how they proceed with development, uh, Mr. Speaker, right across the province. And we'll be paying close attention to that, working with our municipal partners. There's lots of work to do. Uh, this is uh, climate change, as we know, the, the member has spoke to. Uh, an important issue for us, and we have seen these changes along the rising sea levels, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, more so in some areas than others, and we'll continue to see that. We see other weather's changing. We'll continue to work with our municipal partners, as, as I have uh, stated. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health and Wellness. 
Mr. Speaker, the only place on Cape Breton Island to get inpatient detox services is at the Cape Breton Regional Hospital. However, recent changes have made it so that while people are checked into detox, they are able to get passes to leave the program for a few hours. Since this change, it's been discovered that some people who have these passes are doing other drugs or consuming other substances, sometimes on hospital property, it is alleged. Detox is a voluntary program, so locking people isn't allowed, but allowing them to ingest other drugs defeats the purpose of them being in detox. So my question for the minister is, what measures has the department taken to prevent people in detox from consuming other drugs on hospital property? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the, the member for raising uh, this important uh, question. Uh, certainly, uh, we, we speak uh, and, and have spoken quite uh, at length about mental health. Uh, on this floor. Uh, it's great to, to have a conversation about uh, the addictions as well. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, first and, and foremost is uh, the operational uh, care and, and delivery of uh, our programs uh, are uh, delivered by our, our health authorities uh, on the front line, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the fact is the uh, guidance for uh, program uh, delivery uh, in the area of addiction services uh, is something that's evolving based upon clinical research and best practice evidence. Uh, and that's uh, the way that they deliver these programs. The Honourable Member for Kings North. With, uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Minister for that answer. While there has been a shift to community-based treatment for some addictions, for others, detox remains the tried and true solution. And with only one location on Cape Breton offering these inpatient detox, the opi opiate addicts are limited for uh, with one, only one location on Cape Breton offering inpatient detox, the options are limited for those wishing to get off of opiates. In fact, Tom Blanchard of Talbot House tells me that he's getting numerous calls from opiate addicts who want to do inpatient detox, but are told the only treatment model for opiate addicts is a harm reduction model of methadone or suboxone. For anyone looking, into, uh, looking to check into the abstinence-based treatment centres such as Talbot House, they have to complete detox first, and for opiate addicts, there's now no place to do it. Tom Blanchard states that home-based detox is both dangerous and ineffective. So my question for the Minister is, will the Minister look into restoring inpatient detox beds for opiate addicts who want this option in Cape Breton and, in fact, in the province? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's a great opportunity, I believe, to uh, draw members' attention to uh, the extensive work that uh, we've been doing uh, with the department as well as our, our partners uh, in uh, the health authority uh, and community-based partners, uh, specifically around this topic of uh, treating and supporting uh, Nova Scotians that have opioid use disorder. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that is uh, challenges with addictions in, in the use of opioids. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, one of the first public announcements I did in 2000 2017, as Health Minister was released the framework uh, for opioid uh, uh, addiction uh, inter in interface. There are five pillars to that, Mr. Speaker. We've been aggressing and investing in all of them, and we've seen the wait list, Mr. Speaker, reduced uh, down by over 90 percent for people looking for treatment for opioid uh, misuse uh, disorder in this province because of those investments saving lives. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Grant Thornton's independent study on economic viability of the CBRM was released in July. It found that outward migration is largely due to the sluggish economy and higher than average unemployment rates, and that increased financial contributions from the federal and provincial governments will be necessary for the continued sustainability of our community. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask the Minister what steps has his department taken in response to the release of that report? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the question. Uh, we want all uh, communities in Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker, to be healthy, thriving, and growing, Mr. Speaker, including the CBRM. Um, lots of stuff uh, in the report that has been uh, uh, written, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to work with the CBRM as we go forward in an effort to support them and all municipalities right across this province. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Mr. Speaker, the CBRM cannot keep up with the demand for services in our communities. The Grant Thornton report found that CBRM departments are already stretching their resources to the limit. Our local infrastructure is taxed, 
buses are overcrowded trying to get students to CBU, and we're facing a severe housing shortage. Mr. Speaker, we are on the verge of bouncing back, but we're not going to be able to, to take advantage of this momentum without some significant assistance from the province. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell me if the province will be providing additional financial support to the CBRM? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'm uh, glad the Honourable Member uh, uh, raises a topic around investment. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this government has reinvested in one example. One example, Mr. Speaker, is the revitalization of the health care projects in infrastructure in Sydney, Glace Bay, New Waterford, and North Sydney, Mr. Speaker. We will continue, Mr. Speaker, that is a huge investment. We will continue to invest in a fiscally responsible way, not only in the CBR, Mr. Speaker, but right across Nova Scotia. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Wellness. Currently, there are four dialysis chairs at the Sutherland Harris Memorial Hospital in Pictou. Those chairs are servicing an area with a population of over 45,000 people. Mr. Speaker, as we speak at this moment, there are um, a waiting list of 14. And I know the members in this chamber realize that that number is just going to increase. Yes, we have heard the good news with announcements elsewhere in the province received chairs in Bridgewater, Digby, Glace Bay, Kentville, but I'd like to know if the Minister can please provide the House with an update on when Picto will receive additional dialysis chairs. Please. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member uh, for bringing uh, the question forward. Uh, indeed, as we've uh, spoken uh, previously, uh, even on the, on the floor, for those uh, Nova Scotians uh, who require uh, dialysis uh, treatment, uh, it, uh, you know, those of us who don't have that experience, I don't think can truly appreciate uh, three to four days a week, uh, upwards of four to five hours of treatment, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it, 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 is, it does take a toll uh, just to receive the treatment. But Mr. Speaker, uh, we have followed uh, recommendations and advice uh, to have an expansion uh, program throughout the province. The sites that the member uh, referenced uh, were identified and that work is ongoing. That's a, a, a priority space, uh, Mr. Speaker, for us for uh, expanding. We need to get those sites up and running, see how the distribution of need and uh, supports uh, roll out from there uh, going forward. The Honourable Member for Pictou West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There is a great need in Pictou County. 14 people on the waiting list and growing. 14 people traveling to Anaganish, traveling to Toro, and traveling to Halifax several times a week. This is simply unacceptable and it's unfair, Mr. Speaker. In order to receive treatment, these individuals are traveling on some of the most dangerous highways in our province. Mr. Speaker, I have a friend, Bernie Clark, who is 88 years old, and he has been advised that he will have to start treatment very soon. His doctor told him to start preparing, and he said, do you know what preparing means, Carla? That's figuring out how am I going to make the trek to Halifax at 88 years old. So I want to know, does the minister believe Bernie Clark who's 88 years old, should have to leave his community several times a week to receive a life-saving treatment. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, one of the uh, things uh, going on, as the member uh, noted, was uh, part of the province, an expansion of uh, dialysis uh, seats in a number of locations based upon a review uh, of our, our renal program in the province. Those seats have been identified, investments have been uh, committed, and these projects are well underway. But Mr. Speaker, uh, as I've had discussions as recently as, uh, I believe, uh, last week uh, with representatives of the renal program, there are a number of other things uh, ongoing, Mr. Speaker, including the pursuit of expansion expansion of home dialysis, Mr. Speaker, uh, encourage uh, constituents uh, and, and members to engage with their health care providers to see if the home dialysis is right for them. Imagine being able to receive that uh, treatment, Mr. Speaker, overnight in your own home. You don't have to travel and you don't disrupt the bulk of your daytime, Mr. Speaker. There are options, including transplant, Mr. Speaker. We're taking an aggressive steps to improve transplant opportunities for Nova Scotians as well. The Honourable Member for Sackville-Beaverbank.
Mr. Speaker, today my question is for the Minister of Community Service. I've been working on a child's protection service case on behalf of a constituent of mine, Charlene Sapphire. My office has twice filled out the necessary forms that empower me to work on the constituent's behalf, and I'll table copies of both of those. These forms are meant to allow me to receive information that would otherwise be withheld for privacy reasons. Yet time and time again, my attempts to receive the necessary information seem to be frustrated by bureaucratic red tape. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Minister is, would the Minister please explain to me why the Department continues to withhold documents or provide an update on this case? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Thank you, Mr. Ste Speaker. My understanding is the Honourable Member has received a number of updates on this particular case, and I'm not aware of any outstanding uh, issues that have been raised. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, just for clarification for the Minister, I have not. Um, so maybe we could do that. Mr. Speaker, when we ask a constituent to fill out these forms, we're creating an expectation. If the forms don't create the situation where sufficient information can be shared, then all MLAs are at risk. As the MLA for Pictou East has pointed out many times, constituents don't come to us at their best time. They come to it at on their worst times. So when we hand in these forms, that's a we can help. Those forms should empower us as MLAs to help. If not, we're just creating false hope. Mr. Speaker, as the Minister consider strengthening the release forms so that more information can be shared with MLAs working on behalf of their constituents? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. The release form that is used is the same release form that is used all across government, Mr. Speaker. I'm not exactly sure how MLAs are at risk from their constituents, but I want to assure the Honourable Member that we do res respond in a timely may way when uh, calls or uh, inquiries do come in. And I do want to assure him, Mr. Speaker, that at our local DCS offices, every phone call is tracked. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of TIR. My constituency office receives a disproportionate amount of calls about the Medway River in Queen's County. This is a part seal coat, but mostly dirt road, connecting several small communities from Mill Village to Greenfield. The high volume of traffic on the road, including trucks, have degraded the road over time. Year-round and seasonal residents both report the poor state of the road is seriously impacting real estate prices and the constant vehicle repair bills are adding up, Mr. Speaker. Repeated requests to TIR haven't resulted in much more than partial graveling in what appears to be random sections. My question for the Minister is, will he commit to having the road inspected and conduct a viability study on the potential paving of the road, or at the very least, having the length of the road seal code it? Thank you, Mr. The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, first uh, of all, uh, I hope that the member is taking advantage of the opportunity to meet with our people and uh, talk about uh, this year's program. And I would certainly point her in the direction of the gravel road uh, program, which has been very successful uh, in rural. Uh, Nova Scotia in terms of building the base uh, of these uh, roads and getting them ready for uh, surface preparation if it could be paving or seal coat. The paradox we have in Nova Scotia is that much of the economy, and particularly in your area too, is on, in the forestry with heavy loads on gravel roads, which is providing jobs for areas and also putting a lot of undue pressure on our uh, uh, gravel road system and limiting the types of coatings that we can apply in those circumstances. Uh, short of building them uh, to a 100 series uh, standard. But I'd be more than happy to discuss this further with you, no trouble. The Honourable Member for Queen Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, fact, I thank the Minister for his response. On this same road, in an area called Riversdale, a section of the road has become extremely dangerous. It's so narrow that cars can't pass each other at the same time, and the road section is low enough that the presence of ice or a fast and high river current poses a serious danger danger to motorists, particularly as there are no guardrails. To date, there has been no response from TIR following a commitment to study this section of the road. So my question to the Minister is, when will this dangerous section of road be seriously examined and fixed? The Thank Honourable you. Minister of Transportation. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for the question. And uh, uh, an area with a, as pleasant a sounding name as Riversdale uh, is worthy of uh, another look. We'll take a look at uh, the uh, situation there immediately and see what we can do. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question as well is to the Minister of TIR. Mr. Speaker, many of us as MLAs, especially in rural areas, continuously receive calls about the condition of many of the roads in our constituencies. The calls can range from a request for paving on the higher end, but most of them are about potholes, ditching, shoulders, guardrails, washouts, and the grading of our roads. And these calls seem to be increasing year after year. So my question for the Minister is, what is this department doing to address the increasing volume of major and minor repairs in our constituencies. The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, I'm very proud of the advancement we've made in our uh, budget in the uh, Department of uh, Transportation Infrastructure Renewal over the last several years. Uh, we're in excess of $300 million currently. Uh, we have put more money into uh, um, mowing uh, the uh, 100 series highways, which has cascaded the money that had been spent there out to the rural areas. Uh, in uh, the members' constituency in particular, I think about Tarbet as an example, a beautiful area which has been done uh, more recently, and we're undertaking now uh, to climb the big mountain of Smoky and redo that uh, after, after 60 years. So uh, we, we are very mindful of uh, the need to expend, expend our resources in the rural areas and will continue to do so. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we, we all appreciate the funding increase that's gone to both maintenance paving and the gravel road program, and we've all benefited from both. But the minor repairs that could be done before they became a major expense can't be done because of lack of funding. I'm sure if you checked with the area managers and supervisors, you'd find that many, if not all, would tell you that their budgets were spent before summer was even over. With an increase in funding, many of these jobs could be done, but this isn't happening. So my question is, will the minister commit to a significant increase in the regular maintenance budget to enable these area managers, supervisors, and employees to get their job done? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member opposite for the question. Uh, it's always a, a challenge in government to balance uh, the various uh, departmental expenditures. I have to say again, though, that I'm very pleased with the cooperation that we've had from Treasury Board, uh, in particular when it comes to uh, our maintenance budget. We've, we were able to increase it by $4 million over the last uh, uh, two years, which is uh, the largest increase we've seen in several years in, uh, in the department. Yes, we wish we had more money. We're always looking for innovative ways to make the money we have uh, go farther, stretch the dollar, and uh, uh, we'll continue to uh, search those opportunities out, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, my question is also for the Minister of TIR. Mr. Speaker, in response to a question last spring about the Halfway River Abateau, the Minister responded the contractor is now anticipating a very early summer completion date. The contractor has agreed to work two shifts seven days a week to complete this important work. He went on to say, we believe the danger posed by the spring runoff is past and we're offering a permanent solution to the people of Hansport. I'll table that. In August, an engineer wrote a letter stating that settlement by erosion was causing issues around the culvert structure and embankment. And I'll table that. So my question for the minister is this. We now know that the original design failed. How much will the abattoir repairs cost and what guarantee that the repairs that are nearly done now will work? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member opposite for the question. We continue to be committed to uh, solving the uh, issue around the Abateau, which, of course, affects the uh, uh, um, local community in the area there and also our own threatens our own particular uh, infrastructure uh, in the area. Uh, I would invite the uh, member, if he hasn't had an opportunity to speak to the department yet, we could include that in your consultation when you come in to talk. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Minister for that answer. 
Um, Mr. Speaker, the solution to fix the erosion that was happening was to put gates on the culverts and create an abattoir. And in fact, this is exactly what the people of Hansport have been asking for. It's illustrated by a letter dated October 6, 2019 from the Abateau Action Committee, which I will table. A response to the Action Abateau Committee states that the gates will re be removed at some point in the future. And I'll table that too, actually. Uh, my question for the minister is this. When will the minister actually listen to the residents of Hansport and area and leave the gates on the Halfway Ridge River project, making it a permanent abattoir as they requested? The Honourable Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank Member Ops for the question. For the question. Uh, in, in our design process, uh, the gates are uh, uh, a part of that uh, design. Uh, they are in such a way that uh, they are an option uh, that can be used or not um, employed. And uh, I think that gives us the best of both worlds there as we uh, work continuously to restore that piece of infrastructure in the area there. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, African Harbour is in a beautiful, picturesque community on the shores of Bay of Fundy. Generations of family have called this place home and survived on the land and seas. Part of the community mindset is the spirit that created Bayview Nursing Home. As the Minister knows, we have an issue with lack of long-term beds in the province, so my question to the Minister is, with low numbers of patients in this nursing home and beds open, would the Minister work with me in a plan to utilize these beds and secure the sustainability for this site? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member uh, for uh, raising uh, the topic of uh, long-term care services. Uh, as the member would know, uh, we're very uh, committed to, to uh, supporting Nova Scotians uh, in, uh, who require continuing care services, whether that's to, to stay in their home, receive home care services uh, and supports, Mr. Speaker, or in long-term care uh, facilities. And so, Mr. Speaker, uh, certainly, uh, if the member has uh, more details of the, the specific site, uh, I don't have uh, information about it uh, off the top of my head. Uh, happy to have the conversation, get them connected uh, with the appropriate people within the department. We are certainly looking at opportunities to uh, continue reducing wait times. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that. Bayview is not only a nursing home to the area, Mr. Speaker, it's also a primary employer of this area. Locals have worked to see this nursing home come to reality and now work hard to secure it. Many families, families in the area are looking to this facility to be there when their loved ones or themselves may need it in time. As Advocate Harbour is a place in the Fundy Shore, it has great lobster and great scallops, and a vi viable long-term care beds are quite a drive from this area. So would the Minister come to Advocate Harbour and visit this nursing home with myself? And Mr. Mr. Speaker, the seafood dinner's on me if you will come to Advocate Harbour. The Honourable Minister of Health. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, it's it's always uh, a risky proposition for members in this legislature uh, to raise the question of uh, lobster, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, being a representative for Anna Kanish on uh, St. George's Bay, uh, Mr. Speaker, in the Strait, uh, I may have a differing opinion uh, as to where the best lobster comes from. Uh, but that, again, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we'll certainly uh, pick up this conversation outside the, the chamber and uh, see uh, what uh, the current status uh, and any outstanding requirements requests uh, from that particular site uh, and see uh, how that fits in with uh, the other work that's ongoing within the department as we continue to strengthen and the supports for our long-term care facilities, and really ultimately uh, for those people who both work uh, but also reside in these facilities throughout the province, including Advocate Harbour. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadamid Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. On September the 16th, on the Moose River Road, which has seen a ton of accidents, a logging truck ended up catching a hold of some power lines. It tore them down and blew out the transformer. The event even saw the mast ripped off a house of a constituent of mine. This constituent of mine is a senior on limited income, and for two days and nights she went without power while she scrambled to come up with $1,200 to get it repaired. Finally, a family member uh, assisted her with the expectation that the money be, uh, be, uh, uh, be reimbursed. So my question for the uh, minister is, is there funding in place that could assist seniors with cases such as this? 
The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for the question. Um, First, I've heard of uh, that uh, actual situation, but I am happy to work with the member to look at programs that are available. We do have a variety of programs uh, through th seniors and, and low income and uh, uh, work that can be done to their homes, so I'm, I'm more than happy to have a conversation uh, with the honourable member about that particular incident. Thank you. The honourable member for Cole Harbour, Muster, Colchester, Muscadabit uh, Thank you for that answer. Uh, normally, a person would go through insurance. Um, the company did not step up to take responsibility, the company owning the truck. Uh, the driver did not stop, just kept right on going. Uh, the same constituent also had an accident a while ago that had to go through insurance and her insurance went up. So to claim again, she just cannot <laughs> afford it. Her insurance will go up so much. Uh, so my answer is, is there some kind of emergency funding anywhere in the housing, and we will talk about this, uh, to help own owners with these unexpected cases that occur. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, to the Honourable Member. There is the uh, low-income homeowners uh, uh, grants that are available that we've had for some time now, and there are other emergency repair uh, grants that exist as well. I know from my own experience uh, in my constituency, we've used them many times. We're happy again to work with the Honourable Member, and uh, that situation is very unfortunate. Uh, but uh, just contact me, uh, Honourable Member, and we'll, uh, we'll chat further about that. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister responsible for housing. While rent supplements can be effective to bridge gaps where there is a shortage of adequate social housing for particular clients, we also know that it is increasingly difficult to assign rent supplements due to, due to the low vacancy rate and rising rents across the province. I'll table an article about one person who refused a rent supplement because she could not find an affordable apartment, even with the provincial funding. In one case last year, 30 people on the housing wait list turned down a rent supplement offered. Mr. Speaker, of the 500 rent supplements targeted to be assigned this year, will the minister table how many have actually been assigned? Signed to a Nova Scotian looking for housing. The Honourable Minister for Housing, Nova Scotia. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. This is indeed a uh, very important issue for us here right across the province. Uh, we have a number of uh, rent supplements that do uh, get assigned every year. I believe it was 500 or more last year. We're on target again for that this year. Those uh, rent supplements uh, are indeed important to low-income Nova Scotians. We have uh, housing support workers who are a great team of folks who assisted more than 1,200 uh, folks last year in finding housing, as an example here in the HRM, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue uh, with that program. It is a good program, and others, as we have Evolve into the first uh, three-year action plan of the 10-year housing strategy with hundreds of millions of dollars, Mr. Speaker, being invested uh, right across the province for our affordable housing needs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers has expired. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, uh, today we saw the uh, Leader of the Official Opposition ejected for heckling, something I've seen in this chamber many, many times. But I defer to your judgment, Mr. Speaker, on this matter. I also refer to the rules of the House, and when looking at them, I was left with the question, Mr. Speaker, is it necessary to create a new subsection under Clause 13 for conduct of members, since the Premier repeatedly mischaracterizes what members on the opposite side of the House say to suit his own narrative? I'll take it under advisement and, and come back to the House. We'll now move on to government business. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call address and reply? We'll now call address and reply. The Honourable Member for Sackville Cobbequid. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It, uh, I rise today for the address and reply, also known as the maiden speech, and I'm the last of the by-election class of 2019 to do so. <laughs> I'd like to congratulate the members from Northside Westmount, Sydney River, Myra, Lewisburg, Argyle, and Barrington on their maiden speeches as well. Mr. Speaker, I'm here today serving at the pleasure of the voters of Sackville Cobbequid who elected me in the by-election of June 18th, 2019 to represent all the people of Sackville Cobbequid as their member 
of the House of Assembly of Nova Scotia. It is indeed an honour and a privilege, an awesome responsibility that I do not take lightly. I will uphold their trust, placed in me to the very best of my ability. On July 10th, 2019, I was sworn in by the Chief Clerk. And since commencing, or commencing this session of the House some four weeks ago, I've enjoyed, like you and the other members, the rights, privileges, and responsibilities afforded to a member of the Nova Scotia Legislature. For this, Mr. Speaker, I thank you and all members for welcoming me as a respected equal. In my older age and many years of drinking black coffee, hot black coffee, sometimes my, uh, my voice will fade. And so, as I'm here in this house, I've attempted to figure out the microphone system here and whether I should speak loudly into the microphone, as my wife would always tell me, or to just speak naturally and let the technology and the technicians take care of things. But before I continue, I want to make mention of my immediate predecessor and longtime acquaintance, the Honourable Dave Wilson, who represented Saffold Cobbequit constituents very ably for some 15 years. As just demonstrated, I believe all members of the parties recognize the contributions of Dave, what he made to this legislature and good government over the years. Now I have a confession to make. A confession as a rookie, and this is absolutely new to me. On one occasion, Mr. Speaker, I exited the chamber and did not bow to you, the Speaker, and the member who was speaking. I, have tell you, I will tell you that in six plus years as a city councillor, I never once bowed to His Worship Mayor Savage. <laughs> the Sergeant at Arms brought this to my attention and I thanked him for that. I apologize now. On another occasion during question period, I was checking my mobile device and was advised by the member from Cumberland South that it was not permitted. Today, the member from Barrington Argyle reminded me the same thing. <laughs> I assure you, Mr. Speaker, in the last 30 minutes, it has not happened. <laughs> As a rookie, I am likely to make a few more faux pas, and I ask for your continued patience and guidance as I become more and more familiar with the House rules. Mr. Speaker, I respect every and each member of this House of Assembly. Although I was elected to serve the people of Sackville Cobbequid, and you, in turn, represent the people in your constituencies. We're all elected as a body to serve all Nova Scotians. You have my commitment to work constructively with each and every one of you on behalf of all Nova Scotians. In the next few minutes, I think I have 90, I will thank some people. You will let me and let you know a little bit about Steve Craig provide some SACO history and mention briefly a few, not all, issues that are on my mind and other people's minds. I first would like to thank my leader, the leader of the Progressive Conservative Party of Nova Scotia, the leader of the official opposition, the Honourable Member for Picto East, and the PC Caucus and Party. I thank you all. Again, I want to thank the people of Sackville-Cobbequid for giving me the opportunity to serve them as their MLA. This is an honour and a privilege that I take very seriously. I will endeavour to serve to the utmost of my ability with respect and dedication to the role and responsibility. Now, Mr. Speaker, if I could make a few introductions. I'd ask the full front two rows to stand. <laughs> and and from, I'm going to start at the left. Mr. Mike McDonald, who has been a campaign worker here. Some of you may know him as uh, his father was editor, publisher, Cape Britain newspaper for many years and a long-time liberal. It's being said that when, when he was working for, when we were working together, that his father didn't roll over in his grave. He was actually attempting to claw out and, and get at it. Next to him is uh, Mrs. Karen Smith, my constituency assistant, who I am blessed to have in my life and she is the other woman in my life besides my wife who tells me what to do consistently and when. 
Madison Richardson, grade 12 student who has campaigned door to door and performed a lot of great work in the constituency. Grade 11. 10? Okay, the member in front of me misled me. I, I forgive him for that. Grade 10. Tyler Baker, classmate. And these two are, have been members of Sea Cadets and, uh, and work greatly in the community. And then we have Alexis Richardson. Uh, Alexis has been a family friend. So Madison and uh, Alexis, and uh, next to their, their, them, their mother, Karna, are like family to my wife and I, uh, almost like a daughter and granddaughters. Now, Karna. Karna has been, Richardson has been with me campaigning many, many, many times. In fact, I would suggest that I could take my seat now and Karna could finish this for me. <laughs> she used to mock me. Say, you did this and you could see her behind me just going, as what, what it would be, yeah, and hurry up too. <laughs> Pam Osborne, longtime friend, acquaintance, beautiful. I'm gonna skip one. George and Betty LaFontaine, longtime friends, longtime friends. George is retired military, thank you for your service, George. Betty is from Sonyeville. Some of you may be able to speak, into, speak with Betty and have a conversation and uh, in her official first language, French, Acadian French. And then George, again, going back to him, if you ever want something done right in signs, ask George. He's a retired chief in the Navy and can build anything. He could, he could do this woodwork here. In the front row, we have Brenda and John, well, Brenda Hodnott and John Percy. Brenda and, and John are great partners. Brenda is an accomplished artist. John, some of you may recognize as a former leader of the Green Party of Nova Scotia and also a member of the Green Party. He has worked and we've developed a friendship over the many years. And as John would say, he's not the guy supporting the progressive conservatives, he's supporting the person. And I appreciate that. And John's best line that I recall is when, uh, when he stepped down as leader, he had some cataract surgery in that, and he said, the last thing we need in this province is another leader without vision. <laughs> the love of my life, my wife, Sherry Craig. Sherry and I have been married 44 years, and I'll have more to say about that later. So thank you to you all for being here today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for that. So family, family and friends are extremely important to us. So my mom and dad, uh, I'll speak about in a little bit. So a little bit of the history of Sackville. Sackville was settled around 1749 and in the 50s had less than 1,000 people. My wife was one of them. She was born and raised in Lower Sackville, and we now live in her grandparents' place that they built in the 50s, and we've resided in that home since 1992. And around 1969, the population was about 7,000 people. In the 80s, the population was around 35,000. The former progressive conservative, Robert Stanfield, recognized the need way back then for affordable housing. You may or may not know it, but in Halifax, Dartmouth, the vacancy rate was probably 0.4%. And the governments of the day decided that we required more affordable housing. And so they had an assembly of, um, they called it the Sackville Lakes Land Assembly. It was a planned community for about 30 or so thousand people, even had church campuses. And it was put on by the Nova Scotia Housing Corporation. So mom and dad uh, built in that, but uh, I digress a little bit further. So successive PC and Liberal governments through Nova Scotia Housing Commission expanding, expanded the service land availability and that led to very rapid growth. Sackville was one of the fastest growing, fastest growing communities in all of Canada back in the late 60s, early 70s. Cooperatives were formed, in particular military families and those who are looking and 
George and Betty and, and my parents and, and others took advantage as military people to put together four or five, six families and form cooperatives, legal entities where they would go and build. The province developed the land, they serviced the land, but the incentive was for people to put in their own sweat equity. And so Sackville grew immensely back in the late 60s, early 70s. Well, the, uh, when we moved out there, Sackville High School was not built. C.P. Allen was in Bedford. And so you had people from Hammonds Plains, Sackville's, Fall River, Waverly, all going to this one high school. As part of this assembly, they built Sackville High School, the first high school. It opened up in 1972. I had moved out there in 1971, and along with my wife, we were the last classes of C.P. Allen. And I remember walking down Glendale Avenue, which was rock, not paved at the time, because we were protesting about the lockers in Sackville High School, the students. We wanted lockers. We wanted them available. So Sackville High School came about, and some of you may recognize the name George Doucette. George Doucette, former speaker of this house, was principal of Sackville High School. It did open up in 72, and if you ever wonder when it opened up, think about the Canada-Russia series. That was in the fall of 72. But George Doucette, he did uh, become the member from Halifax Cobequid, and at that time it was the largest constituency at the time. Not in geography, but in population. So 45 years or so ago, George talked about citizens looking forward to the construction of, you may recognize this, the Bedford Bypass. So some 40, 50 years ago. And because of the growth, we're now looking forward to the construction of the Burnside Sackville Expressway. Sackville was the fourth largest urban community of about 25,000, 30,000, 40,000 people in Nova Scotia. And the talk of Sackville civic status was on everybody's tongue. Much later, under the Savage government, we had the amalgamation of the Halifax County, Town of Bedford, Halifax City, and Dartmouth City. At the same time, there is much talk about uh, emergency medical care being needed, as well as public transit. We're also known, you may recognize this, uh, for Sackville Drive-In Theater. Anybody remember that? Uh, Sackville Downs. Harness Racing, focal point of the province, that was there. But these have been replaced. They've been replaced by the Atlantic Superstore and the Downsview Mall complexes. Sackville has grown tremendously, and the population, the affordable housing experiment, nay, what, what happened, has grown a tremendous community here in the HRM and in Nova Scotia. Well, Malcolm McKay was the next MLA. Malcolm Kay was a progressive conservative MLA. He served four years, 78 to 84, and at that time the constituency was known as Sackville. So again, Malcolm emphasized that we were the largest community, and during that time, the Nova Scotia Liquor Commission on Memory Lane was repurposed to the Cobbquid Multi Service Centre. And that work came about from the work of the PC MLA's Malcolm McKay as well as PC member at that time, Steve, uh, Ken Stretch, Steve Stretch's father. Well, Shirley Freer and Carol Crosby were two nurses who advocated for the, SAC, or for the Cobbequid Community or Multi-Service Centre. And what was unique about that is that it was the first freestanding emergency centre in Canada. It was very innovative at the time. It brought together imaging, lab, brought in IWK services and some community services. So all of these were very innovative back there. Kevin McNamara was the director at that time, the executive director. And I was also on that, at that time, the health board. So every facility had its own health board. I was on that health board. And just just tremendous amount of work has been done. I'll have more to say about that in a minute. 
Well, guess who came after, after Malcolm? It was John Holm, the NDP MLA, who I knew and respected immensely. Known him for many years. He lived just down the street for, from where my wife was, uh, born and brought up. And he was a, a formidable person. You know, he and Alexa McDonough were just terrific way back when, and I, I know them, and I had some work to do with them. But John spoke of the tremendous strength of the community organizations that were growing. So in Sappho, you had, with this rapidly growing area, people who were actually engaged, engaged in not only building their buildings, their, their homes, but the community. The Lions came about. The Sackville Patriot Days came about. The Kinsmen, Rotarians, many, many organizations, Lake District Recreation Association all came about. Uh, Mr. Speaker, permission to make an introduction. Thank you. Lucille Reed, please stand up. <laughs> Thank you. Lucille has been my official agent in all my elections. And I have to note, as with Karna, both of these two working on my elections, I have always won when those two have been invo involved. So needless to say, I have them lined up for the next one. Thanks for being here, Lucille. So we had, uh, so these groups, you know, thinking coming from the military, it was very competitive, but yet collaborative, a lot of fun. And we had what was called the Sackville Winter Carnival. So the Sackville Winter Carnival was a week long plus of events. Jam can curling in the arena or out on the lake, gathering of the different groups and with your toques and your memorabilia to identify where you were from in the community. Great, and it was modeled off after Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So you had seven areas. And I was, and at times am still, bashful. I'm sure, Mr. Speaker, that's obvious to most of you here. Alas, Disney, some time ago in the following years, became aware of this and enforced its legal name rights. And over time, the Winter Carnival eventually ceased. However, with the introduction in 2015 of Nova Scotia Heritage Day on the third Monday in February, under the Sackville Business Association, the Sackville Snow Days Festival was introduced. And this year, it's going to take place on February, from February 14th to 17th in 2020. Again, an effort to rejuvenate the community spirit in the community of Sackville. The largest concern of the day was the population outgrowing the school capacity. So when I talked about first moving to Sackville, went to Sydney Stephen High School, and then came about Sackville High School. Thing, as things grew, you had double classes in Sackville High School. We were outstripping, the population was outstripping the capacity of the schools. Then came Millwood High School, Lockview High School, the new C.P. Allen. I am fortunate to say that we have experienced a problem that many areas of Nova Scotia have not experienced, and that's positive growth. And that is unfortunate. I would like to see all parts of Nova Scotia prosper and grow, not just some. So we need to work on that as a legislature, as a government. Transportation, again, was also a concern. And today, still, the Beaver Bank Road collects many, many people, and it's only two lanes. It goes down to um, what John mentioned uh, previously, the Beaver Bank Connector and the Old Sackville Road. The Beaver Bank Connector and the Old Sackville Road have been a problem area for many, 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 many years. And I was pleased to work with and pleased to acknowledge the TIR Minister for his work in this area with me and as a municipal councillor and my colleague from Sackville Beaver Bank in making a significant improvement with traffic lights this year, they have made a difference. They really have, and I want to thank and acknowledge that, the Minister. The Correctional Centre, which is now located in Burnside, was located in Sackville, and you may ask why, and it's not because we had, um, you know. Yeah, yeah, we weren't all that bad. <laughs> 
But the Correctional Centre has moved to Burnside, and that, under that period it was under the Metropolitan Authority. The Correctional Centre is now under the province, and it's located in Burnside. However, what it did is it freed up some land for the new Cobbequid Multi-Service Centre, now called the Cobbequid Community Health Centre. And this is a wonderful facility. A little bit more history. So the, the Cobbequid Community Health Centre now, John Holm talked about it. Dave Wilson talked about it. I was on the board and chair of that board for some time. When we talk about closures of emergency rooms, ERs, Sackville does not have a 24-hour emergency. And there's for good reason. But it is the best, in my opinion, operating emergency room in the province. So much so that we take and service people from all around with no hospital beds, have to be very careful in how you treat the people and move them off to either the QE2, the HI, Halifax Infirmary, or Dartmouth General. And so that's causing a backlog. When we looked at having this set up, one of the things we looked at was having a walk-in clinic. And we looked at the walk-in clinics. A lot of the local physicians at that time worked in emergency rooms. And they recognized that a lot of people were coming into the emergency room who did not have to be there. They required a doctor, a physician, they required a medication, somebody take a quick look at them. And so Dr. Jim Fitzgerald and others formed the walk-in clinic just down the road. And you may recognize that because this past number of months it did close due to a lack of doctors. Now it has reopened. Thankfully, it is reopened. If you want your flu shot, they're advertising out there, you can go get your flu shot. But the idea of the emergency room is to have emergency service, not your general practitioner service. The idea was that we would have, and we implemented, triage and gave the people coming through the door the option. You can wait, you're not high in the priority list because you're not having a heart attack, you've got some other ailment, something that can be looked at by a general physician, <clears throat> your doctor. So Dr. Fitzgerald and others opened up this medical clinic, the walk-in medical clinic, and its purpose again was to keep people away from the emergency where they ought not be, but give them an option to be serviced. And that worked. That worked well for a number of years. And now we're seeing it reverse. We're seeing a reversal that need not, in my opinion, happen. So now where you're getting people going to the ER who ought not be there, we need to be able to attract and retain new doctors. I will tell you that my physician is, uh, if he's not the oldest, he's the second oldest in the province. And I have not abandoned him. Uh, I continue to go to Dr. Tom Choi who's been a family friend and uh, my physician for close to 50 years now. He's going to retire. He's going to retire soon. I haven't even put my name on the waiting list, but I do know that uh, once he goes, a lot of people in Sackville will be looking for another physician. And Dr. Choi is holding on as best he can. So. The Cobb Quake Community Health Centre is a wonderful facility. Not only do you have emergency, you have IWK mental health clinic there. You have rehab, physio, for those who have undergone surgeries, knee surgeries, and that type of thing. It is a wonderful facility right in our own community. We are so blessed, I'm so blessed, to have so many resources in the community. One of the things that uh, another director and I did um, was we had an advocated for with uh, Cancer Care Nova Scotia and others to have a cancer clinic located at the Cobbequake Community Health Centre. That was implemented probably about five years ago. So now rather than coming down downtown to Dixon, you can go to a much warmer, friendly place, usually to get real good news. And that has been implemented and I'm sure the Minister would recognize that as well. So, Dave Wilson, he came on board in about uh, 2003. 
the year before I retired. And um, you know, he's very interested in the community. He was a paramedic. He was a paramedic, well respected, had a number of medical people, uh, paramedics and others help him in his campaigns. And he was truly appreciative of that. He grew up there. He spoke of education. He spoke of community, environment, and health care. And Dave often spoke of the need, again, for more doctors and a 24-hour emergency care at the Cobequid Community Health Center. So we need to evolve. We do indeed have a crisis here in Nova Scotia in having doctors, and we need to address that. And we are, and we're talking about it, and we'll continue to do so. One of the neat things that Dave did was we had uh, Sackville Lakes Provincial Park proclaimed. So think about this community that's building. Building, building, building. You get people in there and over the decades they said, uh, well, you know what? It's building real quick and I think we have enough. We think we have enough. We don't need any more houses. So the Sackville Lakes Provincial Park was destined to be housing. It was destined to have tens of thousands of more residents there. And in fact, when, uh, when Karen and I, others were campaigning, we'd often come by this little break, this break in the street, and you'd look at it and say, what is that, a vacant lot? No, it was, it was street. It was destined to be a street. And so we do have a lot of that in Sackville, but I am very thankful to all the governments, previous governments, who eventually did away with that and said, you know what, we do need more for the environment, we need parks, we need recreation, and that's something you know, I certainly applaud all the groups who were involved in that, and I was certainly one of the, uh, one of the people, first and foremost, in that organization as well. So what about me? Well. I'm one who believes that all are equal and deserving of respect. And that people who have more ought to help those who have less. It was my parents who demonstrated that to me and really instilled it in me. Mom, Joe Craig, Josephine Craig, she was a nurturer. She worked to help the less fortunate. She brought us up and after we were old enough, mom went back to school, became a social worker. She worked in uh, group homes and small option homes in Halifax. She also started under St. Vincent de Paul Society, the food bank in Sackville. It's called Beacon House. And that Beacon House has grown tremendously. One of the, uh, one of the people, a couple of people, uh, that worked there as students, one was a fellow by the name of Jeff Reagan. And Jeff, who you would know now, is the I guess, until they get sworn in, it's redone. But Speaker of the House of Commons. And Jeff and I have known each other for decades. And my mother would be very proud of what Jeff has accomplished. And I know that he had worked hard to help those less fortunate. And I, I cherish that. But mom, mom did that. And it became, at one point, it was called the Beacon House Interfaith Society. And I asked mom why one time, why the change in name and the expansion of the governance. And her answer was spot on. She said, Stephen, I usually heard that when I was in trouble. So I knew I'd stepped the line somehow. Stephen, more than Catholics go hungry. More than Catholics go hungry. To feed the poor, is an admirable thing. To help those who have less than you is a mission that I take on. It's one that my mother had, and it's one I will continue to do. And she instilled in me a belief in God, uh, following the example of Jesus Christ and helping others, and being counseled by the Holy Spirit. So if you want to know a little bit about me, just, just ask. Dad, too, was spiritual. He was a Navy chief, and he was the provider. He instilled in me discipline and love of country. He was a veteran of World War II and the Korean conflict. And he believed in not only the sovereignty of Canada, but the rights and freedoms of others who he fought for. So not only Canada, but to help others in other countries. He knew no bounds. They both lost their fathers at an early age, and so 
they support it and were supported by single moms. My, um, they were brought up around Halifax, around Cogswell Street. My great-great-grandfather used to lead the uh, St. Patty's Day Parade. My grandmothers uh, lived in Mulgrave Park. My, my, maternal, my maternal grandmother lived on Brunswick Street when Uniac Square was built. And these are the areas that I come from. So we lived on North Streets and Young Streets uh, in the formative years because Dad was in the Navy, we moved around. And I don't know really until we moved to Sackville if we moved around because they couldn't afford the rent or not. They never talked about it, but we moved around a lot. So we finally got into Shannon Park, Wallace Heights. And those were my formative years. I went to Shannon Park Elementary School. I went to John Martin Junior High School in the North End. Spent many between classes walking round and round and round. If you know the school, it's a round school, you can walk around. Teachers chasing me or until they lapped me, I don't know what happened there. And then went to Dartmouth High School. So, you know, my formative years were in the north end of Dartmouth. And I saw some things that we all talk about and, uh, and maybe even participated in. But these life experiences help form who you see before you today. So we went to Sackville in 71. So I had a 30 year career with the phone company. Started in engineering, went from engineering to sales, sales to marketing, marketing to finance, finance to sales. At the end of it, I was responsible for what's now Bell Alliance Business Sales Processes, called the business process owner. So you'd move from engineering into sales, they call you an engineer. You'd move from sales into finance, they'd call you a salesman. You'd move from one to another, and whatever discipline that you were in, that's what you were known as. When I retired, there was a uh, fellow responsible for costing, director, and uh, we were talking, and I was in the sales organization, business sales support organization at the time, and he says, uh, after they spoke about me a bit, he came up afterwards and he said, Damn, I can never know, I never knew why somebody from sales knew so damn much. And it's because I'd done a lot. Of course, doing a lot means that you age a lot. So after 30 years, I retired in 2004. But through that, it all came back to people. Managing people, working with people. Racism and sexism were alive and well as it was in most organizations, and still is. And I had people who protected me because I stood up. And I went so far in my career because I stood up. As a kid, I took on the bullies, and mom would say I was the only one, she was the only one who would see me cry. Sometimes I came out on top, sometimes I didn't. But the one thing from my parents that I did learn was to stick up for those who could not stick up for themselves, to right an injustice. So I've seen a number of things over the years and in my community work, organizations, whether it be the Canadian Cancer Society, whether it be Rotarians, Lake District Recreation Association, other organizations who served others and made the quality of life, it was so important. But one thing's for sure, this I can tell you, that I will not see something where somebody bullied, and depending on the situation, I will step in immediately or privately. It's not in my character to walk away or to ignore something that I feel is unjust, unjust and just not right. And I do recognize respect, and I give respect, and I always will. So, Over those many years, there are a few things. And, and by the way, I was elected, in case you don't know, in 2012, I was a city councillor, deputy mayor, chair of the police commission, and learned a little bit more there. And my wife will tell you that it's usually not the task at hand that keeps me awake at night. It's who are the people I have to work with. 
forming those constructive relationships, keeping those constructive relationships. So over the years, you pick up on a few things. So the very first thing I learned coming from the family that I did is not everyone likes you. And also delegate, but do not abdicate. Try to make life easier rather than tougher for people. This is a good one. Understand that change and difficult choices are embraced by some and feared by others. You heard me say this earlier this week or last week, I forget the days in this legislature just seem to blend together. Does it need to be said? Does it need to be said now? And does it need to be said by me? I will always ask myself those questions. I was on a sales course one time and there was a Marine captain who was given the course and it was all about strategy and tactics, military strategy and tactics. And I was just absolutely annoyed with this guy. And I couldn't figure it out why. It was about 10 day living course and he was just so good. He was excellent. And I finally figured it out. The definition of annoyance is a good example. He was so good and I was so not as good. And that annoyed the hell out of me. So I strive to be better, knowing full well that it's an ever, ever learning thing and you continue to do it. If you are not healthy, physically, mentally, spiritually, then it is difficult to help others. Or in other words, you cannot help others if you cannot help yourself. That goes for each and every one of us and everybody that we look to. There's another one, uh, this will be the last one of the Craigisms or whatever you want to call it. And, and I believe in R&D, Robin Duplicate. So some of these I may not give appropriate source to. The golden rule versus the platinum rule. So the golden rule, just paraphrasing, we would know is treat others the way that you would like to be treated. The platinum rule to me is treat others the way they would like to be treated. Two sides of the same coin. So in business, community, and political life, there are things that you and you alone take a moment to reflect on that you feel good about. One of the most significant things to me that, I was, that I've done in my political career, maybe controversial, maybe not, but it's what I feel was my, t my time as chair of the HRM Board of Police Commissioners. A number of years ago, I was asked to consider being a member of the commission, and some felt that it was not performing the role of civilian oversight the way it should. I talked with Mayor Savage about it at the time, and I was already taking on quite a workload. However, he said, take a look and see what I thought. I agreed. Regional Council appointed me. And uh, I found, in my opinion, that significant changes were required, both in exercising the authorities of the board and the composition of the commissioners. In the time I was elected chair, the changes started by working within the authorities and changing the look of the board of police commissioners, playing an active and deliberate role. I looked at the roles, responsibilities, accountabilities, and the makeup of our citizens. So I sought out to make the board more reflective of our community. When I left, the seven member board was the most diverse board in Canada, made up of three African Nova Scotians, one indigenous member, the first for the board of police commissioners, and three white Nova Scotians. Five were male and two were female. And now we have four males, three females, and the chair is an African Nova Scotia woman. I'm very proud of that. I'm proud because it shows that we are indeed a diverse community. And if you're going to serve your community, you need to reflect your community. Different perspectives, different engagement is required. I want to thank the Minister of Justice for the work that he did 
and helping me have the province appoint an Indigenous member. And that was a good thing to do. There are, there are injustices that are systemic. Systemic racism is real. We need to do better. And we cannot just flip a switch and believe that things will get better. These are centuries old issues that we have. They will take many generations to move us to where we ought to be. However, I do believe that there are some things that we as government can do to set the stage to improve. So one of the advantages, I'll let you know this too, we had a diverse police commission. We had a diverse selection committee. We chose the, police of chief, or the chief of police. The search committee was equally distributed, male, female, and we had African Nova Scotia and indigenous people on that committee. We chose and recommended, we chose and recommended that a police chief, by having a diverse and inclusive framework within the municipality, we were able to attract potential candidates from African descent, Middle Eastern descent, male and female. And as a group, we chose who we thought was the most competent person to lead us in today's time. And I think Chief Dan Kinsella is proving to be quite that person. So I just want to move on to a few issues and concerns. Housing and homelessness, we have talked about that. Poverty, we have to tackle. Community services to help those in need, to help the 1,000 or so who are under the protection of community services, to help those of low income, to help affordable housing, we need to do. Health care has been talked about in this house since September 26, and on the streets and the doorsteps of many residents long before that. Doctors we need. Youth and seniors. We need to address youth, youth mental health, the challenges that our youth have today. How do we address those? What significant steps can we take? We're legislators. We need to be able to make sure that we have people, both in the government as well as organizations, to step up to the challenges, the many challenges that are out there for youth of today. We were all youth once. We were all youth once. We will never be youth again. We're the product of our generation. The generation that is here now of youth need our help. They need to be able to have an education. They need to be supported through bullying. They need to be given medical treatment when required. They need to be in affordable, adequate housing. They need to be able to eat nutritious food. When we talk about poverty of youth, youth are in poverty. That means the parents or guardians too are in poverty. We need to address that. We need to address it now and over these next number of years. Mr. Speaker, I have 15 minutes and 54 seconds left. I'm not going to take all that time. In closing, go for it. I was told to go for it. What's the record? Is there a record? <laughs> Just tell me I've reached it and we'll go. <laughs> in closing, in closing, I want to thank my campaign team who worked really, really hard to get me elected. This was especially challenging for them because they know the way I take on a role and responsibility and dedication because as many of you know and uh, has been talked about, I continue to work as an HRM counselor, and chair of the police commission. When I get into something, I see it fully through to the best of my ability. Who knew that a year ago, the opportunity to run as an MLA would present itself? And I had to reflect really, really, really hard on whether I wanted to do that again. I was not re-offering in 2020 as a councillor. So I thought about it, looked at it, and you may have seen throughout my reply that uh, I love people. I want to make things easier rather than tougher. And by some accounts, I have the right stuff to help do that. So here I am. 
Although next time there's an election, whether that be, I don't know, six months, 12 months, 24, 30 months, um, before the next general election, I will be walking and pounding the pavement, as I've already started to do. And with this team here, we will certainly show, and with the, the ability to step up to help others. You've all talked at one point about your constituency assistance. They are the ones that will really, really, really serve the community, and they are truly under-recognized. And I, I do want to recognize, again, Karen Smith for that. Thank you. So I thank all my family and friends for their support, the voters who elected me to re represent all the people of Sackville Cobquit, and through that representation of all Nova Scotians. I want to thank my wife, Sherry Craig. Sherry supported me through all my career, volunteer and political life. We are a great team. We love to travel. We like to entertain. We like to be entertained. My love, my life without you, I, I just cannot imagine. I love you, and from, I, and I always will. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I, like all members of this legislature, will do my best to present to the government the concerns from my constituency, and in my role and responsibility as community services housing and labour relations critic. Obviously, being in opposition poses some potential challenges. However, my experience so far has been, in a most practical sense, a fair and mostly reasonable collaboration with all members who serve all of Nova Scotia. It's up to us, all of us, to do our best to serve all Nova Scotians to the best of our individual and collective ability. Whenever that election is, I hope each and every one of us will reflect back on our performance and conclude we did our very best. And then the, electric, the electorate will let us know indeed what they think. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West on an introduction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to, my colleagues to uh, turn their heads to the East Gallery. We have with us an amazing cooperative education um, student from Halifax West. She is uh, doing her co-op and she comes to the Liberal Caucus every Tuesday to follow um, the, the legislative process and she comes to the House as well. Um, Mubina, Mubina Han Uma Rova, I hope I pronounced it correctly. And Mubina was nine years old when she came from uh, Uzbekistan, uh, and she, is, she has interest in going into the legal field and was hoping to learn more about our legislation. And we welcome her in the house, and she hoped, I had a lovely chat with her. She's a, quite a, uh, an intelligent, dedicated, and very, um, uh, she has dreams, and I, I'm, I'm hoping that we have shown her what the Nova Scotia legislation is like. So please welcome to the house. The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's on an introduction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd just like to draw the, uh, the House's attention to the East Gallery, where Ms. Megan McMorris of the uh, Ecology Action Centre is with us today. Uh, Megan is the Community Energy Coordinator and spoke very eloquently and powerfully, I thought, yesterday at Law Amendments. So welcome to the House and uh, please join a round of applause. The Honourable Deputy Government House Leader. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to, on behalf of, uh, of our caucus and I hope all members of the House to uh, thank the member for uh, Sackville Kovacquit for his maiden speech this afternoon. I, I think it's become clear to all members of this House of uh, the dedication to community service that the member has shown uh, through his career, through his volunteer efforts and his political career that now continues on in this House. Uh, he's demonstrated that he is grounded uh, uh, 
with deep roots in family and friends, and I think all of us know that uh, you need those deep roots and family and friends behind you as you take on the role in the House. And uh, I'm, I, I uh, again, am sure that all members of the House uh, can observe, as I did today, that we have a new excellent member of the Legislative Assembly, and so congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that you do now leave the chair and the House resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House on Bills. The House will now recess for a few minutes while it resolves itself into the Committee of the Whole House on Bills.
order. The Committee of the Whole House on Bills will come to order. I recognize the Deputy House Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, would you please call Bill number 183? I call Bill 183, an act to exempt from taxation the property of the Digby Town and Municipal Housing Corporation in the Town of Digby. The Clerk. Madam, Madam Chair, Bill 183 was referred back to the House from the Private and Local Bills Committee without amendments and contains two clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? Shall the remaining clauses carry? Shall the title carry? Shall the bill carry? The bill is carried. I recognize the Deputy House Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, would you please call Bill number 195? I call Bill 195, an act respecting the union of certain churches therein named. The Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill number 195 was referred back to the House from the Private and Local Bills Committee and contain, without amendments and contains two clauses. Shall Clause 1 carry? Shall the remaining clauses carry? Shall the title carry? Shall the bill carry? The bill is carried. I recognize the Deputy Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Will you please call Bill number 204? I call Bill number 204, Workers' Compensation Act. I recognize the clerk. Madam Chair, Bill number 204 was referred back from the Committee on Law Amendments without amendments and contains five clauses. And we've been advised that there are change sheets, um, so we need direction as to whether the change sheets are to be distributed now. Yes, okay. We will distribute the change sheets. I'd like members to make sure they have change sheet NDP1 and it's two sided. Okay. 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 Shell clause one carry? Carry. Shell clause two carry? Carry. Clause three 
adds three new sections to the Act. We will deal with each new section at a time and then the subsections. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, what? Order. Just. Shall 35A1 carry? carry. Shall 35A2 carry? I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I draw the member's attention to CWHB NDP-1. Page 2, Clause 3, Proposed Subsection 35A, Sub 2, Line 3, Add or List it in Subsection Sub three, immediately after regulation. Would you like to speak to this? No. No? Okay, thank you. So does the amendment carry? The amendment is defeated. The subsection 35A2 carry. Carry. It's carried. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Again, I draw the member's attention to the same page. Page 2, Clause 3, Proposed Section 35A, add immediately after subsection sub 2, the following subsection, sub 3. The diseases and corresponding minimum periods of employment or volunteer work set out in the following table for the purpose of this section and the regulations are Primary site brain cancer, 10 years. Primary site bladder cancer, 10 years. Primary site kidney cancer, 10 years. Primary non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, 10 years. Primary leukemia, five years. Primary site colon cancer, 10 years. Ureter cancer, 10 years. Penile cancer, 10 years. Testicular cancer, 10 years. Esophageal cancer, 10 years. Breast cancer, 10 years. Prostate cancer, 10 years. Skin cancer, 10 years. Digestive tract cancer, 10 years. Multiple myeloma, 10 years. Pancreatic cancer, 10 years. Ovarian cancer, 10 years. Cervical cancer, 10 years. And Madam Chair, if I could, I would just like to uh, impress upon this uh, assembly the importance of the additions of these cancers. Um, the work has been done, the, uh, the research and the collaboration has been done across this country. We've talked to countless amount, uh, numbers of firefighters that uh, say fires are different nowadays, that when they go into homes, furniture is not made the same as it used to be. And Unfortunately, it has a lot more carcinogenics um, materials in it that are cancer causing. And we've listened to these firefighters say that, um, you know, they may not be exposed today, but these, these uh, may show up at a later point. These, they're, they're developing cancers at a much higher rate than ever before because of, the, uh, because of what they're fighting. And Madam Chair, I present to you that these people are, are saving our lives. These people are putting their lives on the line for everybody in this province and across the country. And I, and I would suggest that we put our money where our mouth is and support these firefighters and, and put this into law. Let's not talk about it in regulations. Let's put this in the act. Have these cancers identified so that we can protect and service those that uh, protect us and, and, and allow them to, to not have to worry about their families and their finances and, and keeping their homes should forbid the, the inevitable, God forbid, that they ever develop cancer. Because I'm sure 
<laughs> knock on wood, um, that that is not something that you're thinking about or you don't want to have to think about when you get cancer, whether or not you can afford to pay your bills. And Madam Chair, I think that this is passing this into the law is the least that we could do for firefighters across this province. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to join my colleagues' comments and say that um, I think that uh, you know we have had positive indications from the government that at least some of these may be included in the regulations, uh, but this speaks to an issue that I think has come up several times this session uh, and throughout this mandate, which is that we have bills that come before us that are the bare bones of what's required to legislate something, and everything else is left to regulations. And the issue with regulations is that we don't have the opportunity to debate them. We don't have the opportunity to see them. We often don't even know when they come into force. Uh, and so I think for us to properly do our jobs in this chamber, all of us, including those on the opposition, um, it will have a better legislative process if we can have complete bills that come before this House that have all of the requisite information in those bills so that we can understand what it is that we're talking about. Again, in this legislation, which, which our caucus will support because it is a step forward, we have the bare bones of a piece of legislation with everything left to regulation, uh, and, and we're, we're uh, disappointed that we don't see these cancers, uh, which were brought to us by fire services, um, included in the act so that we've all had a chance to see it, uh, so that we all know it's there, and so that it can't get changed without anyone knowing. Thank you, Madam Chair. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just, I, I want to I add my two cents worth, if you will. It, as, as a firefighter, 21-year um, service, um, and, and the minister knows my, my, my feelings on this bill. Um, we, we've talked at length, and I appreciate the, uh, the conversations. I've talked to the president of the Fire Service Association, um, which was clearly pointed out yesterday at law amendments. They are the voice to the government for the Fire Service in Nova Scotia. I, I'd love to see these, these cancers added in legislation. We hear here time and time again that the full legislation isn't in the legislation. We're leaving it in regulations. I agree with our counterparts over here. Um, it's, it's failing at some points in some of these bills. At the end of the day, I, I, I think we're going to support this. Is it going to pass? Probably not. It's not going to pass. But one piece of, uh, of hope and, and, and belief out of the conversation I did have with the uh, president yesterday is uh, the, the minister has confirmed to them that during the, during the development of the regulations, this list is going to be included in there. Um, I, 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 I fear that when we come back here in, in six months, 12 months, um, are we actually going to see a document that has that? that that's my only fear. Um, like I said, I don't think this is going to pass this amendment. I'm going to support it. This list is here to support the firefighters if they ever get in the danger. Um, but what, what arm, arm pull do we have here in 12 months when it's not in regulation? Um, that's what I fear for, for our firefighters. This, this legislation has been worked on for over 15 years. The fire service has been asking for this and asking for this. This is a big step forward. Not having that in that legislation, it's a little bit of a step backwards for me when I was sitting on the opposite side of the table. So thank you. I, rec I recognize the honourable member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to speak briefly on the, the uh, amendments as, as well. Um, as late as a year ago, uh, we as Cape Breton MLAs in the, in the PC caucus met with uh, the Firefighters Union in Sydney, who came forward and, and they were pushing to have this. And I know that the, the Volunteer Fire Service, of which I was a part for too many years, uh, as, you know, we, we have to have coverage and we can't depend on it just coming into regulation. If it's, if it's in the Act, we know that the guarantee is there that that coverage will be provided to both volunteer and career firefighters. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax, Citadel, Sable Island. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair, as we've been working on this um, legislation, which has been uh, going on for over a year now, 
Um, the reason it's done in regulation is this is actually what the firefighters wanted. They actually want to be able to speak with our department on all the cancers and actually go through all the data across the country, not only on, on the cancers. I mean, I have no problem putting all the cancers in because as other jurisdictions carry these cancers, they have data behind it. But what happens here, and we've seen this before with other bills, is even talking about the minimum period, um, if we put in legislation, it actually handcuffs us. If we put in legislation and not have it in regulation, it doesn't allow us to bring um, other cancers forward in the future, and they don't want to be waiting 15 years as they have in the past. Um, one example that I have shared, I know the list to the NDP did come from the firefighters. It's missing a crucial cancer, lung cancer. And so in terms of um, what firefighters have said to the department is they don't want to be waiting, they don't want to have to go through legislation every time. They want to be able to add cancers through regulation as data across the country shows that the rate of cancers is much higher in firefighters. Um, you know, this is an example of where the department listened to the firefighters and were um, actually giving them their wishes. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the Minister's comments. I, I, you know, I'm so happy to see that this is starting, but, but if, if, if we can take um, the Minister at his word, then why can't we pass these amendments, these, add these cancers, and put, you know, further cancers, any other cancers to come that are, that are, uh, come out of a, a more consultation with firefighters. Put those in the regulations. Show us that that this matters, because it did come from firefighters, and we know that this list is what they want. We know that. So let's do this. Let's, let's do this, please. I recognize the Honourable Minister for Labour and Advanced Education. Um, so again, Madam, Madam Chair, if I wasn't clear on it, the firefighters asked us to do this in regulation. They want to sit down with our department, they want to talk through the cancers, and they want the ability in the future to add cancers through regulation, and that is what we've, uh, we've done. We've consulted with the people who save our lives, and the people who save our lives asked us to do it a certain way, and I'm not going against those wishes. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, with respect, the government has great latitude over how it drafts its bills. Uh, as the member for Cape Breton Centre mentioned, it would be no problem for the government to insert their own amendment, uh, giving them regulation-making power over adding additional cancers. Um, I highly doubt that you would find opposition from fire services to, to this amendment. And further, uh, these are additional cancers that are being added. Uh, the cancers that are recognized now exist in the Act. There's nothing left off of this list. These are additional cancers. This was the list brought to us by Fire Services. So I understand that this won't be passed, but I, I want it to be crystal clear why. Um, certainly, I respect the need for flexibility, um, but I submit that that flexibility could be retained while passing our amendment. Thank you very much. Um, so the amendment is that a new subsection 35A3 be, be, be added. Those in favor? No. Those against? No. no. Okay. Um, the, the clause is defeated. The amendment is defeated. Please bear with us. <laughs> we are now going to subsection 35A3, Clause A. Those in favor of the clause? Opposed? The amendment is carried. No, the clause is carried. 
Okay, so now we are going to go to subsection 35A, 3B. Does it carry? It carries. Shall the remaining portions of subsection 35A carry? Carried. Do the new subsections 35 B and C carry? Carry. 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 They, the, clauses, okay. the clauses are carry. So clauses four and five carry. Do clauses four and five carry? Carry. Does the title carry? Carry. Shall the bill carry? Carry. The bill is carried. I re recognize the government deputy house leader. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. Will you please now call Bill Number 180? I call Bill 180, Fatality Investigations Act. I recognize the clerk. Madam Chair, Bill Number 180 was returned to the House from the Law Amendments Committee <coughs> without amendments and contains five clauses. There are a number of change sheets on uh, this bill and we seek instructions as to whether the NDP change sheets and the government change sheets are to be distributed now or not. Are they to be dis distributed? Yeah. Okay. They can be distributed. So it's going to take this yes.
I would just like to um, make sure everyone has the change sheets. There should be four NDP numbered one, two, three, and four, and there should be one government change sheet. I'm also going to ask that we keep the noise level down. This is a complicated um, section we're going into, and for the concentration of the clerks and myself, we need cooperation from all of you so that we, we can get this all done. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Shall Clause 1 carry? I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is the first of uh, some amendments that we will be bringing forward on this bill. Uh, I will move the amendment, which is uh, at, on NDP dash, CWHB NDP-1, uh, page 1, sub clause 1, sub 1, proposed clause 2, sub 1, CA, lines 3 and 4. Delete or the Child Death Review Committee established under Section 39D and substitute the Child Death Review Committee established under Section 39D or the Adult Death in Custody Review Committee established under Section 39E. Page 1, sub clause 1, sub 2, proposed clause 2, sub 1, DA, line 2, delete 39D and substitute 39D or E. Um, Madam Chair, uh, this is the first of four amendments we'll be introducing. Uh, we've shared these uh, some time ago with the Minister of Justice. Uh, we uh, in the NDP caucus have been speaking uh, for years now about the mystery that surrounds deaths in custody um, and looking for solutions, particularly answers for families, uh, for the circumstances uh, that arise uh, when uh, an inmate dies in custody for a number of reasons many very valid, it's extraordinarily difficult to find information about what happens. There's a case before the courts right now uh, regarding something of that nature. Uh, so this amendment addresses the call made by families and friends for public, transparent, independent inquiries into all deaths in custody. Uh, we don't op open up legislation very often. Uh, so. Our, our thought in bringing this amendment is that while we applaud the government for this piece of legislation in general, we'll be moving a number of amendments to try to strengthen it. It's a good move though, uh, and this uh, would make it a much better move. If we're talking about youth who have died in care, if we're talking about um, people who are victims of intimate partner violence, uh, it stands to reason that we would include uh, this category of people who are in the direct care uh, of a government facility. Uh, Dr. John Butt, the former medical examiner for Nova Scotia and Alberta, has called for Nova Scotia to create mandatory inquests into non-natural deaths in prisons. Uh, we have a responsibility to the families of those individuals to address both the individual circumstances and the systemic failures that contribute to deaths of individuals in custody. So, Madam Chair, I hope uh, that the government will consider supporting this amendment, uh, which will uh, bring a measure, measure of close, closure, clarity, and also data. One of the things we like about this bill is that it has trend analysis. Uh, we've asked many questions on the floor of this legislature around data pertaining to people uh, in the custody of the province. Um, this would be one way that that data becomes automatically available and that we can learn from it. So with those few words, I'll take my seat and I will urge my government colleagues to vote for this amendment. I recognize the honorable member for Cumberland South. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be very brief, but uh, one of the bonuses is we did get these amendments at Law, committee, at Law Amendments Committee, and uh, although they didn't pass, it, it, it gives an, an opportunity to take time and review this, and I just wanted to stand here for the record that uh, the PC Caucus will be supporting this amendment. Okay. Um, does the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Does the clause carry? Carry. Shall Clause 2 carry? Carry. Shall Clause 3 carry? Carry. Clause 
Clause 3 has several new sections, which we will have to break up into subsections and we will have to go one by one. So please be patient and let's keep the noise level as, as quiet as possible. I rec Does 39A sub A carry? I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. So, uh, Madam Chair, I, uh, in the normal course of things, we could move forward and not um, speak about the rest of change sheet NDP-1, uh, but I will move this amendment um, just to be clear. Uh, what it is we're asking for and maybe to give the government an opportunity to let us know if not here what plans they have um, for letting us uh, have access to this kind of information. So I'll move the amendment found on NDP-1, page 2, clause 3, add the following after 39A sub A. B, death in custody means the death of a person 19 years of age or older that has occurred while the person was, one, detained or in custody in a correctional institution such as a jail, penitentiary, guard room, remand centre, detention centre, lockup, or any other place where an adult is in custody or detention, two, an inmate in a hospital or facility as defined in the Hospitals Act, three, an involuntary patient within the meaning of involuntary psychiatric treatment act, or four, an involuntary resident in a healthcare facility. Page two, clause three, proposed section 39A, renumber proposed clauses B to D, as C to E, and change cross-references accordingly. Um, I, I will only speak briefly. I've made the bulk of my uh, comment, substantive comments on this uh, just previously, but, but I will say that as you look at clauses one through four uh, in our suggested amendment, um, there, I can think of a situation for each of those circumstances that we have debated on the floor of this legislature, unfortunately, Madam Chair. Uh, we come asking questions about people who die uh, in correctional facilities asking questions about people who die in uh, the East Coast Forensic Hospital, asking questions who die, who, about people who are um, in all kinds of, of this type of custody and remand that we discuss. And, and quite frankly, Madam Chair, uh, uh, someone in a correctional facility is, um, is a less... Uh, sort of poster-worthy person to be discussing in terms of finding the information, but they're no less of a human being. And to the extent that we decide that for the cases of care or the cases of public safety or whatever, for whatever reason we decide that we need to detain people or hold people, uh, while we are doing that, they are in our care. And if someone dies a non-natural death in our care, uh, both we and the families deserve to know and understand why, both to receive closure, but also to ensure that it doesn't happen again. So again, I look forward to the comments of my government colleagues on this amendment, and I urge you to pass it. Thank you. Does the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Does... Do subsections 39B, A, B to D carry? Do sections 39B to D carry? I recognize the honorable member for Dartmouth South. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll draw the member's attention uh, for the last time to NDP de uh, 1, change sheet 1, page 4, clause 3, add the following after section 39D, 39E sub 1. There is hereby established an adult death in custody review committee for the purpose of A, reviewing the facts and circumstances relating to deaths in custody, B, providing advice and recommendations to the minister regarding the prevention and reduction of deaths in custody, and C, performing other duties and functions as prescribed by the regulations. Pages 4 and 5, Clause 3, renumber proposed sections 39E to 39K as 39F to 39L and change cross-references accordingly. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I'll simply say that 
These uh, amendments were brought forward to us by a number of advocates um, who really uh, serve as the only uh, voices uh, for people um, for whom uh, who really don't have a voice and who are often uh, most people would rather forget. Um, I'll remind everyone that we have an enormously high number of people on remand in our correctional facilities, people who have not been convicted of any crime but are awaiting trial. Um, it's not fair to call these people convicts, as they often are. Um, we here in Nova Scotia, this doesn't even need to be said, but I will say it, people are innocent until proven guilty. And when any one of those people die in the custody of this province, we should be able to understand why. Um, this has been brought forward by people like East Coast Prison Justice Society, the Elizabeth Fry Society, the Coverdale Court Work Society, amazing, uh, small, resilient, bootstrappy organizations uh, that are doing an incredible uh, piece of work and advocacy. So uh, I again urge the government to pass this amendment um, and just let my respect go out uh, to those folks who are pushing for these changes. Thank you. Does the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Does the new section 39D E carry? I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I will draw the member's attention to change sheet NDP-3. Um, this was another, uh, well, I'll move the amendment. So, um, page four, clause three, add the following after section 39E, 39F, sub one. In this section, adjudicator means an adjudicator appointed pursuant to sub, subsection two. Two, the minister shall appoint one or more persons to be adjudicators for a committee. Three, an adjudicator appointed pursuant to subsection two must not be an employee of the Department of Justice. Four, an adjudicator may hold hearings with respect to a death review for the purpose of collecting evidence to identify what caused or contributed to the death under review. Five, an adjudicator may admit any evidence the adjudicator considers relevant to the subject of the hearings. Uh, pages four and five, clause three, renumber proposed sections 39F to 39K as 39G to 39L, and change cross-references accordingly. Um, this speaks to the power um, of the proposed uh, death review committees as they currently exist in the Act. Um, we have often been in the position as the opposition uh, asking a question uh, about something tragic that has occurred, be it a death or something else, and we're often told we take that very seriously, there's an internal investigation going on. Um, and then when we try to find out what that internal investigation is, we often get nowhere. Um, when we FOIA pop it, we get blank documents. There may be good privacy reasons for that, um, but the reality is we have no idea what these committees look like or what power they have unless they're imbued with statutory powers. Um, and that's what this amendment attempts to do. So by saying that we would be able to, that, that the minister would be re required to appoint an independent adjudicator who is not an employee of the Department of Justice, and that that adjudicator may admit evidence that they consider relevant, it means that these committees have teeth, so to speak, that they can actually do a proper investigation, uh, that they have the powers at their disposal uh, to discover what they need to in order to get the answers um, to what will, in every single case, be a very sensitive matter, um, and that we have confidence um, that, that, that they work and that they're uh, worth their time and that they're not influenced in any way by a desired outcome either from government or from any other uh, body that could interfere. I think the independence is very important. So that is why we are moving this amendment and I would urge uh, the government and our colleagues to support us. Thank you. Oh, I recognize the honorable member for Queen's Shelburne. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in theory, having an independent adjudicator sitting on these committees could be advantageous. They could bring knowledge and experience that could assist the process. But how much teeth would the adjudicator have if they can't get all the information that they need? Meaning it would become like a quasi-judicial committee wherein it is at the sole discretion of the adjudicator to determine what evidence to hear. We should be hesitant in extending powers that would typically only belong to the court to random individuals who are appointed by the minister. The whole purpose of the court system is that it is independent and is governed by the rule of law, with strict rules of court as well as centuries of precedent. We're not in favor of giving the power to a random individual who does not have to have any particular qualifications, the power to compel evidence. Thank you, Madam Chair. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, we've heard a lot about adjudicators being random individuals uh, in the last week, um, and with all due respect, I disagree with that characterization. I think we use adjudicators in all different ways. Um, they are a quasi, that would be a quasi-judicial proceeding. That is what we are suggesting. This is used administratively in every area of our justice system. Um, to uh, quite a positive effect. So I just wanted to speak to that. Um, I would agree that the appointing a random individual would not probably be a great idea, but I think appointing a skilled adjudicator uh, is what we are suggesting in this amendment. Thank you. Shall the, does the amendment carry? No. It's, the amendment is defeated. Does Section 39 F carry. Does subsection 39 G 1 A carry? Do subsections 39G 1B to 39G 3 carry? I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Okay, does 39G 4 carry? I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I can assure the House that we proposed these amendments in a way that seemed really straightforward, <laughs> um, but, but when, it, when it comes to parsing the bill in order to put them forward, it gets a little complicated, so I thank everyone for their patience. I'll draw the members' attention to CWHB NDP-2, um, page 4, clause 3, proposed section 39G, delete subsection 4 and substitute the following subsection. Uh, four, a committee shall make the report publicly available within a reasonable amount of time following the submission of the report to the minister. Um, so this is about transparency, this is about accountability, um, and this is about knowing what recommendations have been made and how they have or have not been acted upon. <laughs> Um, the minister has cited the right um, to privacy of the families uh, as the kind of primary reason for not making these reports public. However, I would suggest that there is a way to balance those concerns. Um, I think, as I spoke to earlier, uh, all we know from this act, the way it's drafted, is that somehow, somewhere, a committee like this will happen, and presumably government will hear about it, but we won't hear about it, Madam Chair. We won't have any idea what happened. We won't know what lessons are learned. We won't know what trends were discerned. Um, 
And so we feel uh, that it's very important in the name of transparency and accountability, since this is the most transparent government by their own admission that we've ever had, um, that we could uh, have some transparency uh, in this regard and that we would be able to have access to the findings of these committees. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Okay. Does the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Does subsection 39 G4 carry? Does 39 G5 carry? Does 30? Okay. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Madam Chair. I draw the member's attention to CWHB NDP-2, page 4, clause 3, add the following after section 39G. 39H sub 1. The Minister shall annually prepare a report on the actions and findings of the committees during the preceding fiscal year and make that report publicly available. Sub 2. The report must include any actions the government has taken during the preceding fiscal year in response to the findings or recommendations of a committee. Sub 3. The Minister shall table the report in the House of Assembly within 15 days after it is completed or where the assembly is not then sitting, file it with the clerk of the assembly. Pages four and five, clause three, renumber proposed sections 39H to 39K, 39I to 39L, and change cross-references accordingly. Uh, again, Madam Chair, I'll just briefly uh, speak to the kind of meat of this proposal, uh, which is that uh, we would, as legislators, uh, understand what it is that the government learns uh, from these committees, uh, what steps the government takes, uh, as both as MLAs here in the legislature, but as MLAs in our own constituencies and as critics for various areas, um, we get questions all the time. Um, and as opposition members, we rarely have access to the answers that we need. Um, and it's not just those of us in this House that need answers, but it's the public, um, Madam Chair. And so, again, in the name of transparency and effectiveness, um, I would urge the government uh, and our colleagues to support this motion. Thank you. Does the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Okay. <clears throat> Shall subsection 39H 1A carry? Recognize I recognize the Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, the following amendments are a result of uh, correspondence received um, through the Acting uh, Privacy uh, and Information Officer. The amendments uh, at page 5, clause 3, proposed clause 39H, sub 1, sub A, line 2, add a municipality as defined in part 20 of the Municipal Government Act after Act. Okay, no, and that's, so you have to just speak to that now. The because you have to do them as two separate. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, in review of the proposed uh, bill, uh, Madam Chair, it uh, was brought to our attention uh, through the FOIPOP officer that uh, municipalities had not been captured uh, under the bill, and this amendment uh, includes municipalities. Does anyone want to speak to that? No? Does the amendment carry. carry. The amendment is carry. So 
does the subsection 39, page 1A, as amended carry? Does subsection 39, H, 1A, as, as amended. amended carry? Carry. Okay. carry. The amendment is carried. No, the clause is a portion of the clause is carried. Exactly. So now, 39H1B. Yeah. To 39H4. Okay. Shall subsection 39H1B to 39H4 carry? Okay, H5. Okay. Shall subsection 39H5 carry? I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Madam Chair. I draw the member's attention to CWHB NDP dash four. Um, we move the amendment that at page five, clause three, proposed section 39H, delete subsection five. Um, Members will be upset to know this is our last amendment. Um, the, the, the minister mentioned in the last amendment, which we supported, that the municipal governments were, were left out. Um, but there are bigger issues with this section, um, and this has to do with the fact that the Act is exempted um, from our privacy legislation. The Acting Information and Privacy Commissioner uh, has written to the Minister and to the Law Amendments Committee to express grave concerns about the bill as it's written. Uh, and the Commissioner writes that continuing to propose bills that remove the applicability of FOIPOP undermines the intent and effectiveness of the quasi-constitutional status of the privacy and transparency framework set out in FOIPOP. The result is an unnavigable Swiss cheese foundation, unable to protect these fundamentals of democracy. Madam Chair, FOIPOP is the source of a public body's legal obligation to protect the personal information it holds. It also provides a framework for withholding sensitive personal information from the public, which I believe has been the reasoning given for why uh, this clause exists in the Act, but by removing the applicability of FOIPOP, all of this is lost. Uh, again, Madam Chair, we are asking for transparency, uh, we're asking for effectiveness, and we're asking the government to not once again sidestep the, free the Office of, the, of Freedom and Information and Privacy Commissioner. Um, that office is an important office. It exists to play an important role. It, has, it couldn't be more direct on its feedback on this bill. And this is what the acting commissioner does. This is her specialty. Um, and so to hear again and again from the government that, for, that they have just decided not to listen to this sort of quasi-constitutional role around the freedom of information and protecting of privacy uh, is frankly uh, quite disappointing. I think, again, it will limit the effectiveness um, of these committees. Uh, there was some question, I think, about liability that the minister mentioned that he was concerned that people who um, participate in the death committees could be held liable for what they say there. But, but frankly, Madam Chair, if someone is participating in a committee as a professional, if they're going to give advice about why someone died or the cause of death or how someone was treated or how social services worked, then why shouldn't they, they uh, have to stand behind that professional opinion? We have to do that when we appear in court, for people who appear in court, if you testify as an expert. There, that's not an unreasonable request, Madam Chair. Uh, and so again, it's very disappointing that we have an act from this very transparent, um, by their own admission, government that completely exempts everything that happens from the FOIPOP legislation. Thank you, Madam Chair. I recognize the Honourable Member for Queen's-Shelburne. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Our caucus has uh, serious concerns with the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner not being consulted on this bill. The Freedom of Information and Protection of Property Act and the Personal Health Information Act do not apply to committees or to death review information. It prohibits a committee from disclosing certain information, but the privacy framework and safeguards contained in Floyd Park are entirely removed. Uh, as my colleague has stated, the Commissioner has submitted her concerns to law amendments where she outlined the continuation of proposing bills that remove the applicability of FOIPOP undermines the intent and effectiveness of the quasi-constitutional status of the privacy and transparency framework set out in FOIPOP. And the Commissioner urged the government to remove Section 39H5. Uh, our caucus will be supporting uh, the NDP's amendment put forth. Does the amendment carry? Oh. The amendment is defeated. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, this amendment uh, as well goes back to the correspondence from the FOIPOP officer who identified that uh, municipalities were not included. Um, and it was important that they are, so we have full participation, uh, Madam Chair, from municipalities and their employees. Page 5, Clause 3, Proposed Subsection 39H Sub 5, Line 1, Add, Part 20 of the Municipal Government Act, After Act. Does the amendment carry? Carry. The amendment is carried. Does subsection 39H5 as amended carry? Carry. Do subsections 39I to K carry? Carry. Do the remaining clauses carry? Carry. Shall the bill carry? Carry. Title carry. Shall the title carry? Carry. Shall the bill. Oh. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and I'd like to speak uh, for a few minutes on the title of this bill, an act to amend the Fatality Investigations Act. Uh, our caucus is broadly supportive of the establishment of these death review committees, although, of course, we would have liked to have seen this bill strengthened uh, by the amendments we proposed. Um, but more particularly, I, I am worried that the establishment of a child death review committee may uh, make it seem like the need for an arm's length child and youth advocate office is eliminated in this province, but that is simply not the case. And I want to I, I uh, talk about that for a minute. Our caucus has uh, called on the government to establish a Nova Scotia child and youth advocate office with a legislated mandate to conduct systemic policy review and advocacy in addition to taking on reviews of specific cases. Uh, and some of those would be unfortunately death-related cases, but some of them would be other types of, um, of cases that must be looked into uh, when it comes to the care of children. Uh, the, these kinds of offices exist in uh, the mandates established by the legislation in New Brunswick, uh, Manitoba, Ontario, British Columbia, and Newfoundland and Labrador. And it's really important to note that this type of office um, must be an office that reports to the legislature and not the minister, and that's an essential part of how a child and youth advocate office would work. In their 2018 budget submission, the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers called for the creation of a child and youth advocate office for the province, and specifically they recommended that the Executive Council proclaim a mandate for a child and youth advocate to ensure that children and youth rights are respected, valued, and that their interest and voice regarding services delivered by the provincial government are heard. In addition, the mandate would include public education, conflict resolution, conducting independent reviews, and making recommendations to government on programs and services delivered to children and youth. And given the growing concerns about the ability of government departments and agencies to adequately meet the complex needs of children, and the relatively small investment that it would, it would be required to establish an office of a child and youth advocate, it makes sense to have an independent body focused on this very vulnerable population. Uh, 
Madam, Madam Chair, I also just want to um, make a note about the, the bill in general, the title in, in general, um, and that is that I do believe that the amendments that were proposed today uh, would have deeply strengthened the bill. And when we are in uh, this committee of the whole House, um, I find it, I find increasingly as we go through these processes, which are, in my opinion, this process of Committee of the Whole House is actually one of the more dynamic processes that we have in this legislature because we can get up and go back and forth and it's actually, a, it can be a debate like we saw with the firefighters with the uh, Workers' Compensation Act. It's very invigorating and dynamic to, hear, to go back and forth on, on an idea. Um, but. At this juncture, I feel an increasing sense of hopelessness about the process of passing bills in this legislature. I, I won't pretend to know why the government will refuse to engage on the suggestion of amendments. I won't pretend to know if it's if it's simply that they that the that the people who have written this bill or the minister uh, has a better idea or is firmly uh, committed to to what has been laid forward uh, in the in the act. Um, why the government refuses in the moment to, to collaborate. Um, but here's the thing, the government also is refusing to afford the work of extremely intelligent people. My colleague from Dartmouth South, one of them, by the way, and I think we've all witnessed in this house many times the way she can walk around amendments in, in pieces of legislation. But also the people who have brought these amendments to us, the people who are working uh, with vulnerable populations in uh, provincial care facilities on a daily basis and who know from the ground that these amendments are required to make this bill actually have some tea. So I, I won't pretend to understand any of that, but I will say that it is deeply disappointing. And time and again, this government has asked this House to be collaborative, for everybody to work together on legislation that makes this province a better place to live. And time and again, we have been proposing real, meaningful uh, uh, amendments or suggestions that would actually do just that, just that thing that we're being required to do, and every time we are voted down and vocally voted down and rejected. So I just want to register that disappointment. I'm not trying to, I'm not going to take my toys and go home. I'm not doing that. I will continue to stand here and be a voice for the people that we represent, but I want to register that uh, and hope that one day, somehow, maybe Maybe it's you know not in this house. Maybe it's casually you know in a conversation. But we find out why it is that this government refuses to collaborate. Thank you. Shall the title carry? carry. Shall the bill carry? carry? The bill is carried. I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. Would you please call Bill Number 213, Sustainable Development Goals Act. I call Bill 213, the Sustainable Development Goals Act. I recognize the Clerk. Madam Chair, Bill Number 213 was referred from the Committee on Law Amendments to the House without amendments and contains 16 clauses. And we have a number of change sheets uh, for the opposition parties and would like to instructions as to whether we distribute all of the change sheets at this time. Sure. Yes. And, and the PC? Okay.
I would just like members to make sure that they have all their change sheets. They, there should be eight for the NDP, but we are only going to be doing two through seven. So make sure you have two through, two through eight, okay, and one PC. Everyone have? We're not doing NDP one. We're doing two through eight. You do not have number two. We have it? Okay, some members didn't, okay. Again, we have a lot to get through for this bill and it's a bit complicated, so I ask that the chatter in the chamber, it did get a little noisy there, I know it's hard, but we really have to get through this, and it's very challenging for the clerks and I to, to see who's standing up and who's, who's saying what and getting direction for each other. Shall clause, Shall clause one carry. I recognize the honorable member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I appreciate you um, endeavoring to carry out this challenging process um, for this very important act. Um, I wanted to speak on the short title of the act, um, essentially to, uh, to register some of the things on which we are not 
bringing forward amendments. And uh, that includes um, a number of a very important um, files related to forestry uh, and related to the role of, of uh, Nova Scotia's forests in um, regulating our climate, uh, sequestering, uh, sequestering uh, carbon, and, uh, and protecting uh, or providing, I guess, the environment where um, biodiversity may flourish. Um, we are not bringing forward amendments related to those um, particular questions that are very interrelated with this legislation because we recognize that there um, is work that has been done uh, and where we expect to see, um, where, where we will be remaining attentive to see um, how the government uh, carries out that work. So, for example, um, it is important to us, and we think it's important to, to mention this at this moment, that the government fully carry out the, the, the recommendations of the Leahy report um, on forestry, on forest practices. Um, and likewise, uh, you know, we want to acknowledge, as it was acknowledged indeed uh, yesterday at law amendments, um, that 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 report was not even the first report on uh, trying to strike the right balance in our <laughs> land use um, across Nova Scotia. So um, I think it's important for us to register with some people who have corresponded with us who, who care very much about, about climate change and are very aware of the impact of land use changes and of uh, forestry practices and agricultural practices on uh, either the sequestering or the release of, of carbon into the atmosphere, um, that, that we also recognize uh, the importance of those sectors. And while we're not addressing that by uh, proposing amendments specific to that uh, at this moment, uh, we are uh, attentive and will remain attentive as the government per pursues um, its its uh, agenda uh, through through other means. So thank you very much. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Sackville Beaver Bank. Uh, uh, yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, just uh, confirming. So. Uh, Currently, I, I uh, would move or I would direct members to look at uh, CWHB PC1, uh, which would be a amendment to the bill on page one, clause one, to add, quote, environment and immediately after the. And uh, if I can, Madam Speaker, uh, very quickly to speak on this, uh, I did uh, raise this yesterday during uh, committee and uh, during the law amendments committee and did try to have this uh, added on. I see this as a, uh, as a very minimum uh, amendment and certainly not substantive to the bill whatsoever, um, other than the fact that it does highlight the, uh, the need and the, uh, the importance that environment also plays in this. And uh, I do re recognize that uh, the actual title of the bill it is reflected, but uh, in this particular case, whenever uh, the bill being cited for, uh, we do feel that it's important to highlight uh, the importance of environment as well. So we bring this forward at this time. I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Madam Chair, and the NDP caucus would concur with the PC. In fact, we endeavoured to uh, bring that amendment forward as well, um, because the change, just adding the name or uh, adding the word environment, signals the central intention of this of this uh, bill. And EGSPA was the. Nova Scotia's flagship, and we need to ensure that uh, the responsibility of that continues. And um, you know, this is a minor addition that I would hope wouldn't cause um, uh, anybody to vote against this. 
I recognize the Honourable Member for Inverness. Madam Chair, I would also like to speak in support of this motion by my colleague. Um, if I may quote the Minister quoting myself. <laughs> Go what, ahead. what a narcissist I am. I'm quoting somebody <laughs> quoting me. <laughs> uh, but as, as the minister had, had quoted uh, myself the other uh, last night, I guess it was, or, um, you know, the environment is too big of an issue to, uh, to have politics influence it. Now, I know that might sound kind of funny to say politics is involved in everything, but I think with the name of this bill, uh, it was it was agreed unanimously when when legislation pertaining to uh, the environmental goals and sustainable uh, prosperity act was was introduced back in 2000 and uh, 2007. Um, there was agreement by everybody, and today we still see agreement in here. If, if this is legislation is going to be essentially updated, why not keep it along that same train of thinking with those words that described the bill so aptly at that time? So. Um, I think the government should uh, accept this amendment um, and uh, if for no other reason, Madam Chair, to, uh, to ensure that uh, we're all still showing unison in the legislature behind this idea that was brought forward back in 2007 and that the government won't use this as an opportunity to play politics and say, you know, well, that's some old piece of legislation that's out of date and, and, and is no longer relevant. Because essentially what this bill, as I understand, is to update that legislation. Thank you. Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall clause one carry? Shall clause two carry? I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I draw your attention to CWHP HB NDP 2, uh, page 1, clause 2, A, add the following subclause, B, climate justice, means the understanding that the urgent action needed to prevent climate change must be based on a just transition emerging from community-led solutions and the well-being of local communities, Indigenous communities, African Nova Scotian communities, and marginalized communities, and that the people with the greatest ability to address the climate crisis have the greatest responsibility to address it. And B, re-letter paragraphs B to H and C to I. Um, in this chamber, uh, I think, uh, all members um, have learned of the, the title and the concept of environmental racism. Um, really, I think across Nova Scotia, uh, we owe a, a, a debt to uh, Professor Ingrid Waldron at uh, Dalhousie, who has done so much work to research and document um, the many cases of environmental uh, racism that uh, Nova Scotians have experienced, and and particularly particularly African Nova Scotians um, and uh, and Mi'kmaq people, and and at this moment, as many of us um, are concerned about the environment and about climate, uh, it's important that this. Uh, in this section where the sort of the broad framing of our action to address the climate crisis is is set out um, that climate justice be be part of that um, climate justice is a widely accepted principle that expresses the need for equity and for a just transition to be central in tackling the climate crisis um, and and so this should be one of the um, guiding maxims for this legislation. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Sackville Beaver Bay. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, uh, I, uh, I want to start by saying that uh, it's unfortunate. I know some of these uh, 
These amendments come forward on the floor uh, when we walk in here, uh, as did these eight that are before us from the NDP party. Um, it's unfortunate that our, our caucus didn't have an opportunity ahead of time to see some of these because I think that, uh, that there, there are certainly, and particularly with, uh, with the amendment that's before us now, there are certainly parts of this that we could uh, probably have come up and supported. Um, you know, we, we certainly recognize, uh, and, and I personally recognize, uh, that environmental racism is a real thing. I was a uh, councillor representing a uh, African Nova Scotian community for eight years. My uh, assistant is an African Nova Scotian uh, gentleman. I represented an area for 16 years um, that was a lower co income area and was impacted by a landfill uh, in Upper Sac that uh, many felt went there because it because of the economics of uh, that community so I certainly am by no means a denier of environmental racism although uh, I, and I, I've had some very in-depth and interesting conversations with people over the years about that it is a real thing and that it does exist um, so so I think that from from a caucus perspective we certainly recognize the need for climate justice and all that part but however, Madam Speaker, the real, the real hang up for me here is, is our caucus has not had an opportunity uh, to address and to talk about the last line, which is that the people with greatest ability to address climate change have the greatest responsibility to address it. And, and I'm not saying that we don't support that concept. What I'm saying is we have not had an opportunity to talk about that or the implications that might that might have. And based on the inability to have that discussion at our caucus, we can't support this motion at this time. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and the member uh, for Sackville Beaverbank brings up a really important point. Um, we have discussed, actually, even among the House leaders this session, bringing, making sure everyone can see amendments in advance. Um, but this uh, is kind of a sad function of bringing in big, huge pieces of legislation at the very end of a session mm -hmm. and then calling them day after day after day. Uh, we know that we were at law amendments uh, late into the night and then we, between then and now, came up with the eight amendments that we best thought encapsulated what all those dozens and dozens of comments that we heard from law amendments, Madam Chair. Um, and so we are certainly sympathetic to the fact that our colleagues have not seen these amendments. Um, our government colleagues have not seen the, these amendments. We wish that we would have had an opportunity to provide these to the minister, um, to send them back into the department, to look at them, to consider them. Um, but quite frankly, Madam Chair, we're hamstrung by this process uh, where we're steamrolling through legislation at the end of a session, uh, and we just don't have the time. So, uh, so I uh, would join in the comments of my colleague uh, from Sackville Beaver Bank and say, gee, wouldn't it be great if we actually had a you know a few more days to debate a bill and actually prepare a speech and actually share amendments and uh, you know be able to do our jobs in the way that I think our constituents all uh, expect us to do. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, and, and I, um, I really appreciate um, the comments from our, our colleague from uh, Sackville Beaver Bank. Um, and I just wanted to address the point that, that gave him pause, because it, it is a challenging thing to, um, to wrap one's head around, that um, for this very precious earth where we live, um, to continue to be a, a habitable planet, and it is currently the only habitable planet that we know of in the universe, um, that we cannot um, overspend our carbon budget. And, and that scientists have actually been able to calculate what the, what the capacity of our atmosphere is to hold uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and you know, uh, I think some people um, have gotten to uh, a level of comfort with the the concept or the the measure of parts per million. You know, the 350 uh, parts per million of carbon um, in the atmosphere uh, 
is, is, is what the pre-industrial level was, or maybe the level where it was, it was still okay. And, and we blew past that at some point um, around my birth maybe, and now we're up over 400. And that is why we are actually warming and that then the warning, warming causes all the other, um, all the other impacts of climate change. Um, but another measure that I am still kind of coming to grips with, like in an intellectual, visual, visualizing kind of kind of fashion, is this idea of a carbon budget, which is made up of of gigatons of carbon that we have emitted through our activities on this planet, and. Um, scientists, you know, have been able to calculate that the, 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 the total carbon budget for our planet to remain, remain habitable um, is uh, 2,900 gigatons. And we have already emitted 2,100 gigatons through human activity on this planet. And and so there's 800 gigatons left. And some societies, some countries, some families, certainly, um, you know, the, the not that many billionaires on this planet are responsible for vastly more um, gigatons of carbon already up in the atmosphere and some of it down in our warming oceans than other people who have never had the opportunity to in any way um, put a burden on our planet um, in order to, uh, you know, benefit from the energy that, that comes through emitting, emitting carbon. And, and now, so now some people are, are going to be asked to never, um, to never get any part of that budget. And what we know in Nova Scotia, um, and you know, Nova Scotia is just a little place, but, but we can look around our own uh, province, and, and particularly we can look to the history of our province and see that um, from our from from the earliest days of of settlement in Nova Scotia, um, the the people who were placing burdens and who were emitting carbon and were um, you know placing pressure on uh, the ecological carrying capacity of this beautiful place um, were disproportionately settlers. Um, and, and were disproportionately settlers who were not people of color. And, and, and of course, that's only one of the ways that we can you know, gauge um, the, the, and judge and, and, and tally the impact of environmental racism. Anyhow, so I just wanted to speak to that because I, I understand that it is something to wrap one's head around and I'm wrapping my head around it, but I think we all actually have to wrap our heads around it as difficult as that may be. Thank you. I recognize the honorable member for Sackville Beaver Bay. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And just to, uh, to uh, follow up on some of the points there, um, I do feel that uh, unfortunately, the, the current system that we're here in today, um, whether it be this government or, or another government, the only way to create the best legislation, in my opinion, uh, that, that is for the best of Nova Scotians is to work together. We're not provided that opportunity right now, and therefore, unfortunately, uh, we don't always get the best legislation, example being. Um, however, having said that, I certainly give kudos to the NDP for bringing forward uh, on such a short notice the, the number of amendments that they are bringing forward. And, and like I said, I, I, 
I know what my personal views are. Um, personally, I, I, I guess uh, the uh, leader of the Nova Scotia Progressive Conservative Party has put me in, into the critic of environment role for a reason, and I certainly do support many of, of what, uh, much of what was said previously. However, not having that opportunity to discuss this with our caucus, uh, we just can't support this at this time. So thank you very much, Madam. I recognize the Honourable Member for Sackville Cobbequid. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my colleague from Sackville Beaverbank speaks absolutely correctly. We haven't had a chance to discuss this with caucus, and certainly around the caucus table, I'd be absolutely be in support of this amendment. No question about that. Which leads me to an observation that I've had since uh, joining this legislature, and that is the process around which we are able to, in advance, you need to speak to the clause. Need to be, speak to the clause? The amendment. Oh, I see. Okay. So when can I speak to the process? Uh, that's during the title. Okay. Thank you. We did that. There's a later one at the end. There's another title that you can speak. Okay. Anyone else? Shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall clause 2 carry? Shall clauses three through five carry? Shall, oh, I recognize the, shall clause six carry? I recognize the honorable member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is a second opportunity to inject um, climate justice and, and you know that important consideration into, uh, into this bill. Um, Clause 6 speaks to the goals and initiatives um, uh, that are to be pursued through this legislation. Um, it, it reads, goals and initiatives established under this act and regulations must align with the following focus areas. And I, I move that we add the following subclause, F, the achievement of climate justice, and B, re-letter paragraphs F and G as G and H. Um, so currently there's a list of, um, of focus areas uh, which the regulations must um, be in alignment with and one, of, one that is missing is the achievement of climate justice. I've already spoken to why that is important and I, I hope that um, our colleagues in the official opposition and government members will consider um, that this would be an excellent place to inject it. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Sackville Beaver Bay. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam uh, Chair. Just for clarification, so this would be page two, clause six? Yes. Um, so for previously stated, uh, previously stated points, we can't support this one at this time either. Onion. Shall cause shall the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall clause six carry? Carry. Shall clause seven carry? Carry. I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Shabucto. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, I'm afraid that uh, last evening here I I must have made a a bad mistake. I, uh, I got up and uh, uh, spoke favorably about a piece of liberal legislation and, and everything went dark. <laughs> so so I, I, went, I went home and explained this to my family and they, they said, well, this is easily fixed. Just don't ever make that mistake again. <laughs> so I don't. So, uh, so in, in that vein, I, I want to... Uh, <laughs> Turn to uh, CWHB NDP 3 um, and speak to the uh, an amendment of page 2, paragraph 7, parentheses B, uh, delete 53% below the levels that were emitted in 2005 and substitute 58% below the levels that were emitted in 2005 or 9.8% megatons. Now, in this 
7B clause, uh, if this piece of legislation has a heart, uh, this is probably it. This is the, the real old epicenter of the matter. Uh, and so when you're dealing with the, the core and the epicenter of the matter, you, you, you need to be clear about what is the main question that needs to be asked about this thing. Well, that's what's in front of us here. What is the, the main question that needs to be asked of 7B? Uh, by 2030, at least 53% below the levels that were emitted in 2005. Now, I think uh, there, are, there are some people who think uh, the question that needs to be asked of this clause is, is this target an improvement over the targets that existed before? And if that were the question that needs to be asked of this, uh, certainly the answer would be yes, and that would conclude the whole matter and conversation. But I, I want to suggest that that is not the right question uh, for us to be directing towards this very important clause. And there might be uh, some people who would say, well, the, this, is the, this is the central clause here, and the, the main question to be directed towards it is, is this a target which is an improvement over the targets of uh, other jurisdictions? Um, and if that were the main question that we were asking of this clause, I think the answer would clearly be yes, and the uh, discussion uh, would be over. But I, I, I want to put before us this evening that that is also uh, not the question that ought to be uh, directed to this uh, pivotal clause uh, in this piece of legislation. And to understand what the question is that we need to direct to this uh, text here, I think we need to go back a year to October 2018 when the UN brought out that uh, defining seminal report on, uh, through the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change on uh, confining global warming to, to within 1.5 degrees of pre-industrial levels. And on that that landmark report, with its thousands of pages and its hundreds of uh, scientific witnesses and, and, and authors, can really be boiled down to one key central thought. And that key central thought of that defining report is this, that the world must make major and dramatic adjustments in the next 11 years in order to avoid the cataclysmic results of global heating beyond 1.5 degrees. This pivotal UN document really defines the moment where we are today. It establishes the whole framework for the the struggle against global warming. It uh, defines and sets out the framework for the climate emergency and the struggle against it in this climate moment. And it defines and puts in front of us the question that must be directed towards this section 7b of this piece of legislation. Because ultimately, there's only one question that it needs to be asked of any proposal for greenhouse gas emission reductions in 2019. And that question is this. Is that proposal, or is that proposal not, consistent with the UN IPCC framework of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees? Greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, which are within this framework, are certainly uh, worthy of our deep support. And greenhouse gas emission uh, reduction targets, which are not within this framework, are deserving of our opprobrium, our rejection, and our resistance. So we, so we turn to the Sustainable De Development Goals Act and, and Act and ask the question, which we heard so many presenters here yesterday at the Law Amendments uh, Committee uh, ask of, of this bill and speak about uh, in a way that was framed by the posing of that question. Is this target consistent 
with 1.5 degrees or is it not? Uh, Madam Chair, here's what I wish to say about this. It is not. A target of 58 percent below 2005 levels is consistent uh, with this imperative. And the legislated target in this bill, as presented at 53 percent, is not. The purpose of the amendment that we are preparing and have put before the House is to replace uh, a target which falls short of the IPCC position uh, with one that meets it. Thank you, Madam Chair. I recognize the Honourable Member for Sackville Beaver Bank. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, uh, in this particular amendment, uh, the PC caucus can uh, can support this amendment, and uh, we hope that the uh, that the governing party does as well. I think that uh, the leader of the NDP certainly spoke uh, probably uh, more eloquently than I will on this. However, uh, we are on the same page. I mean, it it has been shown. Uh, through the uh, IPCC that uh, we do need to reach certain goals. The current target that's laid out here of 53% um, has been shown through uh, both Ecology Action Study as well as others that this will not get us to where we need to be. Um, the uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Special Report did suggest that we try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible, and that uh, this emission, uh, this uh, submission that's before us, will help to do that. There's there's absolutely no negative to getting to those emissions uh, at a quicker rate, and given the. Uh, the uh, presentation at law amendments yesterday, it was showing that at a 53% decrease below the, the 2005 emissions, that we will not hit that target. Um, however, the, uh, the amendment that's before us uh, will get us to the 9.8 millitons. So we do support that. Um, I, I would also offer that uh, the uh, consultants report that uh, the Ecology Action Centre did uh, uh, contract to have done by Gardner Pinfold. It did show that uh, by reaching that uh, those uh, 9.8 me uh, megatons, 58% uh, below, that, that it would actually have a uh, benefit to the Nova Scotia economy of about $9.8 billion would be added to the GDP uh, between now and 2030. So both for, uh, uh, for both of those reasons, we uh, support the amendment that's before us. I recognize... I recognize the Honourable Member for sackville cobequid Thank you, Madam Chair, and as I mentioned earlier, I will make some faux pas <laughs> in the next little while, so thank you for this. I'd like to beg your permission to do an introduction. You may. Thank you very much. So I'd like to draw your attention to the West Gallery. We have newly elected and uh, also sworn in ML, or MLA, <laughs> sworn in, not yet, not, not you, <laughs> Councillor from uh, Lower Sackville, sworn in uh, last week. And uh, Paul Russell. And seated next to him is not a so new fellow, it's an old fellow by the name of David Hensby, councillor and former member of this house. Please join me in welcoming him. Okay. No, no one else speaking? Does the amendment carry? The amendment. Oh. Oh, I recognize the Honourable Minister of Lands and Forestry. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I just uh, wasn't going to say anything, but when I, I hear uh, talk about the targets across the floor, I thought I'd add a few words to the, uh, the debate on this particular amendment. Um, I think it's important to note that, uh, the, for clarification, the IPCC report uh, did say that if all jurisdictions uh, were to get to this level of 53 per cent below uh, 2005 levels by 2030, then indeed we would have an opportunity to keep warming uh, within one and a half degrees. I, I know what the member is referring to, and that is the principle that we should be doing more than some of the other uh, less developed jurisdictions, but I wanted to make sure that was clear. 
Um, but we also do have an opportunity with the, uh, the Act itself to review every five years, and if those uh, targets have to be updated, then, then they can be and should be, and we actually should be surpassing the target that we uh, have set out as we have with other targets set in the past. But I'd also like to, uh, all, uh, I would say, challenge uh, some of the members, particularly in the Conservative Party or progressive, so-called Progressive Conservative Party, uh, when they're talking about uh, getting to a specific target and asking to go further, that they explain how they intend to get there. Because when we brought in a uh, carbon pricing system here about a year ago, uh, over a year ago, we actually had a plan in place to drive emissions down further, which wasn't supported by, I don't think, either party opposite, but uh, I continuously hear in question period uh, when uh, the Progressive Conservatives ask questions about carbon tax, which doesn't exist here, but we do have a cap and trade system here that allows us to complement an already uh, hard cap in our electricity sector, which is an implicit carbon pricing system we have in regulations, which allows us to drive down our rates, and that is one of the main reasons why we've been able to drive down our uh, GHG emissions in, in, the, uh, in the province. But that only encapsulates 45% of our overall emissions. With our cap and trade system, it allows us to cover about 80% 80, 80 of our emissions. And uh, business as usual without, those, uh, without that system gets us to about 45% by 2030. So this is a stretch target and one of the mechanisms we'll be able to get there is through the cap and trade system that complements the other implicit carbon pricing system. And if you look at what the experts say, and we've talked about the UN, the IPCC uh, um, Commission and the IMF, all these uh, organizations have said you don't have a carbon uh, plan without any kind of carbon pricing plan. That is the most cost-effective uh, way to drive down emissions. It is the most effective way to draw down emissions, and that's why uh, numerous all progressive jurisdictions across uh, North America and indeed the world have been uh, implementing different uh, systems that uh, work well for their jurisdiction. Ours is based uh, with uh, help with the Western Climate Initiative. Uh, that's an organization that's known as being one of the most progressive uh, systems in, uh, in the world, and we modeled our system off that. We now are a board member of that uh, organization in California. I know the president is taking them on in a lawsuit for trading with Quebec, but it is known as a credible system, and we have opportunities if we want to up auctions to increase that uh, carbon pricing, then we have that opportunity. But I just wanted to make the point that uh, the experts have said uh, many economists who have, from Sweden that have won the, the Nobel Prize, the Ecofiscal Commission, I could go on and on, they've all agreed that you don't have a plan without some type of carbon price. And so I just ask members to have some kind of courage in, in saying, like, it's easy to say a target, you could say whatever number you want, but at some point in time you have to start listening to the science and start listening to the most effective ways to drive down emissions that has happened across jurisdictions. We're going to continue to do that. We have more opportunities because we have courage to say so. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth. I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth South. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to. Um Thank the member uh, for Timberley Prospect for joining the debate today. <laughs> uh, it's always refreshing when we hear from everybody. Uh, a few comments, though, on what he presented. Um, yes, yes, we need a carbon pricing uh, structure. Um, but in but. But I think at the root of all of the things that we heard yesterday and the amendments that we are proposing today uh, and the government's own motion on the first day of this sitting, we are in a climate emergency. And with respect to the extent that we didn't wholeheartedly support the cap and trade, it's because we felt as though, as with this act, it was the bare minimum. So yes, kudos to, to doing it. Uh, we believe in carbon pricing, um, but we think that there's room for improvement. As for the review of the Act in five years, five years is too long. It's too long. We are in a climate emergency, and, and I think the reality is, and it's one that we don't like to speak about, is that Canada is one of the worst. Um, uh, we are one of the worst polluters. And so back to this amendment, to this number, the IPCC report is a con relatively conservative report, actually, that was looking at global numbers, but recognized in that report 
um, and I don't remember exactly how they referred to the principle, but basically the principle of collective and distributed responsibility. So that that 53% actually has to be distributed across nations proportionate to the degree to which they pollute. So we're not pulling this number out of the air. This number is science. It comes directly from the report, and it's the combination of that one number and the principle that nations need to reduce, the targets need to be set according to how much they pollute. Um, and so with respect, I appreciate the comments um, of all the members, uh, but I think that, that, that this particular amendment, uh, as, as leader of our party said, goes to the heart of this. Um, and we could be more bold. We could be more courageous with this target, and not only could we, but we have to be. And I think if we're serious that it's a climate emergency, if we want to actually transform our economy, which is required in order to get to this target, uh, then we should pass this amendment. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Sackville Beaver Bank. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I guess, uh, you know, unfortunately in this House, um, you know, and, and this piece of legislation uh, before us now uh, is a good example of this, is that our caucus is being looking at and had to have a discussion this morning about supporting an inferior piece of legislation in order for us to not have it thrown back by members across this house that we are anti-education or anti-hospitals or anti-environment. We are certainly not anti-environment. We want to see the best legislation go forward that possibly can. And unfortunately, Madam Chair, it's the lack of consultation and the mightier than thou attitude from some members in this house that they don't cooperate with everybody else and therefore, as I said earlier, we end up with inferior legislation that we have to vote for because if we don't, we're in the paper saying we're anti-environment. Conservative caucus in Nova Scotia is, a progressive conservative caucus in Nova Scotia certainly is not anti-environment. We were the ones that brought forward EXPA and uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is just an attempt to wipe that off so Liberals can stand up and say, we're, we're environmentalists. You're as far from environmentalists as they come. What I would point out, I recognize that the uh, greenhouse gas targets that are laid out here are ambitious. They are one of the highest and they are a reflection of what was in EXPA. So they are one of the highest targets that are in Canada. But I still feel that they are insufficient to meet uh, to meet what when we look at our European counterparts and the ambitious targets that they've set um, that science and international agreements have clearly come out and said Nova Scotia must do more and uh, I don't see the the amendment that's before us I do not see it as being um, uh, significant to what is there that what is currently being uh, su suggested in the bill but it is significant enough to make the difference to meet that 1.5 uh, target so we still support that thank you madam chair well, okay Good debating going on here, folks. Does the amendment carry? No. Yes. The amendment is defeated. Shall Clause 7 carry? Shall Clause 8 carry? I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth South. North. North. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to draw the, uh, the member's attention to CWHB NDP 4 and propose the following amendment. Page three, clause eight. A, add the following subclause. B, developing a strategy for education regarding climate change to the public school program. And B, re-letter subclauses B to D, S, C to E. So, uh, Madam Chair and colleagues, um, this demand, or this is a, a key demand that we heard at the Law Amendments Committee yesterday from many of the young people who took the time uh, to come uh, to speak at Law Amendments. And it was, quite, uh, it was quite amazing yesterday in Law Amendments to see so many young people come. Uh, many of them are the, were the leaders uh, of the climate strike, where, which brought 10,000 people to the streets of Halifax a couple of weeks ago. And frankly, Madam Chair, we should listen to them. Uh, many of them spoke of the lack of education that they have received at school about climate change, 
and have needed to educate each other and themselves. We asked them pointed questions about that. We said, where did you learn about that? And they said, uh, or did you learn about this at school? And they said, no. <laughs> we learned about it, you know, basically from, from their parents and from the internet and from Greta Thunberg and all of the, you know, the, the zeitgeist, but they did not learn it in school. And imagine if we were teaching our children about climate change and about how to uh, mitigate it um, uh, in, in public school. Uh, we have a responsibility for honesty to the next generation and I, in fact I spoke, I said this at Law Amendments yesterday that I have not yet broached the subject with my seven-year-old daughter because it fills me with fear and dread and when my colleague was just talking earlier I began to feel again fearful and, and, and dreadful and depressed about that conversation. Uh, it's an awful thought and yet I do, I know that I do owe it to her to be able to talk about this and about what we need to do. Knowledge is power, Madam Chair, and if we are going to continue to look to our youth to be on the forefront of the climate movement, then we have a responsibility to furnish them with the information and the science. And we have to stop looking at them like they're like so inspiring and cute. And we have to say, we actually have to give them the knowledge and the information that they need and respect them as the people that are inheriting this earth from us. There was a woman yesterday, Willa Fisher, um, sorry, she didn't actually say this, but her mother got up afterwards and, and spoke as well and talked about how Willa has decided to not have children. She's a 16-year-old girl, and she has already made the decision to not bring children into a world that could not, maybe not be safe for them uh, in, in the next several years. No, 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 uh, no, I forget what the, the slogan is, but... In any case, when 16-year-old girls are making those decisions, we need to stop and listen to them. And we need to, as I said, provide them with information and science and make sure that they uh, are, 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 uh, have that, uh, armed with that. I hate using that expression. Um, and, uh, and we need to do well by, by the children who are, as I said, inheriting this earth from us. Thank you. I'd like to remind, remind members to keep the chatter down in, in the chamber. I recognize the Honourable Member for Sackville Beaver Bank. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, we also uh, will uh, support this amendment that's before us. Madam Chair, government as a whole has a responsibility to ensure uh, that the curriculum is science-based and factual and one of the uh, one of the concerns i've personally had is uh, except my my understanding being except for the uh, for grade 12 global geography class uh, which does have a huge component that's directly related to climate change um, it, there really isn't, uh, and, and the Minister of Education may correct me on this, but there really isn't a large component uh, that is, uh, that's consistent across this province. It's been uh, uh, set through the Department of Environment to talk about climate change. I do agree with uh, the previous speaker. It was something that came out, uh, numerous speakers uh, came forward and spoke about uh, climate change and uh, and very few of them or, or many of them I'm sorry said that very few received that education in their schools had those talks in their schools they were receiving it through through other places so I think that we have a responsibility to ensure that it's factual that it's science-based and that it's the same across the curriculum of the province madam speaker the other thing that I heard yesterday, um, and it, it was real. I felt that uh, kids, uh, students were coming forward and they were expressing something. It was a term that they called and some of the other presenters called environmental anxiety. And uh, Madam Speaker, this is the first time I've, I've ever really heard that. I've heard the, uh, you know, that, they're, that the, the younger generation now are talking about not wanting to have children, um, not wanting to, be, and, and basing some of those decisions on environmental concerns. Am I going to have a world, do I want to have children? Am I going to have a world in 10 years where I want my children to live? And 
So I support this as much, having, having grown up through a school system where in the 70s it was uh, global freezing and an, a second ice age. In the 80s we went through acid rain. In the 90s it was uh, the ozone layer and, and I, now we're talking about greenhouse gases. I mean, I, I by no means do not take that as a, uh, me putting myself into any type of climate or uh, anything else denier because I'm not. I certainly recognize and see, uh, feel the impacts on my own. But I think that we need to create a curriculum through education so that students, we can alleviate some of the myths and some of the, some of the things that are out there to help, help to try to alleviate that anxiety and let, let younger people, let our younger generation make uh, informed decisions that are based on science and uh, and we need our curriculum in our schools to uh, reflect that and and as I've said Madam Speaker my understanding is other than Global 12 uh, geography that's not happening. I had my uh, 11 year old who's in grade 6 come home the other day and uh, and I, I felt that sense of anxiety because it was a discussion that they were having in school in the school and I, I uh, applaud her teacher for, for attempting to have that but without having uh, some type of an education component in the public school systems, without having that defined curriculum, I think uh, it, it it leaves a lot up to interpretation and uh, and uh, which potentially can just fuel that anxiety so we support this as well I recognize the honorable member for Cape Breton Center thank you madam chair and just a few points uh, to echo what happened yesterday at law amendments I have to say that I was blown away by the by the children the young adults that presented and they were asking for education now <laughs> That was different, to sit there and, and to be told by 13-year-olds and 15-year-olds and 16-year-olds they want to learn. Because I asked, every young person that presented, I asked them, how did you, how did you learn about this? Because I, I don't know what they know. So I, fi I assumed it was a school program. Sadly, it's not. They're learning off the internet. They're learning from their friends and, and, and I'm sure some families and parents. But they're asking for education which I thought was telling, you know? Why, why do they have to ask to be taught about this? This should be something that the government would embrace and say, yes, we'll gladly put a, a curriculum together to, to teach children in school because then you don't end up at 50 not knowing what you should know about what's going on in the environment because quite frankly, these young adults know a heck of a lot more than I do. Um, and I think, the most poignant um, quote that I could that I could say to this government today, what the, what the young people said yesterday was, "Don't tell me, show me." I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Needham. Uh, th thank you. Uh, I want to add. Um, just one, one last idea, I guess, in the hopes that it will land on the ears of either the department, uh, the Minister of Environment or the Minister of Education, uh, which is that I think um, one powerful way, um, one, one powerful with potential way to address the, the many calls that we heard at Law Amendments for Education is to actually um, equip and fund uh, our public schools to engage youth not just in education about climate change where it's it's all the facts which frankly are really overwhelming and and would lead anyone to despair but to actually equip our public schools to do the sort of environmental uh, education that one of the presenters yesterday Karen McKendry spoke about which actually involves you having time in nature and having time to um, actually as as um, a community of young people help to make the changes that actually are the sources of hope in this. So imagine if, um, imagine if school gardens were not uh, only the, like, were not um, uniformly uh, projects that um, 
you know, parents have to do fundraising for, but imagine if that was actually part of the curriculum. Imagine if, it, imagine if we had um, opportunities for young people to go out and work on building living shorelines, which was, you know, a, par a powerful uh, climate mitigation uh, strategy um, that is that we need more of across Nova Scotia. And, and one of the things that is, um, so for me, uh, something that has alleviated my climate anxiety at different times is actually spending time, uh, you know, trying to work on my garden, trying to like build up the soil. You know, like good soil is made out of carbon. When you grow things, they are, you know, trees grow by taking carbon out of the atmosphere and putting them into the bark and the leaves and the roots and into the soil. So let's not just educate so that, let's not just educate to march, let's, let's educate or educate to, um, you know, fuel anxiety. I think that anxiety is 100% justified, but I think it's also on us to provide opportunities where youth can build skills, relieve some of that anxiety through through action, and frankly, through through time in our natural world, which is like one of the best places to uh, to to feel some ease from that anxiety. Thank you. I recognize the honourable member for Sackville Beaver Bay. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh... Madam Chair, Madam Chair, I, uh, in between speaking, I, uh, the Honourable uh, Minister for Education, did bring me over uh, some uh, changes that have happened over the last, uh, I'm assuming, the last year in regards to the curriculum in Nova Scotia, and that they are now having a component uh, directly related to climate change. I do uh, thank him for clarifying that and applaud him for doing this. Um, however, I don't think that it uh, mitigates the the uh, motion that's before us. In fact, it would enforce it because uh, it would entrench it within this particular bill and ensure uh, that that was something done. So I don't see, um, I recognize we are doing that. Thank you very much for bringing that to my attention, uh, Minister. But I do think that uh, there's still merits in having that entrenched in the legislation as well and uh, makes for it goes forward. So I still uh, support the NDP amendment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. North. North. Thank you, Madam Chair. And vis-a-vis, uh, 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 -vis, apropos, I don't know <laughs> what word I'm using, but uh, my previous comments about the government's lack of a collaboration, I, uh, I was so happy to hear that the Minister of Education actually uh, provided uh, our colleague uh, from the Progressive Conservative Party um, some information about the education programs that are going on, and I would respectfully ask you provide uh, the NDP caucus with those as well. Thank you. Okay. All right. Does the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Shall clause eight carry? carry. Shall clause nine carry? I recognize the honourable member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I would like to draw the member's uh, attention to CWHB NDP 5, uh, and I'd like to move the following uh, amendment or addition. Page 3, Clause 9, add immediately after subclause 9-2 the following subclause. 3, notwithstanding subsection 2 or the regulations, additional money from the fund must be made available to communities disproportionately impacted by climate change, environmental racism, and environmental injustices. Uh, and so, Mr. Chair, um, I, uh, I would like to just speak for a moment on this um, amendment. Uh, generally, I think that this clause, uh, Clause 9, is... Um, is a very good one. Uh, you know, this this uh, the Sustainable Challenges Fund um, is really an important uh, part of this legislation. I think, and I and I do wholeheartedly support this fund. 
Um, we know that local economies and community-driven climate change mitigation projects are a key component to meeting the goals set forth in the IPCC report and in, in uh, this legislation. And so, um, you know, it's, it's really important that we have this fund in place. But I, I would like to point out that the, the amendment we've brought forward recognizes that we have a responsibility to support communities who are most adversely impacted by climate change and uh, to develop solutions that work for them. And again, I would like to point out that the wording, um, that the wording of the uh, change uh, draws attention to um, uh, those communities disproportionately impacted by climate change, environmental racism, and environmental injustices. Uh, and we know that in Nova Scotia, uh, we have a, uh, a searing, uh, horrible record of environmental racism, uh, uh, many, uh, many cases of which are still uh, in, in existence today. Uh, you know, just to name a couple, um, uh, the uh, the fact that the people in the south end of Shelburne, the black community in the south end of Shelburne, are suffering uh, uh, high, high levels of cancer uh, and uh, are unable currently to drink their their, their drinking water, their tap water, um, and they're situated right beside a dump. Uh, we also have, uh, you know, the example of the Mi'kmaq uh, uh, water protectors fighting Alton Gas on the Shubenacadie River. Uh, so those are just a two, two very um, obvious examples. Um, due to the reasons of historical injustices, uh, these communities, be, we need to forefront these communities with this, this uh, um, Sustainable Challenges Fund uh, and, and assist them in their pathways forward. Thank you. I recognize the member for Sackville Cobquet. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Sackville Beaverbank, sorry. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, we'll support this one as well. Um, certainly recognizing, as was previously discussed uh, around this bill, the uh, the reality of environmental racism and environmental justices. At this time, I would I would like to uh, raise a few issues uh, with number nine, uh, section number or clause number nine, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Speaker, and that would be, first of all, uh, the uh, questions around the Sustainable Communities Challenge and Fund to begin with. Um, we don't know where that's coming from. We don't know who is benefiting other than uh, uh, what is currently before us in uh, Section 2 and uh, or subsection two here of clause nine. Um, we don't know where the funding is actually coming from there. The minister hasn't, uh, hasn't really given direction to that. So, um, but I, I specifically uh, wanted to at this time also raise concerns that I had uh, in regards to that fund that it, uh, and it so states the money in the fund must be managed and used in accordance with the regulations and then I went, oh my goodness, quote, if any. So if any regulations around this fund, then the money for this fund must be used to create competitive opportunities, encourage communities, climate. So, so I, we do support uh, the amendment that the NDP are bringing forward. We recognize that it will help marginalized communities across the province. However, uh, based on, uh, on Clause 9, Subsection 2, there may not be any because there may not be any regulations according to that. So we will support the motion that's before us. Does the amendment carry? No. Yes. The amendment is defeated. Shall clause eight carry? Nine. Not on oh, clause nine. Okay. Shall nine, clause nine carry? Carry. Shall clause 10 and 11 carry. carry. Shall clause 12 1 carry. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I draw everyone's attention to CWHB NDP 6, and I move the following amendments. Page 3, subclause, subclause 12, bracket 1. A, line one, delete minister and substitute roundtable, and B, line three, add an assessment of the adequacy of goals immediately after including. Um, 
these chairs uh, would have reporting done by the Environment Acts Roundtable instead of the Minister, uh, which would introduce greater accountability and transparency to the annual reporting function. I think um, uh, something I heard at law amendments, not always said super explicitly, um, but, but by and large, people recognize that the, that the round table has been uh, populated with people with real skills, real like credibility. And I think it's unfortunate that, you know, when people of that caliber step up to serve the province, we then only call on them every so often. And, and I think um, having uh, the, the committee, uh, the round table, sorry, report directly would, would, would create an extra level of, frankly, pressure on the government that the government needs. Um, that, that, and, and that no matter whom is, no matter which party is in government, the government will need. Because this is going to need to stay at the absolute forefront of the government's agenda. Um, and so, frankly, I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to a little bit of constructive shame here. Like if the, if the, if the round table is going to report annually and that report is going to um, call out the government for you know, not, having, not having convened the round table, not having made the progress promised, that, is, um, that can be constructive. And again, in this moment of, um, of climate emergency, um, I think that is, um, that is called for, and, and a continual assessment of the adequacy of our goals is so important. And as my, my colleague from Dartmouth South said earlier on a different amendment, after five years is wholly um, too long a time frame. Uh, one thing that we know and that scientists talk about is, is that there are feedback mechanisms in, uh, you know, that, are, that are part of the mechanism of climate change. As, as snow melts, as glaciers melt, we end up with more of our planet being not white, but, but brown or, or blue, um, not reflecting as much heat back up into the atmosphere. So, the, so it, it becomes a feedback loop where climate change um, begets more climate change. And so we may need to really get more aggressive um, we've already proposed an amendment that would that would um, set us on, you know, to a greater level of ambition right right now. But but in another two years, maybe that's when the roundtable would say, you know what? Yes, this was you know an ambitious target for Canada at the time. But now the evidence shows that we must do more. We must we must um, we must uh, be brave and undertake the changes that are required. And so this amendment would um, also enable, enable that and, and uh, give the round table um, that responsibility. Thank you. I recognize the honorable member for Sackville Beaver Bank. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Speaker. Chair. Chair, I'm in the chair. <laughs> totally off topic. Uh, it was Mr. S chair a moment ago, right? I missed that, so I'm sorry it threw me. Um, we uh, we do support this at this time as well. Thank you. Shall the amendment carry? No. Yes. The amendment is defeated. Shall clause 121 carry? Shall Clause 12 2 carry? Shall Clause 12 3? I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Uh, Madam Chair, again on CWHB NDP 6, page 3, sub clause 12 3, delete and substitute the following. Three, the minister shall provide the round table with all necessary support and information in preparing an annual report under subsection 1. Um, I don't think I need to say anything uh, to it, but that's what we would like to see. Thank you. I recognize the honorable member for Sackville Beaver Bay. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, yes, we, we certainly support this particular amendment. Uh, 
the current form uh, using the word may uh, certainly uh, leaves a lot of uh, questions there and uh, we would uh, much rather see it, it as a shall that the minister shall consult the round table and uh, that the minister shall uh, provide the uh, support to the round table that they need to be able to operate um, the current uh, clause that as before us um, that word may just uh, uh, for us is is by no means strong enough um, in the current legislation that we have the expa act it i believe it is shall not may um, and unfortunately uh, that hasn't happened um, and i did raise this uh, during the uh, second reading of this bill as to whether or not uh, because that was part of the legislation it was law and the fact that it didn't happen uh, I question that um, this uh, the amendment that's before us certainly goes back uh, to the uh, the original intent of the original EGSPA and uh, shows that it shall happen and not may happen at discretion of the minister or anyone else so we will support this does the amendment carry? Yes. The amendment is defeated. Shall 12 3 carry? carry. Shall clause 13 carry? carry? Shall 14 1 I recognize the honourable member for Halifax Shabakto. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the, I'm uh, speaking from the change sheet CWHB NDP 7. Uh, which seeks to amend this clause 14 so as to delete the present 14.1 and substitute the following. The Governor in Council shall, after public consultation and before this Act comes into force, make regulations A, establishing goals to achieve sustainable prosperity consistent with the principles and focus areas set out in this Act, and B, setting ambitious numeric targets with timelines in support of this Act's long-term objectives, including, but not limited to, targets and timelines for, one, the creation of green jobs, including transformation of existing employment, two, increased energy efficiency and conservation, three, generation of electricity from renewable sources, four, electrification of public transit and personal vehicles, five, reduction of emissions of nitrogen oxide, six, reduction of emissions of sulfur dioxide, seven, reduction of emissions of mercury, eight, reduction in the solid waste disposal rate, nine, increased consumption of local food, 10, increased local food production, and 11, legal protection for an increased percentage of the total land mass of the province. Uh, now, uh, this amendment uh, is seeking to ensure that all of those areas that in the previous, the old, Environmental Goals and Sustainable Prosperity Act, that all of those areas uh, must, in the new legislation, in its regulations, um, be strengthened by having uh, numeric targets and concrete deadlines. So by means of this amendment, uh, this principle would apply uh, to the nine areas of, those, of the former legislation which are not included in the present legislation, uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency, nitrogen oxide emissions, sulfur dioxide emissions, mercury emissions, solid waste reduction, local food consumption, local farm support, and land mass protection. The amendment additionally to these nine would establish uh, for the new legislation uh, two new areas of targets. One in the area of green jobs creation, and a second one in the area of electrification of public transit and personal vehicles, uh, for which this amendment would require also uh, numeric targets and concrete deadlines. Now, the green jobs creation target area is one that recognizes our responsibility to take advantage of the incredible opportunity to be at the front of this economic wave and the electrification of transportation target embodies a recognition that transportation comprises the largest portion of Nova Scotia's energy at 44 percent. So the thinking behind this amendment is that all uh, 11 
of these areas, the, the nine from the former legislation and the two which we are hereby proposing adding, all 11 of these are crucial to finding the path out of the present climate emergency uh, and therefore call for all 11 of them uh, being mandated by legislation. I should also point out uh, that nothing in this amendment would preclude the addition of other target areas uh, to this list. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, rec I recognize the Honourable Member for Sackville Beaver Bay. Yes, thank you. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, uh, we certainly support all of uh, all of these uh, this amendment that's before us. I guess uh, to make a couple quick comments. Um, unfortunately, uh, I know that uh, the amendment will not pass because if the current government wanted to address uh, the things that are in this amendment, they would have made amendments to EGSPA, which is what we want it anyhow because all as uh, as the leader of the NDP party did state all the uh, targets and objectives that are li uh, listed in this amendment are encapsulated in EGSPA and uh, that was our opportunity I know that obviously this this amendment will not pass because uh, the Liberal government does not want EGSPA they would have amended that so we see that I, I also support this and, and I do recognize uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, inclusion of green jobs here, as well as uh, the electrification of uh, public transit and personal vehicles. I spoke in this house in the past uh, in regards to uh, where the world market for uh, automotive manufacturers are going. They are moving away from uh, their dependency on fossil fuel and gas. I think it was Yodi I, uh, Yachty I spoke about once before uh, that their whole 2019 fleet is coming out as EV vehicles. Um, that writing is on the wall and not only by, uh, by uh, supporting this incorporated into this uh, amendment, and um, not only I, will that move us towards using more EV vehicles, um, you know, I think that that by doing that, moving towards that, that being an example of green jobs, that's going to become a significant pillar uh, of, re of renewables and green jobs as we move forward, uh, you know, uh, whether it be for public transit or particularly around private transit, that infrastructure that needs to be installed that's currently not there, um, that uh, will be a huge driver uh, towards uh, supporting new green jobs and helping to transition uh, our existing economy to a greener economy and, and moving people uh, towards that way. So, so we certainly support this. Unfortunately, as I said, I know, uh, I know that none of the other amendments have passed. I know that this amendment won't pass, um, but what it does do is it shows that, uh, that uh, with some tweaks and amendments to the existing EGSPA Act, uh, certainly the Conservative, uh, Progressive Conservative Caucus, and, and I would suggest, uh, based on some of the comments, the NDP Caucus perhaps could have as well supported amendments to EGSPA. So. With that, we will support this. Thank you. Okay. Shall, clause, uh, shall the amendment carry? No. Yes. The amendment is defeated. Shall Clause 14 1 carry? Yes. Shall 14 2 carry? Yes. Shall 14 3 carry? Yes. Oh, I couldn't see you. <laughs> I recognize the Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'd like to draw the member's attention to CWHB NDP 8. Uh, maybe the last amendment. Maybe not. Maybe. Maybe not. Um, and I'd like to propose this amendment. Page 4. Add after Clause 14 the following clause. 15. Section 9 of Chapter 1 of the Acts of, of 1994-95, the Environment Act, as enacted by Chapter 61 of the Acts of 2001, is amended by adding immediately after subsection 3 the following subsection. 3A. Notwithstanding subsection 3, at least one member of the round table must be a representative of the Mi'kmaq people. And then uh, we would renumber clauses 15 and 16 as 16 and 17. 
So, Madam Chair, um, this uh, amendment would, uh, and, it, and it is a complicated amendment because it would actually also be an amendment to the Environment Act, uh, would reserve a seat for a representative from Mi'kmaq communities. Uh, recognizing the crucial expertise, traditional knowledge, stewardship, and history of Indigenous people in the way forward through the climate crisis. We know that for 13,000 years, Mi'kmaq people have lived in harmony with the environment, and we need to learn from them. And I'd like to quote just a little bit from the preamble of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People for a moment. Recognizing that people for, sorry, recognizing that respect for indigenous knowledge, cultures, and traditional practices contributes to sustainable and equitable development and proper management of the environment, end quote. Madam Chair, Mi'kmaq people have been at the forefront of protecting our environment. Their leadership and expertise is needed in the way forward. And this amendment would ensure that there is a Mi'kmaq voice at the round table. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Sackville Beaver Bay. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, uh, I certainly uh, apologize before I, I discuss on this because by no means uh, am I going to suggest that I can speak, uh, uh, speak uh, Mi'kmaq here today. Um, we do support this as well. Um, given section number four and uh, the recognition of and I'm sorry, I, I, I know I'm going to butcher it. Ne Neta Kek. Does anybody help me out here? Thank you. Uh, uh, given the recognition that, uh, that that is recognized in the, uh, the current act uh, that's before us, uh, the Sustainability Development Gold Act, I certainly uh, support the amendment that's before us as well since it is mentioned already um, and it does highlight uh, the consultation and, and ensure that uh, a number of people are represented at that round table. So we will support that as well. Thank you. Okay, does the amendment carry? No. The amendment is defeated. Does clause 15 carry? Yeah. Does clause 16 carry? Yeah. Shall the title carry? And someone wanted to speak to that. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, we'll recognize the honorable member for Sackville Cobbequit. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Let me know if I'm off topic. So this is where I can talk about process and such? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. So, coming from business and coming from another order of government, I've, and I've learned a little bit of, about process and how we go about doing things. But I do want to preface this by saying, because there was a comment that alluded to uh, perhaps a lack of understanding or lack of knowledge around environmental matters. I come from a, an area where acid rain um, from the New England states in the 60s and 70s into the 80s before the cap and trade in the U.S. affected greatly our lakes and streams, rivers here in Nova Scotia. We would know that. And people started to take measures to reduce that and to bring back the the lakes and the rivers. Uh, but, you know, the cap and trade in the U.S. did work uh, and is working and has uh, affected us pretty good. In the 60s and 70s, living in Wallace Heights, Shannon Park, Tufts Cove area, the emissions out of the Tufts Cove generating plant before scrubbing would take the cladding and disfigure the cladding of the buildings in that area, as well as take the finishes off vehicles and light and power, perhaps at the time, or Nova Scotia light and power, uh, would take steps to mitigate that. So there has been some work done in that area. I was a member of the Environmental Control Council back in the 80s, and cha uh, didn't chair, but I was very active on the Halifax Harbour Cleanup Review Committee. We consulted with stakeholders, with scientists, with the public, in great deal before we brought back recommendations. And what we started with was certainly not where we ended up. Otherwise, you would have had um, treatment plants 
off your crit out. And that wasn't going to happen. So we, ha we have now, and I do remember, because we have a, a boat going into Halifax Harbor, launching at various points in Halifax Harbor. And one time I was there and I was on a slipway and I was actually slipping. I did not realize that it was raw sewage coming out and that I was stepping in. So recognizing that, there were actions taken by the municipality to clean that situation up. I also chaired the Highway 101 Sackville Landfill Closeout Committee, the dump. What was environmentally sound about that? So in cleaning that up, that eventually led to learnings. And by the way, it was the, the Liberal government of the day that sat that there because nobody could agree where it should go. The learnings were great. We had leachate, we had uh, buses deposited there, we had uh, biomedical waste put there. It, it was not a sanitary landfill by any stretch of the imagination. And through the government and others, and through consultation, efforts were made to look at the three R's, reduce, recycle, reuse. Some would argue there's a fourth R and that's uh, re-elect. So now what we need to do is to take some action here and make things happen. Being on the HRM, we, we underwent a solid waste management review where we looked at better composting, better reuse of our recyclables, source separation, and that was a very hot and heated public consultation, which a colleague of mine, the former councillor, Reg Rankin, was first and foremost in there. First and foremost because what we saw was when the Sackville landfill closed, we had to site another one. And because of that, Otter Lake was the chosen location. However, it wasn't without those other environmental concerns that we had. Again, public consultation, knowledge to make an informed decision was so important. Extended producer responsibility something that we need to talk about, what we do. Emissions from vehicles, municipality putting in more bike lanes. Cycling is becoming vogue where it had been in Europe for many, many years to reduce carbon emissions. Member of the Sackville Lakes and Parks Association, urban forest, uh, the urban forest, making things green, planting trees, creating oxygen, scrubbing the air. These are all environmental things. The reason I bring these up is because none of these decisions were made in isolation. Now I'm talking to the process. They were informed decisions made by the legislatures, the legislative branch, if you will, of governments, not governments, of the legislature at the time. Since I've been here, I've observed a couple of things. One is that quality doesn't always seem to, perhaps it takes a back seat at expediency relative to efficiency and perhaps not effectiveness. A comment was made earlier about if somebody had better information, then they would be on side. In my history, where I come from is we share that information beforehand. That information would come in a report. It would have been researched, whether you agree with the research or not, but at least it would have been available. So that all parties at the legislative branch, and I'm looking at this as this is where we make the laws. This is where we ought to be on the same page, or at least have the same information to make those decisions. If a recommendation is coming forth, what, what's behind that? Go from first reading, and here I might get a little bit off, first reading, second reading, committee of the whole, sorry, public accounts is in there too. Law, law, law amendments, sorry. Um, and then it comes back here, if committee of the whole, and then it goes back to the full legislature, and, and we make a decision. That can be what? What's the shortest time frame? Four, four sittings? of an hour or two discussion and public input to make a quality decision where we are here to make legislation that's impactful. 
I appreciate that government's job is to run the bureaucracy. I also believe bureaucracy's job is to inform the executive branch. And there too, I think that it's incumbent upon the executive branch in this legislature to share so that the NDP have brought forward a lot of information without that input. I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed to, to go and to bring forth these amendments with little information that those who are bringing forward the bills have. That to me is not good process. If, we as a leg if I am as a legislator going to cast my vote, I'd like to know what it is I'm casting it for. What are the alternatives? What are the risks? What has been considered? I'm sure that the bureaucracy takes to the executive committee, or the executive branch, that information and that you rely on that to make a decision. But why not share it? This is to be, I think, a place of spirited debate to look at the pros and cons of any legislation. However, to do that, why tie somebody's hands behind their back? When I came here, I expected, to be quite honest, to be given a playbook. Here's the playbook. Here's what it's about. Here's what's going on. Get a report. Take a look at it. The bill's being introduced. Great. So here's the words. I see the words. What's the context? Don't even get the full bill showing, showing the puts and takes. How is that helping me as a legislator to make an informed decision? If I have to spend needlessly time and energy to have and to get to know what is already available but not shared. Just a little observation. So as far as the process goes, I just want to be on record to say as an MLA in this room where we make decisions on law, why is it I feel as though I'm not given the information to make a, an informed decision? Not going to change that here now. May not change it in this term or the next. My background has been, as I alluded to earlier today, one of understanding and seeking to be understood, to make things easier rather than tougher. We talk about bureaucratic red tape. I don't know how you would, is this legislative red tape? And I don't know if that's <laughs> inappropriate or not, but is this legislative red tape? Does every member of this legislator, legislation feel as though they have the information to make a truly informed decision? And has there been the puts and takes to make whatever's brought forward better or not? So, Madam Chair, I just wanted to express that I think I know there are better ways to come up with quality decisions and to limit the amount of information that is available to an individual member, regardless of political affiliation, in this House, I think, is not right with me. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Halifax, Shabukto. Uh, ma Madam Chair, when we look across the whole landscape of this piece of legislation, I guess like any piece of legislation, we would, would say that, that by it there are some things that are gained on the one hand and there are some things that are lost on the other. Um, we've already uh, acknowledged in the NDP that we think it's, it's a gain after um, a delay so long that a lot of people were beginning to wonder if something of this sort was going to, in fact, going to make it uh, uh, to the legislature at all. It, it is a gain to have legislation come forward uh, as a successor to the Environmental Goals and Sustainable Prosperity Act. Um, it does seem to me, and I think it is a, maybe a, a summary comment on uh, many of the discussions that our party has brought forward in these amendments, however, that it, it's also true that in the Sustainable Development Goals Act that's before us, there's, um, there is a great deal that is lost. Um, 
Lost first, I think, and I think of it as quite a casualty, uh, is all that great uh, enthusiasm which emerged from the passage of Expa in 2007. I'm sure that other members would have had the same experience as me of being in uh, different policy-related settings and hearing someone who not follows these things in different areas say, you know, Nova Scotia has unanimous all-party agreement for its re renewable energy targets and they're right in the province's legislation. Or uh, did you know that in Nova Scotia they've got unanimous all-party agreement for what they do about protecting land and it's, and it's right in their uh, legislation. This was a, a matter of pride for people in our province, uh, particularly uh, people uh, who are uh, attentive to these matters. Uh, and I think it was um, a matter of pride also for each party, uh, since we know that each party has had the opportunity to govern under the exciting, uh, innovative uh, umbrella of the consensus that was behind EGSPA. But I think we have to acknowledge that in this present piece of legislation, uh, this excitement is something that has been uh, foregone uh, and lost. Uh, it won't be the case again under uh, uh, this legislation that the legislative targets, all those goals, uh, get developed through debate and back and forth and, and through collective consideration and out of that emerge to a place in the laws of the people of our province. Um, rather, what we have will be a smaller thing. Um, something less to be celebrated, a, a set of regulations uh, which will emerge from behind the curtain of the closed door of the cabinet. So there are, there are casualties here, there are losses. Uh, uh, transparency is a loss, enthusiasm is a loss, participation uh, is a loss, province-wide buy-in uh, towards our environmental mission, I think, uh, for these reasons, is, is a loss. But I, but I want to say also that I don't think um, with the present bill that this is actually the greatest loss. I, I think that uh, the greatest loss is the loss of the government's opportunity here to respond with effectiveness to that cry which was raised on the streets of Halifax and Sydney and New Glasgow and Antigonish and elsewhere around the province uh, just over a month ago uh, where over 10,000 people marched as part of that global climate action and, and said, as they did in all those places, 1.5 to stay alive. Those marches and the actions which preceded them and the actions which have followed them, and, uh, um, and I guess we should include in that too all, all the energy of the presentations that were made here yesterday at Law Amendments, uh, all of this um, uh, can be boiled down to uh, one demand one cry, one imperative to the government of the province, namely this, respond to the climate emergency as you would if the house were on fire because it is. That is, do not simply improve what you're doing in response to climate change. Don't simply do somewhat better uh, than neighboring related jurisdictions in your response to the call to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, rather this. Do what must be done to establish our province, to establish Nova Scotia on a pathway consistent with containing global warming within 1.5 degrees. Many, many have raised this cry. Those who have raised this cry have received in, in this bill a response which has failed to meet the urgency of this climate moment. And in my judgment, Madam Chair, this is a, uh, an opportunity that ought not to have been lost. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Member for Sackville Beaver Bank. Madam Chair, the previous speaker talked about what was gained and what was lost in regards uh, to this piece of legislation coming before us today. My opinion is, if I was in a boat, I just lost so much, please throw me a life preserver because I'm going down. 
to talk about uh, uh, this bill will, it will receive unanimous uh, uh, support in this house. It will pass, the Progressive Conservative Party will support it, the NDP party will probably support it. We're not, uh, I want to be real clear, we are not supporting this legislation because we feel this is the best piece of legislation. It was done in a silo without consulting other parties. It was done without consulting, uh, without consulting members of the public. The consultation process is starting now. Uh, we should have done that. We should have already consulted. We should be moving this bill forward with, with listening to what people have to say. We haven't done that yet. And uh, to say that we're going to do that over the next 12 to 14 months, as I suggested during the second reading, um, certainly to me that is not what I uh, see as an emergency. I think that, uh, you know, during the law amendments, I did have an opportunity to ask one of the presenters, I asked her how old she was, she said she was 15, and I asked her what her definition of an emergency was, and, and she gave me a definition that is, to me, as an emergency, it shows urgency, it shows importance, it shows priority, it shows doing it now. The house is on fire, there's an emergency, I'm out of here, I need to go, I need to act now. And uh, unfortunately, that's not what's happened. This passing today does not, uh, during third reading tomorrow, I'll say the exact same thing, does not uh, move us forward tomorrow. There's no significant changes that are going to happen the day after this bill is passed because it's the commitment of 12 to 14 months worth of consultation that should have already happened. Don't let the government f pretend that they care that there's a climate emergency they call an emergency and we have a debate and then we go through and and where we are here i said on se on second reading this department has shuffled through four ministers over the last two years and i respect all four of those people but i don't respect that this file has not moved forward we are going we have to support it because we are being strong-armed from past my past experience being in this house is if we stand up and we suggest things to make a better bill for the for the the residents of Nova Scotia. If we stand up as an opposition party and bring forward uh, any amendments or any suggestions, they get shot down. So, and you know, my grandfather, I quote him a lot here. He used to tell me, "A stop clock is right twice a day." So, even if we're opposition, at least we got to be right twice. So, but no, none of the amendments. The amendments that were brought forward here today, I'm so frustrated, uh, Madam Speaker. They would have made, they would have, or Madam Chair, they would have made uh, better legislation. They would have made stronger legislation. But uh, obviously, this government doesn't want that. Um, I'll support this when it comes. Not because it's the best, not because it's strong, not because I think it's great. I'll support it because I don't want somebody saying, well, Brad Johns didn't support environment. And that's the, that, when I do, I am an uh, environment activist. I do support environment. I do think that, that we need to have changes and address uh, global issues of uh, greenhouse gas and everything else. But it won't matter because Somebody will stand up across the floor and yell, oh, you don't support the environment because you didn't vote for it. So I'll vote for this bill when it comes. Not because I think it's great, but that's why. So with that, uh, Madam Chair, those are my only comments. Thank you. Shall the title carry? Carry. Shall the bill carry? Carry. The bill is carried. Brendan getting, Brendan? Oh, is speaker here? Okay. It's coming, okay. So I recognize the board. 
Okay. So we got to do our finish. We have to finish, and then can you talk? Yes. We recess for a bit, right? Just, okay, yeah. Yeah, do your... I recognize the Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that you do now rise and report these bills. The motion is carried. The committee will now rise and report its business to the House. Order, please. The Chairman of the Committee of the Whole House on Bills will now report. That the Committee of the Whole has met and considered the following bills. Bill number 183, 195, 204, 213 without amendments, and Bill 180 with certain amendments. And the Chairman has been instructed to recommend these bills to the favourable consideration of the House. Order that these bills be read a third time on a future day. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call public bills for third reading? We'll now call public bills for third reading. Mr. Speaker, would you call bill number 152, the Plastic Bags Reduction Act? We'll now call bill number 152, the Plastic Bags Reduction. And we will go back to the Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party with 58 minutes left before we were so rudely interrupted last night. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, really, to speak precisely, the, the very last thing that happened before we lost the power last night uh, is that the Minister of Health applauded something that I said. Uh, so I'm gonna, so we're, we're going we're gonna to ask the member for Maniganish to maintain and, his cool and, and, and restrain his enthusiasm this evening while I try to get through a few words about the Plastic Bag Act. Uh, I want to just back up a half an inch to uh, where I uh, began uh, to say that uh, we, we do think that this is a, a welcome piece of legislation and, and we, we begin with that thought with the whole complex of things about this subject that are uh, so clearly as background known. So we know that marine plastic uh, pollution has increased tenfold since 1980. We know that 80% of all marine debris is composed of plastics. We know from the UN report uh, on this subject earlier this year that marine plastic pollution is directly affecting today 267 species. Uh, we know that that includes 44% of seabirds, 43% of marine animals. And we know that in a province that is as defined by the, the ocean as Nova Scotia is, where the health of the ocean is such a, a determinative thing um, of, about our prospects, both present and future, uh, we know then that a ban on single-use plastic bags is something that amounts to common sense. I, I said last night, I want to say again, uh, that this is one of those things towards which we can just turn and say, it's time. 
that uh, we have seen this decision made in a range of other jurisdictions, Victoria out west, our own neighbours on PEI, uh, and uh, it's time for us to make this same decision here in Nova Scotia. And in making it, uh, it's perhaps a fitting moment to acknowledge the, the many organizations in our province who over quite a number of years have been working to bring about uh, this decision. I'll speak about an organization like Plastics Free Lunenburg, for example, or Plastics Free St. Margaret's Bay, and they and, and Clean Nova Scotia, who have been working with businesses and consumers to cut down on the use of single-use plastics and, and have made great progress on reducing the amount of plastic that ends up in our province's ocean and uh, also in our landfills. Certainly it's important to mention the effective advocacy and education programs in this respect of the Ecology Action Centre and how um, instrumental that has been in beginning to curb the use and therefore the disposal of those three to five hundred million plastic grocery bags that are part of the picture here for us every year in Nova Scotia. And certainly there's a great deal of credit should be reflected also on the municipalities of our province. The Halifax Regional Municipality has worked extensively on this issue, researching and working collaboratively with other municipalities in the province to find solutions to this problem. They've been right to point out that plastic waste management represents a significant cost to municipalities and that provincial leadership on this subject is something that's called for. I would also like to acknowledge the contribution uh, of the uh, Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities in setting out this issue as one of their uh, core uh, priority areas for the organization and for the advocacy work that they've done for a provincial extended producer responsibility program. I'm also happy to point out that this particular piece of legislation is in line with a piece of legislation which had been brought forward previously by our own party. It's called the Plastic Bag Reduction Act, which we brought forward here and introduced earlier this year. Um, it is true that the bill we brought forward uh, goes farther than the current legislation in a couple of areas. One of those areas is that it provides for an education campaign around uh, plastic bags and it provides also for the ability to phase the ban in differentially for retailers of different sizes, and it provides too for the promotion of uh, locally produced alternatives to plastics bags. But, but in saying that, I, uh, it's not to take away in, in any way from the importance of the legislation that's before us. We also uh, think it's worth uh, noting in a uh, positive and commending way that, that this present legislation uh, provides uh, exemptions for charities and food banks. Uh, at the same time though, uh, in uh, closing these few remarks, I, I want to say that it's important for all of us uh, when we think about the, the uh, single-use plastic bag ban and this piece of legislation, it's important not to get carried away and overstate the case. We know that plastic bags are only a, a, a portion of the comprehensive threats that are being experienced at present by our oceans, whether we're talking about overfishing or acidification or all of those warming related dangers that are posed by melting sea ice and climate change. And it's also true that uh, we want to acknowledge that the promise of a single-use plastic bag ban depends ultimately on there being established a extended producer responsibility program and on the development of a thorough and comprehensive regulations, particularly on the regulation of other types of single-use plastics. I will also remind the government that we will need robust public education on the matter so that people are supported through this change with the information they need to make adjustments in their practices and in their lives uh, away from single-use plastic products. The regulations should, as quickly as is possible, um, continue to move in the direction of the phasing out of other single-use plastics. The regulations also will need to include a schedule for minimum fees for plastic bag alternatives to ensure that we don't end up making in the aftermath of this bill uh, 
a, a wholesale switch to paper or to heavier types of plastic, neither of which would have a, a more beneficial impact. This is a, a problem that actually emerged in the UK after plastic bags were banned there and retailers switched to free reusable bags which were also made out of plastic and about a billion of them ended up in landfills so we can learn from the practices of uh, other jurisdictions. And at the time this bill was uh, uh, at the Law Amendments Committee, we, we learned too that municipalities such as Lunenburg are looking to the province to confirm that this legislation isn't in any way going to tie their hands or preclude them from taking more ambitious action of their own to limit the use of single-use plastics. And, and this is a, an important point that, uh, in our view, the government ought to clarify uh, for them. Um, Further, it's true a great deal will depend on the details of uh, what happens with the federal governments in, uh, in its own plastics legislation. But nevertheless, uh, all of that considered, it is a um, pretty uh, a commonly heard part of uh, common sense in Nova Scotia to say you've got to start somewhere. And we in the NDP acknowledge this legislation as a, a sound and uh, supportable place to start. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, I won't speak at length tonight, but uh, I want to tell you, Mr. Speaker, about a trip I made to South Carolina a few months back. And I was noticing all the paper bags, uh, because many times we would go to the grocery store to get some food and, and uh, to prepare meals. And um, so, Mr. Speaker, I know that in, in South Carolina, my colleague just spoke about learning from other jurisdictions. Many of the counties along the coast have banned plastic bags because uh, they are impacting wildlife on the coasts, and uh, whether it's sea turtles, what have you. And uh, so, <clears throat> you know, I guess what struck me is, is getting rid of plastic bags is one thing, but if they're only going to be replaced by paper bags, uh, that, of course, consume resources, create pollution, um, is a difference being made. And when we sit here, Mr. Speaker, I think we have to be thinking about passing bills that are uh, effective for the environment. So that's something I'm thinking about. And um, I think that we should be moving towards reusable bags. And I don't think it's so difficult. It is a cultural change. Um, I know uh, in my own case, Mr. Speaker, I remember uh, shopping in, uh, in Halifax here and one of the stores uh, had, had gotten away from plastic bags and I remember finding it to be quite irritating when I would shop. But you know, that was at one point in time, I've since realized it's not such a big, big deal. And uh, I know there's other countries in the world and uh, my, my wife was born in, in uh, Prague and uh, they have, uh, in their experience there, they use little bags called sitiovka. And they are little bags that are, are made, basically made out of mesh and you can, you can com compact them into a very small piece of material that, that would go into a purse or other type of handbag. Perhaps, uh, <laughs> perhaps a briefcase or something for some of us here. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, um, you know, it, there, it's no big deal. It's part of the culture. And I think that's ultimately what, what this bill needs to be about, which is changing the culture here, or helping to lead the culture here towards a change where people use reusable bags. And, um, you know, if we can't all get by something or, or, or come to a agreement on that, um, or, or as a society be able to move in, a, in such a small way, uh, towards reusable bags, it, it leaves me questioning how are we going to get all the other things done we need to do that we can do to help with the environment. So I want to speak a bit uh, before I take my place, Mr. Speaker, about consumption. And I, I believe it's not just our consumption but our unnecessary consumption we must think about. Uh, do we really need to be buying all the things we're buying? I know that statement may not be good for the economy, but it may be less harmful at first thought when we consider that uh, we can buy local, we can buy quality, we can buy only what is needed, and we can take care of it. Uh, we must change our culture of disposable consumption. It is wasteful, 
and unnecessary. And it may be making money for somebody, but it's probably far away from where we live here in Canada, Mr. Speaker. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of these things that we are buying, I think we have to remember in some cases they're adding very little to our lives. And it becomes a waste of our time to be buying these things because I'm sure we can all think of things that we're, we've purchased that we're not using, that we've forgotten about, that we let go to waste, and sometimes we've actually even purchased it again because we forgot we had it. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I would say those things are adding very little value to our lives. And um, I know a lot of people associate their happiness with things they buy. And I think, Mr. Speaker, many of those things aren't really responsible for our true happiness. Uh, if we look at the marketing that's out there, I remember some, one day somebody said to me, he said, Alan, all marketing is designed to make you feel bad about yourself or something you don't have. And ever since then, I, I, I thought, you know what, he, he was right on because that's what it's all about. Um, and, uh, you know, we need to free ourselves from this culture of disposable consumption. And I think that uh, we could start, Mr. Speaker, uh, by uh, considering the bags that we're carrying that consumption in. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Environment. It will be to close third reading. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, and uh, I believe there's uh, a few of us who might want to say a few words on this uh, Bill, and um, I guess uh, I, I don't want to say a whole lot except to say that um, I was very interested when I, I was in law amendments, and I know there was uh, a number of presenters on this uh, bill uh, uh, banning plastic bags, and uh, there was a theme that ran through the presentations, which I think is in, is notable for our uh, for us here in this legislature to think about, and one one that theme was. Three different groups uh, recommended that there be a fee on paper, on the paper bags or the replacement bag, and uh, that was the Ecology Action Centre, uh, the Lunenburg uh, Plastic Free, Plastic Free Lunenburg, and also actually the um, the the presenter who was representing the Canadian Plastics Industry Association. So three different groups recommended that whatever was used to replace plastic checkout bags, that there be a fee attached to it. And um, all three uh, groups really were citing the same reasons, and it's, uh, it's because of uh, another issue which is called human nature. And uh, uh, even, in, even in 2019, people throw garbage out on the road, and, and, and human nature of trash, there's a one spot I drive to my cottage, and there's regularly on the left, on the right side of the road, going up the hill, and a certain spot, somebody occasionally throws their garbage out. And people, human nature to uh, react in a certain way, and, and how that applies to this bag ban is that without sufficient fees in the UK, they found that people would just use a heavier plastic bag, which was meant to be reused, and uh, there was over one billion of these more heavy plastic bags distributed in every year uh, and thrown out after one use. So unless people pay for something, they don't value it. So if they receive a plastic bag, whether it's a, a thin checkout bag or a heavier bag, if they, if they don't have any value attached to that replacement bag, they will throw it out. So likewise with paper bags, what we were told in law amendments was that in order to gain any environmental benefit, a paper bag had to be used at least four times before it was thrown out. Uh, in other words, a paper bag had four times the negative environmental impact than a, a, a thin checkout plastic bag. And uh, it's a little bit hard for me to fathom that, but when I think about that, I think about the amount of fossil fuels that go into cutting a tree down, uh, transporting it to a, a, a sawmill, uh, a wood mill, a paper mill, and converting that into a paper bag, and, and, and the amount of fossil fuel involved in tr trucking that paper bag to the checkout store. And, and all of that, the sort of the life cycle fossil fuel impacts on that, that that paper bag has. And in order for it to have the same environmental impact that a single plastic bag has, you'd have to use that 
paper bag anywhere from four to 28 times, we were told. Uh, likewise, the big, heavy uh, plastic bags that we, we get, uh, you have to use that up to 50 times to achieve the environmental benefit uh, that you would have uh, had from the impact of one small plastic bag. So uh, what these three different groups were saying uh, was that there should be a fee attached to to uh, the uh, replacement bag <coughs> simply because of human nature, that people don't value things they don't pay for. And if you pay for it, you'll tend to, uh, you'll tend to take care of it and reuse it. So uh, I found it very interesting to know that there is this issue of, of what, are, what is the true cost of the alternatives and uh, the true environmental impact. And I, I don't feel, and, and we are supporting this, this bill, but I don't feel that, that that has really been looked at. And I think the, the, it would behoove the government to take a little bit of time to try to do some investigation on what is the true, true life cycle cost of these plastics and how can we do a better job. And uh, I know that uh, the, the guy from the plastic industry, who uh, Joe Haruska, who, uh, who presented said that he believed that his industry would actually produce and sell more plastic in Nova Scotia because of this ban than it would have otherwise, because the replacement bags will get, will get used up, and that without a, a cost associated with the replacement bag, uh, that, that he believed that would be the case. The Lunenburg Plastic Free uh, said the same thing had happened in the UK and they believe there needed to be a ban, a disincentive built in or, or an incentive to maintain or keep that plastic bag. And uh, in fact, the Ecology Action Centre said the same thing. So three very, very different groups say, telling us the same thing. So the question is, what is the right answer? And, and, and part of that answer may be, and I realize we're gonna pass this bill tonight, but to take a little bit of time to think about what are the life cycle impacts and I think we could do a better job working with the plastic industry on that. They have some concerns, and uh, and and also uh, concerns very much mirrored by the Ecology Action Centre. So, what is the right thing to do? And uh, um, you know, and in fact, to quote the uh, Joe Haruska at the Canadian Plastics Industry Association from Law Amendments, he said that, in his opinion, opinion, the bill was virtue signaling. And I was thinking about that term, and in fact, I do believe that if there is virtue to be signaled, it's worthwhile signaling it. So, so it's not always a bad thing, but if in fact the bill is actually negative for the environment, then that's probably not a good thing to be signaling virtue when you're putting out a bill that actually has the opposite effect that is intended. And I, I know that in my many years of farming, I had a, a rule in my head, and that was the rule of unintended consequences. And any change, all, any change that we make in our lives, any change we make anywhere is always going to have unintended consequences. And actually, I came to realize that sometimes those unintended consequences were positive too. We tend to look at the negative a lot and say, okay, because I did this, we did this change, this change. But sometimes there's positive unintended consequences too. So it's not always bad. But we've been warned about an unintended consequence because of human nature. Uh, about this bill, and I think it would it would behoove the government to take a little bit of time uh, once this bill passes and, and try to look at what is the true cost here, what is what is really happening to uh, in our uh, in our province with with uh, you know human nature as as it is. I mean, we st we know people still throwing garbage out and uh, out the window of the car, and uh, uh, unfortunately, it's still going on. I'd like to see it come to a stop. And, um, and hopefully it will someday. But anyway, I wanted to make that point that I think the government needs to consider its actions on this bill. It's the right thing to do in, in one sense. In another sense, I think we've been warned about unintended consequences, and I think we should take that warning seriously. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you. I wasn't going to speak because um, I know that everyone in this chamber is tired, but if there's a lineup, I'll get in it, I guess. Um, I just want to speak very, very briefly and say that um, 
I think there, there are many different ways of reducing the amount of plastic that we're using and that we're generating, but one of the ways that um, is maybe outside the scope of this legislation, but it's certainly not outside the scope of this government, is to actually encourage more local food consumption. Um, I notice in my own life, when we are organized and we are eating the way that we want to eat um, and supporting the local farmers who we have had relationships with for many years, um, we actually generate very little waste in acquiring our food. That's because you can go to a market and, and pretty much stuff isn't packaged at all. Um, for years, my partner and I have uh, been on the list, the long and lucky list of consumers um, who get vegetables from Ted Hutton in the Valley. And like many other consumer-supported agriculture operations, it comes every week in a reusable tote. Um, there are still some small plastic bags that have fresh greens in them, um, understandably, because they wilt. I would love if somebody could come up with a, a solution for wilting greens, that would be great. Um, but, but, you know, I've been, we've been returning bins uh, for eight years uh, to Ted Hutton. Um, and, and when we're organized and uh, not so crazy busy and get down to um, the seaport market on Saturday mornings and, and get our favorite meat um, from, uh, from Vance at Windy View Farms, it comes in butcher paper and it goes in the compost afterwards. Um, and, and that is an incredible privilege. It's an incredible privilege to have the option, to have the income, to be able to spend and, and buy uh, that kind of quality local food. Um, and I wish that across Nova Scotia, and this is one of those goals that has disappeared from the Environmental Goals and Sustainable Prosperity Act, we were looking at how we could actually open up that. Um, that possibility for many, many more people. And part of that is about adequate wages, and part of that is about, um, you know, less precarious employment so that people actually have time to enjoy and, and think about, um, you know, how they're going to shop and, and um, have the time to prepare food from scratch. Um, but, but I think uh, there, are, there are many different ways to work on this problem and banning plastic bags is, is certainly only one of them. And I'd say that, uh, you know, so long as we're uh, not uh, really prioritizing um, and supporting Nova Scotians to support local farmers, um, and so long as they're, you know, they are shopping in the, the larger chains, um, well, you can get you can get food there that is got more plastic, you know, for the one item than than you get at the checkout in a in a in a um, in the grocery bag at the end, and uh, and sometimes my partner brings those ones home, the ones uh, you know on a on a styrofoam tray wrapped in sh shrink wrapped in plastic within an inch of its life. Um, anyhow, so. I, I welcome this, and I hope we do more, and I hope that we recognize that uh, doing more actually can't just rely on individuals. One of the great comments that was made uh, at law amendments yesterday was from one of the young climate activists who said, I asked her what uh, a sustainable prosperity would look like, and she, would, she said that um, you know, government would have done its job and all the choices that were available would be good ones. You know, you'd be getting to make choices between various good options. Um, and I think that is uh, something that uh, pertains to this bill as well. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When I was in grade nine, my geography professor told us that by the time I was in my 40s that we were going to have the weather of Florida and we were going to have palm trees. And so I was excited and looking forward to that. Um, but if you turn on CNN right now or Google California wildfires, you'll see that what he predicted was not exactly what we were hoping for. And why it's relevant to me, Mr. Speaker, is that my son Christopher lives in Pasadena, California. And every time there's a new fire that lights up on there, I immediately Google map it to see exactly how close he is. 
And frankly, right at the moment, he's home. Uh, and I thank God for that, because right now, um, he would be about 20 minutes away from, from where the devastation is going on. So I know people don't like the word health crisis or environmental emergency, um, but he's living surrounded by uh, that very situation. When I was 10 years old, we were one of the first people to have composting in the backyard, and my friends thought we were, we were a little crazy. And uh, then when we were 20, I remember getting seat belts, and I hated them because they wrinkled my dress, and of course, uh, that seems silly now. Then when I was in my 30s, uh, 650 of us got sick at Camp Hill Hospital from the environment inside a building, and it was one of the worst disasters in occupational history. And I watched a movement go on to get our first uh, environmental health center and to get the province to go scent free. And now no one thinks about it. It's everywhere. Kids aren't to wear scented products. Teachers uh, can send a kid out of the classroom for wearing that. And who'd have thought that 35 to 50 years ago? When we turned 40, then I suddenly wasn't allowed to send my kids to school with peanut butter because one kid might get sick. So we adapt to our changing environment, and uh, so this bill is, is a good step in the right direction. But it was about eight years ago, around when I turned 50, we started seeing commercials of animals on the beaches being trapped in the six-pack plastic wrap that uh, beer cans uh, come in, and you know, animals getting cut open on the beach and they're just plastic guts uh, flowing out everywhere. So, Things have, things have changed and times have changed. And one of the movements that happened last year was something called uh, Break Free From Plastic. And it was an initiative started by a young gentleman who went to school with my sons. And it was called Proud To Be Straw Free. So if you've ever been in a restaurant in HRM where they don't offer straws automatically, this young gentleman, uh, through working with Greenpeace Halifax, uh, gets to take the credit for that. So there's over 140 restaurants in this area who will not automatically offer you a straw, and these are small steps in the right direction. So I've already spoken about how I feel about this bill personally, and you know how our party feels about it on a um, caucus level, but I wanted to share with you a few of the thoughts of my constituents, because they're the ones uh, whose voice I really want you to hear. The first is that, uh, Barb, do you really think that this will make that much of a difference in the, in the scheme of things? And there are a lot of people who are skeptical about this because they see this as a very small step in the right direction. Others have said, I like it, we can all make a little difference if we all move in the same direction. The worst thing that can happen is that we'll have less garbage on the streets and a greener planet as a result. But a lot of people had a very similar concept in terms of who was ultimately responsible for this. And it says, I'm not so naive as to believe that persons in business will follow this, um, but at least it'll get people talking about it. And uh, so they're putting a lot of the emphasis on the businesses who are um, wrapping things in plastic. Um, others have said that my fear is that politicians will use this. Well, done that when it comes to addressing the problems of plastic pollution and that they just see this as a very small step and we don't want the government to be complacent afterwards. Others are not so sure that this is the right step, taking away multi-use bags that we get when we purchase an item, but continu continuing to sell single-use plastic seems like uh, an oxymoron or an ironic choice, and if we're gonna ban them, ban them outright. Others have said it's a very small step, but it has to start at the manufacturing level. Uh, people can use reusable bags and bring them home full of everything encased in plastic, which seems to defeat the purpose. Uh, so some are afraid that if you um, bring in the plastic bag ban that it'll increase the number of products that are actually wrapped in plastic. Um, so we want to ensure that the manufacturers are consulted properly and that they are encouraged to reduce their um, production of plastic as well. And of course others have said, I'm hoping this is a start with more to come. They want the government to do more and we encourage them to do that. And of course, it's made people wonder what is going to be an alternative, and uh, we're hoping that uh, necessity is the mother of invention. We've already seen that. But again, many people keep saying that it's the manufacturers who use unnecessarily too much plastic in their packaging in order to uh, promote things, as, as some of the other member from Inverness said, sometimes things that we don't really need. But when you put it in the right plastic packaging, it can make it very attractive, especially to children. 
Um, others are worried that this is just such a small step that it's merely the appearance of doing something uh, that the government can take credit for. And so we want the government to take a stronger step than what they've done now. So, Mr. Speaker, I'll, I'll end this by saying that uh, we all want to improve uh, the environment. We all want to take steps. Um, I'd love to be able to say that when the Friends of Gnabs Island go out to do a cleanup, that there's nothing to clean up. Um, and that when my community goes out to uh, take uh, their environment days to clean up, that they might be able to use their uh, energy to other things. But until such time, um, we'll encourage this government to continue to take strong steps uh, in the future. And uh, with that, I'll take my seat. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll ask the member to table those correspondence with the sources clearly identified on each one, that you, the quotes that you read. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I stand to speak to Bill 152, an act to reduce the use of plastic bags and other single-use plastics. Mr. Speaker, I believe this is a step in the right direction. Uh, for putting forth legislation to remove single-use plastic bags. I believe it will promote changing of habits and encourage consumers to start reusing and use recycle bags as well. We are, while I'm happy that this legis legislation is coming forward, we're certainly not leaders for many jurisdictions are much further ahead of us. Vermont, for example, passed legislation last year which comes into effect July of 2020 that put forth a ban on plastic bags, styrofoam food trays, and plastic straws. These changes that we're putting forth um, will not come easy. I know firsthand back in 2013, I opened an organic local food store in downtown Amherst called Manassa Local Food. And I made a decision before I opened the store not to bring in single-use plastic bags. I had brown paper bags available for my customers and cotton reusable bags. And over a period of months, I received numerous complaints daily from customers who were unhappy that I did not provide a plastic bag. And some actually refused to shop at my store unless I started providing single-use plastic bags. So it is going to take time for consumers to adjust to our legislation, but I believe it is a positive step forward. Uh, a couple of positives uh, also that I believe about this bill are that I believe the private sector actually want this bill. Uh, large retail stores have been asking for this legislation for some time. Uh, secondly, I also believe this was the right step, making it a provincial bill. Um, there was some discussion before this session that the provincial government was going to leave it up to individual municipalities to put forth their own legislation. I do believe the provincial bill is the right decision to make. I think future consultations with our private sectors uh, will be important, uh, including the Canadian Plastics Industry Association. Uh, I was happy to see that they came to law amendments and shared their view. Um, I do have a very um, large industry plastics uh, leader uh, in Amherst. She's, they're actually the largest employer in Cumberland North outside of our healthcare industry. They employ over 400 people. And I've had several meetings with the CEO of that company, and they're doing amazing work. They are, their plastics that they are making are efficient. They're, they're leaders in the industry. And I do believe it's important that we include industry and private sector in our, in our work going forward with future legislation. Uh, we all know the Ivany report spoke uh, how important it is that we engage private sector and that all of our decisions should make sure that government and private sector are working together. An example of their industry leadership uh, in, the, in the document that they provided at Law Amendments, it shared that they, their association, the Canadian Plastics Industry Association, have a goal, a sustainability goal for uh, by 2040 that 100% of their plastics packaging is reused, recycled, or recovered. Uh, two recommendations that the plastics industry expert made that I support uh, are, are one, creating an all-party committee on climate change and review the carbon impact of Bill 152. Um, my colleague from Sackville Cobbequid was sharing earlier about uh, you know, the differences between uh, municipal government and, and this legislature. And 
Uh, two weeks ago, I had the honour of attending a Canadian Parliamentary Association meeting in Victoria, BC. And it was encouraging to learn how other legislation, legislatures across the country um, are working together. And I, I was enlightened to know that um, not all legislatures are quite um, as combative, maybe, for lack of a better word, as ours uh, can sometimes get. Uh, PEI, for example, Mr. Speaker, um, are very collaborative, and in fact, all of their committees, um, the, the uh, opposition have a majority vote. So I thought that was, that was really interesting, how their legislature. So I, I do support more collaboration in our work, and even the plastics industry are recommending an all-party committee on climate change and I support that recommendation. Another recommendation they made was to introduce a 100% locally made recyclable reusable bag with 40% recycled content that can be recycled locally. I thought that also was a really a good idea that they put forth. I believe also, Mr. Speaker, there are potential opportunities for our forestry industry as wood and paper uh, could take the place of of uh, plastic forks, plastic bags, plastic straws. So there are opportunities, and I would like to table a document that CBC put out in um, June of 2019 that talked about the ban on single-use plastics could actually be a boon for the forestry industry. So I'd like to table that, <coughs> that document. Some people will be upset about this bill, and some people that I know well, because of the inconvenience. And, but I believe um, that some of my colleagues have already talked about the importance of reducing our waste is one of the solutions that we must be looking at when we're addressing climate change. And I felt uh, it kept coming up in my mind. I do want to mention one of my first if probably not my first mentor uh, in living green and in, in, with environmentalism was actually my grandmother. She was born in 1920. She lived through the post-depression era and she wasted nothing. She did not have garbage. She did not have garbage and I, st I remember helping her with um, bringing in the produce in the fall and I remember that all of she got milk in bags and all of the plastic milk bags she would wash and hang to dry and then in the fall when it was time to freeze the green beans and other vegetables she used all of those plastic bags that she had saved all year and and that's what she used to freeze her vegetables but she wasted nothing and uh, I think uh, we have a lot to learn from from our elders yes So with that, Mr. Speaker, I will sit and, and I do uh, want to say I support Bill 152. Thank you. If I recognize the Honourable Minister of the Environment, it will be close third reading of Bill number 152, the Plastic Bags Reduction Act. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, certainly want to start off by thanking all my colleagues. Um, this bill is a step forward, but your, your voices and uh, the, I heard the comments around changing the culture plays as big a role in what we're going to do today as just what this bill is. So I really do want to thank everybody for their comments. Uh, I won't be too lengthy here, but I'd certainly like to say that uh, this is, as most have said, a very important first step. Uh, it is going to change the way that we uh, think. It's a very important day for Nova Scotians today, and um, it certainly will help reduce what we need to do and in, uh, in what goes into our landfills. Uh, millions of uh, plastic bags are going to be taken out of circulation, and that's an important feat. Um, but again, as I said, more importantly, it's going to change the way that we shop. I would challenge any person in this room already to think that they've walked into a grocery store the same way they did a month ago. I think we all have different ways to think now, and, and uh, that's important. Uh, Nova Scotians told us it's time to make change, and that's what we're doing. And we are taking that next step. We agreed with them and this is an important day. 
Um, we also have heard from, as it was noted, Plastic Free Lunenburg, and they've asked us to ban other items, such as plastic uh, uh, items as cutlery, straws, um, lids, cups, single-use items. And I will say to the House here today um, that we are ready when the time is to move to that next step. Um, there are some Nova Scotians uh, that have already asked to take this, take that next step, and I applaud them. Um, so for others, just simply eliminating uh, single-use checkout bags will be a major challenge. We know that. Um, so we've left the door in this legislation, Mr. Speaker, to regulate distribution of other single-use items down the road. Mr. Speaker, uh, we've also heard about the need to change or charge for alternatives. I think that's one of the biggest speaking points that we've heard on this bill. Uh, I have put thought into that. Our staff has, our caucus has, and uh, this bill does not include a uh, minimum charge for alternative bags. And we did that uh, purposely and thoughtfully, I believe. Um, but let's uh, be firm on this, Mr. Speaker. Many businesses will do that. And that's important to know. Uh, many may choose not to offer bags at all, and that's a choice for them to make. Um, we're going to encourage all Nova Scotians to bring their usable bags, reusable ba bags when they shop, and to let retailers know what their preferences are. Just a few points that I would like to make um, in that regards is um, uh, myself, I think we shouldn't use bags, period. I think we should take it to the next level. When I walk out of a grocery store, I try to just go right from the checkout into my cart, out to my vehicle and into the trunk. What's wrong with going bag free? I would challenge everybody to do that. Keep a little cardboard box in the back of your trunk if you want to carry them in. And uh, we, you know, again, we need to move to the next step. I, I agree with uh, some of the uh, debatable parts of this bill is around the differences between plastic and paper. We do not want to see paper bags used to the extent that plastic are. By no means, we do. But we will, we will keep an eye on that. On another point with the consistency that we see between this bill, which is the second bill in Canada, PEI was the first, uh, it was an important thing to listen to the industry, to what they had to say. So when PEI set their bill, they did have fees in it. Now, let's be clear. Right now, they are actually doing consultation on those fees. So those fees might change. They might go away. We don't know. But one thing we heard from the industry is they wanted consistency across Atlantic Canada. That was the most important thing for them. So for us to set a fee today, and PEI change theirs tomorrow, I think it was important for us to listen and say, industry, we'll let you regulate the price on the bags. We'll let you be consistent. It's an important part of this whole thing, and, and I think that's something that shouldn't be lost in this bill. This bill is very consistent with PEI, with the exception of that. Mr. Speaker, this legislation is one of the actions that we're going to take to protect the environment, but it also helps us to continue to amplify a very important conversation that some Nova Scotians have been having for years about reducing the ways and the amounts of plastics that get into our landfills and waterways. It will help us move forward to keep this province as a national leader in reducing waste. And Mr. Speaker, with that, I move that Bill 152, an act to reduce plastic bags, do pass. <clears throat> the motion is for third reading of Bill number 152, the Plastic Bags Reduction Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded nay. Motion is carried. Bill number 152 entitled an act to reduce the use of plastic bags and other single use products. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill Number 189, the House of Assembly Act? We'll now call Bill Number 189, the House of Assembly Act. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move that Bill 189, an act to amend Chapter 1, 1992, Supplement of the Revised Statutes 1989, the House of Assembly Act, be now read a third time. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to rise and speak briefly to third reading of Bill 189, House of Assembly Act. 
Mr. Speaker, as I stated at second reading, this bill is the right thing to do. The amendments to this bill provide clarity. Clarity to members of the Legislative Assembly who wish to run for the House of Commons, the Legislature of another province or territory, or a municipal office in Nova Scotia, that they must resign their seat in the Provincial House of Assembly and provide notice of their resignation immediately after being selected in a nomination contest or otherwise chosen. These amendments will also serve to protect members of the Legislative Assembly who choose to seek office for another level of government from perceived or potential conflicts of interest and allowing them to focus on the work they have chosen to do. Mr. Speaker, citizens expect clear rules enshrined in law, and they expect us as members of this Legislative Assembly to do the job that we were elected to do, and that is to serve and represent them. They deserve to be represented, and I'll take that a step further, Mr. Speaker, in saying I feel when an MLA steps down to seek election to a different level of government, by election should be called within 30 days, so constituents do not go without representation. It's not fair to the constituents in that constituency to go unrepresented. Mr. Speaker, these amendments level the playing field and it creates a path of expectations going forth for the members of this House and the electorate. Mr. Speaker, the Progressive Conservative Caucus supports these amendments and we will be voting yes for the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dermot South. Uh, I'm pleased to rise and register the NDP's support for this bill. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to echo the comments of my colleague from Queen Shelburne. I think it's important to recognize the spirit of this bill is saying the right thing, but we all know that there is an election, there's a by-election that has not been called for Truro, Bible Hill, Millbrook, Salmon River. And it's not fair to the people in that constituency, Mr. Speaker. And while we stand and support this bill, it is important to recognize that the people of that area are still not represented in this House. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Justice. It will be to close third reading of Bill Number 189, the House of Assembly Act. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move that Bill 189, an act to amend Chapter 1, 1992 Supplement, the Revised Statutes 1989, the House of Assembly Act, do pass. The motion is for third reading of Bill Number 189, the House of Assembly Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye? Aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. Bill number 189, entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 1, 1992 Supplement of the Revised Statutes 1989, the House of Assembly Act. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill number 192, the Municipal Elections Act. We'll now call Bill number 192, the Municipal Elections Act. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move uh, Bill Number 192, the Municipal Elections Act, be now read for a third time. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to speak on Bill 192, an act to amend Chapter 300 of the Revised Statutes of 1989, the Municipal Elections Act. The Progressive Conservative Caucus supports the bill, which makes several amendments to the Municipal Elections Act. It is our understanding these changes are supported by the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities and were changes that were recommended by the Municipal Elections Officer after a review. We support Bill 192. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we are in favour of any legislative move to increase the transparency and accessibility of our electoral processes. Um, however, we're disappointed that the government did not take this opportunity to extend the right to vote to permanent residents of this province. Um, the mayor of Halifax Regional Municipality and his colleagues at the NSFM and HRM Council um, have asked for this change um, for uh, for a number of years, and uh, this was an opportunity given that the government was already looking at the act to to make that change. Um, each year, um, almost 6,000 new permanent residents um, come to Nova Scotia, 
And they may remain permanent residents and not Canadian citizens for, for many years. In fact, I was out supporting um, a, a federal campaign recently and I talked to someone who had been living in the building I was canvassing for more than 20 years and he was a permanent resident. That is permanent. Um, so, so there's no good reason, given that people work and pay taxes and contribute significantly to our communities, that we not include them um, in uh, as electors at the municipal level, where we know that um, the work of that level of government is is quite specifically around um, the, the governing of and funding of our municipalities. So, um, with those few words. Um, I'll take my seat. Thank you. I recognize the Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs will be for third reading of Bill Number 192, the Municipal Elections Act. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the comments from members opposite. I move to close debate on Bill Number 192, and it do pass. Motion is for third reading of Bill Number 192, the Municipal Elections Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye? Aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. Bill number 192, entitled an act to amend chapter 300 of the Rise Statutes 1989, the Municipal Elections Act. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call bill number 193, the Massage Therapist Titles Protection Act. We'll now call bill number 193, the Massage Therapist Titles Protection Act. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that bill 193 be now read a third time. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. I have about an hour's speech. Just, just kidding. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I rise to speak on Bill 193, the Massage Therapist Title Protection Act. Registered massage therapists are important, uh, are important members of the health care team. Registered massage therapists assess, plan, treat, and evaluate acute, acute chronic rehabilitative disease and illness. Preventative and holistic measures that address our that address our physical, mental, spiritual needs and promote wellness. Registered massage therap therapists provide ethical and respectful care. For over 20 years, I employed numerous RMTs and can attest to their clinical and professional skills they provide. The Progressive Conservative Caucus supports Bill 193, the Massage Therapist Title Protection Act, and I encourage everyone here in this house to call and book yourself a therapeutic massage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and the I too am happy to rise to say uh, to the other side of the House that the NDP caucus does too support this bill, and we will. I know. I know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Gosh, what a, what a difference a couple of days makes here, eh? The Honourable Minister of Health, if I'm recognized, the Honourable Minister will be to close Bill Number 193, third reading, the Massage Therapist Titles Protection Act. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate uh, my colleagues' uh, comments. Uh, I think uh, most people will uh, be surprised at the level of uh, Unanimity, unanimity? Uh, uh, support uh, here on the topic of health care, uh, but I think uh, that's uh, important, Mr. Speaker. So we'll continue uh, forward tomorrow in the same vein. And uh, with that, Mr. Speaker, I move to close uh, third reading on Bill 193. Motion. Motion is for third reading of Bill number 193, the Massage Therapist Titles Protection Act. Would all those in favor of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried. Bill number 193 entitled an act to protect the titles of massage therapists. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill Number 197, the Companies Act, the Cooperative Associations Act, and the Corporations Registration Act? We'll now call Bill Number 197, the Companies Act, the Cooperative Associations Act, and the Corporations Registration Act. The Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that Bill Number 197 be read a third time. Oh. 
The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Yes. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. I rise to congratulate the Minister on shepherding through this bill. <laughs> I to recognize the Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia. It will be to close third reading of Bill Number 197, the Companies Act, the Cooperative Association Act, and the Corporations Registration Act. The Honourable Minister of Service, Nova Scotia. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the support from my colleagues opposite. And with that, I move third reading of Bill, uh, close third reading of Bill 197. The motion is for third reading of Bill Number 197, the Companies Act, the Cooperative Associations Act, and the Corporations Registration Act. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. 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 Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. Bill Number 197, entitled an act to amend Chapter 81 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Companies Act, Chapter 98 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Cooperative Associations Act, and Chapter 101 of the Revised Statutes 1989, the Corporations Registration Act. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would you please call Bill Number 201, the Municipal Government Act, the HRM Charter, and respecting on-site sewage disposal equipment. We'll now call Bill Number 201. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move third reading of Bill Number 201. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, I rise to speak on Bill 201, an act to amend Chapter 18 of the Acts of 1998, the Municipal Government Act, and Chapter 39 of the Acts of 2008, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting on-site on sewage disposal equipment. This bill allows municipal councils to make bylaws charging for financing and installation of on-site sewage disposal equipment on private property. The PC Caucus supports this bill. Health and, and environmental concerns can occur from septic system failures. The PC Caucus supports effective wastewater treatment. Health and environmental concerns can occur from septic system failures, and wastewater can back up into your yard and contaminate water sources with heavy metals, nutrients, and or pathogens. The Federal Fisheries Act includes the water systems effluent regulations that have goals for 2020, 2030, and 2040 deadlines based on criteria. This work was a result of a federal commitment in 2009 of the Canadian Council of Ministers of the Environment Canada-wide strategy for wastewater. The Progressive Conservative Caucus supports healthy and up-to-date, modern, effective septic and wastewater treatment systems. This bill allows for non-traditional financing. This did raise a few questions. Is it municipal government's role and responsibility to finance private infrastructure on private property? Historically, a private homeowner, when making home improvements such as a septic system, financing is obtained through a bank. A bank determines risk a bank assumes liability. This bill now allows municipalities to be a lending agency. Some questions include, what will the interest rate be? Will it be consistent or will it change based on credit risk scores? How will these borrowed costs be accounted for, accounted for in the books of municipalities? Municipalities technically, technically can only borrow from the Municipal Financial Corporation, so will the Municipal finan Financial Corporation be the lending agency in, the, in these instances? Will the municipality be only a lender of last resort? I do have lots of questions, however, our Progressive Conservative Caucus supports this bill because we support up-to-date, modern, effective septic and wastewater treatment systems. We support this bill if it permits some homeowners to improve their private septic systems. It will improve public health, population health, and the health of individual families. We support this bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, we are glad to support this bill, uh, but will again register concerns that we strongly feel should be considered by the government moving forward to support local communities and municipalities when fighting climate change. And the reason that that is relevant to this bill is that 
uh, PACE programs were designed to allow municipalities to finance um, investments in clean energy at the level of households. Um, so everyone in this chamber, I think, is aware of Bridgewater as an example of a municipality showing great leadership on climate change. And, and the NDP caucus has a bill on the order paper uh, to support local action on climate change that would give clear and broad authority to municipalities to address climate change, including by creating a local action on climate change fund to make money available to municipalities to access climate change related projects. Um, and, and our bill would also commit to expand municipalities' ability to support climate change adaptation and mitigation through PACE programs, um, making setup and administration easier and addressing issues like the accounting impact on municipal debt. Now, of course, Nova Scotians need to be supported um, to upgrade, sep upgrade septic systems on their property and, and paying uh, paying back a, a, a loan through property tax makes a lot of sense. But we're concerned at the lack of consultation with municipalities. We're concerned at the ability of smaller municipal units to administer this program. And, and rightly, there are restrictions on the size of PACE programs. And so um, taking PACE programs into the area of sewage treatment when they were designed for clean energy could potentially limit uh, deep retrofits of people's homes and, and installation of clean energy projects. Um, municipalities are limited in how much debt they can raise, uh, which is good, but that potentially limits their ability to finance decarbonization through these programs at this moment of a climate emergency. So we, what we don't want to end up with is sewage competing with clean energy. Um, both are, are necessary and good, and uh, for the province to download, um, uh, download responsibility for helping to finance sewage programs without actually providing the assistance to municipalities to go full steam ahead on local action on carbon, uh, on climate uh, change mitigation would be would be a real mistake. Um, so, uh, with all that said. Um, we do support this legislation, and I guess we just really will look to the government to demonstrate its leadership by working with municipalities to make sure that there are not unintended consequences as a result of this bill. If I unrecognize the Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs, will be to close second reading of Bill Number 201, the Municipal Government Act and the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter an act to amend respecting on-site sewage disposal equipment. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, my uh, colleagues in the House for their comments. And with that, I move to close uh, third reading of Bill Number 201. Motion is for third reading of Bill Number 201, the Municipal Government Act and the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, an act to amend respecting on-site sewage disposal equipment. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. Bill number 201 entitled an act to amend chapter 18 of the acts of 1998, the Municipal Government Act, and chapter 39 of the acts of 2008, the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter, respecting on-site sewage disposal equipment. Ordered that the bill do pass and the title be as read by the clerk. Ordered that the bill be engrossed. The Honourable Deputy Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that concludes government business for today. I move that the House now do rise to meet again tomorrow, Wednesday, October 30th, between the hours of 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. Following the daily routine and question period, uh, we'll move to opposition business, which will be provided by the House Leader, the official opposition, momentarily. And following that, uh, government business will include third reading on public bills 180, 204, and 213, and private bills. Uh, third reading of private bills 183 and 195. The Honourable House Leader for the official opposition. Mr. Speaker, uh, tomorrow we'll be calling notices of motion uh, number 18 and 853. We'll also be calling bill number 217, an act to amend the Liquor Control Act. Uh, the first two resolutions we debated for 15 minutes each and the bill debated for 10 minutes each for clarification. 
Thank you. Motion is for the House to adjourn to rise again tomorrow, Wednesday, October 30th, between the hours of 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Country minded nay. Motion is carried. House now stands adjourned until tomorrow at 9 a.m.